I am a part-time custodian for the town that I live in, and I only work when I'm needed. I have pretty much worked at every school in the district, including the middle school that I attended. It's a fairly old school, built in the early 60s, and is actually being torn down in about a year to make room for the new middle school that will be replacing it. I love that school, and I never want to see it go, but it's kind of a dump. But every time I get the opportunity to go back and work there again, I always accept it. I have always been a firm believer in ghosts, and I've had a handful of experiences, but I've never experienced anything at that building before. Until last winter. I was working a three-night stint at the old middle school on the second floor, from about 2 p.m. to 9 p.m. Quite frankly, I didn't need seven hours to go about the nightly routine of cleaning, but I was fine with that. On the first night, I went about my business knowing I could pace myself, but I was still flying through my work. I'm not overly social when I work night shifts. I actually like them better because most people are gone by 5 p.m., and I can just have my headphones in and listen to music, podcasts, or whatever. It was probably about 5 p.m. when I was sweeping the classroom floors in the science wing. All of the doors were shut and locked, which is mandatory in the science wing, with the lights shut off in the rooms, meaning that all the teachers had gone home for the night. Now this detail is important. I have a system when it comes to cleaning rooms, and it's very simple. When I've done everything that needs to be done in a room, I shut the lights off in that room. But when I know that I have to go back into a room for whatever reason, whether it be a stain on the floor that needs to be mopped or a rug that needs to be vacuumed, I leave the lights on in that room as a reminder to circle back at some point. There was one room in that wing that needed a wet mop pretty badly, so I left the lights on and the door open, and I figured that when I was cleaning the bathroom floors in that wing later on, I would make a stop in that room and give it a quick mop. At this point, it's probably about 7 p.m., and I've just finished taking a break with my coworker Jeff, who works on the first floor. I go upstairs to my closet and gather my bathroom cleaning supplies. About 30 minutes later, I make my way back to the science wing to clean the bathrooms and that classroom floor. When I get down to the classroom, I notice that not only is the door shut with the lights off, but the door is locked. Now I know this wasn't me. I never close the classroom doors until I go around to shut the hallway lights off at the very end of the night, just in case I need to go back into a room. I'm also positive that no teachers were left in the building. I unlock the door and the lights are flipped in the off position, so I flip them back on. I immediately ran downstairs to ask Jeff if he had been in the science wing at all in the last hour, and he said no. I asked if there had been any teachers meeting in the main office or the teacher's lounge, and the answer was also no. I told him what happened, and he wasn't surprised at all, saying he thinks that building is haunted. We talked for another minute or two, and I went back upstairs to the classroom. And what do you know, the lights are off again. I always try to debunk every experience that I have, but I cannot for the life of me think of anything that would have caused these things to happen. It was the middle of December, and the building was always cold, so there were no windows open, and I made sure of that. I have no explanations for the light flipping off twice, and no explanation for the door locking on its own. I walk around the entire upstairs, looking in every classroom, trying to find any sign that some teachers could have still been in the building, but I found nothing. I went back to mop the classroom floor and finished the rest of my work for the night. Night two was uneventful, but night three, in my opinion, was the most eventful. The whole night, I had this feeling of somebody watching me, and not your normal feeling of being watched, but more like I was being followed, especially once all of the faculty and students were gone. One could normally chalk this up to paranoia, but this feeling only worsened. I thought I heard footsteps around me a few times. Not heavy footsteps. They were more like light shuffling. I ended up back at the science wing bathrooms. Now these bathrooms are faculty only, 
and the doors are always shut. They both open just simply by pushing on the door, no knobs or levers to turn, but the women's room on the left doesn't normally shut all the way. It stays propped open on its own about half an inch, unless you forcefully pull it all the way closed. I always start with the men's room on the right. I go in and out of the boys' room a few times to grab things off my cart. At one point, I open the boys' room door and take two or three steps in, when suddenly the door to the girls' room slams shut. It wasn't just a normal slam. This was loud to the point where I jumped, and I don't scare easily. I go back into the hall and the door is all the way shut. I open the door to the girls' room, certain that nobody's actually in there, but just to be safe, I do my normal, hello, is anyone in there? Custodial needs to come in, with the door just cracked open. No response. I open the door fully, and both stalls are open and there's nobody inside. I lean back into the hallway and I shout for Jeff, thinking that he's somehow pulling a prank on me, slamming the door and then running into a nearby classroom or something. But then it occurred to me, these bathrooms are pretty far removed from any classrooms in both directions. If it was Jeff or a kid or anybody playing a prank, I would have seen them. A few seconds after shouting to whoever may have been listening, I swear I heard faint whispers. The problem was, I couldn't tell which direction they were coming from. It was like they were all around me. I asked them to speak up, and they suddenly went silent. I must have spent 10 minutes playing with that door, trying to figure out what could have caused it to slam so hard. There are no windows that could have blown it shut, and the only vent in the room is on the other side of the room, and it doesn't blow hard enough to move the door with that kind of force, if at all. I quickly finished my work in the bathrooms, and I swept the hallway floors so I could finish up for the night. Once I was finished, I took one final walk around to shut off any classroom lights and lock any doors that might have been left open. I also went to shut off the hallway lights. While doing this, I made sure that I did not have my headphones in. If something wanted my attention, I was going to make sure they got it. Nothing happened while I made my final rounds upstairs, so I went downstairs to find Jeff. I asked him about the bathroom door slamming and where he was around that time. He told me he was in the sixth grade classrooms by the kitchen, which is on the first floor and on the opposite side of the building. He also said that he had never experienced the bathroom door do anything weird before, but then again, he never really worked in the upstairs wings before. I walked with Jeff talking to him about random stuff as he went around shutting off the lights it's probably around 9.15 at this point. Yes, we were there a little late at this point, but we didn't really mind. As we made our way down near the music wing, something urged me to look back down the hall from which we'd come, so I did just that. I turned to look, and I still get chills and smile like a madman when I think about what I saw. I saw a dark gray transparent figure shaped like a person walking from left to right down the hall toward the gym. I immediately start running down the hall to try to see it again, but I played it off to Jeff like I thought I saw a real person and was going to direct them out of the building, but I know what I saw. There were no people in the building. There were no basketball practices, no extracurriculars going on that late, and there should have been absolutely nobody else in the building at all. I turn the corner and I don't see anybody. I check all the bathrooms and there's no one. I checked farther down the hall around the corner and there was nothing. I looked outside to the front plaza, but there wasn't a soul, no people, no cars, nothing. At this point, I honestly got teary eyed, but not because I was upset or scared, because I was happy. To that point in my life, those were the most intense experiences I had ever had with the paranormal. I firmly believed that someone was trying to contact me over those three days. Jeff and I finished up and went home. I have since been back to that school a handful of times, 
but unfortunately, I have never had any truly great experiences like I did those three nights, other than the shadows that we all sometimes see out of the corners of our eyes, but who really knows for sure if those are spirits. They were nothing like the walking figure that I saw, so I chalked them up to my mind playing tricks on me. But like I said, who could be sure? The woman who normally works the upstairs wing of that school doesn't believe my stories. She's worked there for 11 years and says she's never experienced anything in that building before. But she's also one of the most closed-minded people I've ever met. She doesn't believe in ghosts and won't even ponder the idea of aliens or life outside of our planet. She says that I only saw what I wanted to see and that my experience was what I wanted to experience. Quite frankly, I think that's bull. My theory is that since I was clearly interested in what the spirit or spirits were doing, given that I would spend significant amounts of time trying to debunk my experiences, they tried to keep my attention. Almost like they were all starved for attention. I also think it's possible that since I was in a middle school, the spirit or spirits may have been those of middle school aged kids, and they were probably just doing juvenile pranks to mess with me. When I called for the voices I was hearing, they went silent. Kind of like how students sometimes do when they get yelled at for talking during a test or something. It's all a theory, but I think those ideas make sense, and I hope that they make sense to whoever's hearing this. I know these aren't the scariest encounters, but they're very near and dear to me. Like I said, I've always believed in ghosts, and I've had some smaller encounters with what I believe were ghosts. But up until that point in my life, those were the most intense encounters I'd ever had. I've had some more encounters recently, some at another school that I believe is haunted, and maybe I'll tell those stories sometime. But for now, I'll leave it here. Let me start by saying that before this sequence of events, I was 100% a non-believer of the paranormal. I'm still in shock of what I witnessed yesterday. But I'll tell you the whole thing from the beginning. One month ago, in my apartment building, some weird noises started. It was like somebody was doing construction work on their flat. I didn't pay much attention. I figured somebody could be repairing stuff or something of that sort. It started on a Friday, and it was almost always in the afternoon, ending at like 2 or 3 in the morning. The weekend, the same thing. The morning was quiet, and then the rest of the day busy with a noise that was like somebody hammering or something. Everyone that was on the right side of the building, my side, was starting to get annoyed, mostly because everybody wanted to rest, to be able to work the next day. Of course, we started to try to find the location of the source, to pin this down to some singular apartment. There's also another building close to ours where the walls connect. I've gone to every apartment and put my ear near the lock, and there's almost no sound. The flat most affected is my upper neighbor, where she lives with her daughter. We thought maybe it could be the apartment above her making all this noise, even though the water supply is shut down, same with electricity so logically nobody should be living there. But we had to be 100% sure. So we called the owner and asked her kindly to open the apartment so we could check to see if somebody was using it or had forced an entrance. No one was there, and the noise could be heard. It was coming from the apartment under where my neighbor above lives, so we ruled out that the inhabited apartment was the source. Time goes by and this phenomenon repeats every single day without missing bangs on the walls, bangs on every division of the apartment of my neighbor, on the furniture, things falling in the bathroom and the kitchen. Police were called three times, but of course they couldn't find anything. They entered this flat and they also heard the noise, but they couldn't pinpoint where the sound was coming from. It also travels very fast, from the kitchen to the living room, etc. Also, in the corridor on the first floor, we started to bang on the wooden walls, and we would get replies, 
from this unknown source. We would even ask questions, saying knock once for yes, knock twice for no, and we would get replies. Fast forward, and finally both my neighbor and her daughter went away for the weekend. Magically, the sound stopped. I didn't know this until yesterday. I just thought, finally, the noise went away. They returned yesterday. And guess what also returned? That's right, the knocking again. So I was in the corridor with both of my upper neighbors and another from the same corridor chatting. Both she and her daughter were outside the flat. Her daughter was playing with the other girl, the other neighbor's granddaughter. And by this time, there were no noises. We were all just chilling. But later on, her daughter went inside to pick a doll to play with. We started hearing the knocks again. Every single time her daughter went inside, we would hear, after about three to five seconds, the knocking. So I asked my neighbor, can I go inside? And she replies, yes, of course. I went inside, full silence. I stood there for like 30 seconds, nothing. I came out and I asked my neighbor if she could go inside as well. She goes inside, zero knocks. We ask her daughter if she can go inside again, and boom, knocking all over the place. I kid you not, this didn't miss, and we did this like 10 or 12 times. And every single time the daughter went inside, the knocking would start. Later on, other neighbors arrived on the corridor. We did the same process, and when the neighbors went inside, there were no noises. But when the daughter went in, full-blown knocks. I honestly don't know how to deal with or solve this situation. But after what I've witnessed, I'm 100% sure that this is something of the paranormal. I just don't know what. This occurred over 20 years ago, but is still fresh in my mind. My son was born early, at 32 weeks. We were lucky, and he had few issues, and we were able to bring him home a month after he was born. He came home on oxygen and caffeine due to bradycardia. Once we were home, strange things began to happen. The cat refused to go into his room, and before he was born, I was forever removing said cat from his room. Our dog would sit at the bottom of the stairs and tilt his head as if he was listening to something. I would be changing his diaper and start talking as I thought his dad had come into the room, only to turn and find out I was alone. A friend gave him a peekaboo big bird toy that would say, peekaboo when you covered and then uncovered its eyes. This toy would go off all the time, even after I put it into a box in the closet. I often felt that I was not alone in that house. My parents had given us an angel care baby monitor as a gift. This had a pad that was placed under the mattress and an alarm would sound if it didn't detect any movement after a certain amount of time. As our son was tiny, only five pounds when he came home, this alarm would go off often. I would wake up, walk into his room, turn it off and check on him. He was always fine. And I never felt that it was anything but the fact that he was so tiny that the pad didn't pick up his breathing. During this time, I would often dream of a woman that I would find in his room. I never saw her directly but I would dream that I saw the shadow of a woman with long hair, standing and reaching into his crib. The dreams never scared me, but I did find them very odd, yet comforting at the same time. I can't remember how long he'd been home, but it was at least a month. He was still on oxygen and still on caffeine. Our bed was to the left of our bedroom door, and I slept on the right-hand side, next to the door. My husband slept on the left. I was asleep and was awoken by being shaken roughly on the door side of the bed. I woke up and looked over at my husband and said, why are you shaking me? 
only to realize he was completely asleep and on the wrong side to have shaken me. I immediately jumped up and ran to my son's room. I flipped on the light, something I had never done to this point, and I heard a gasp from the crib. Often when babies spontaneously stop breathing, you need to startle them to get them to start again. I truly believe that he had stopped breathing and that my turning on the light startled him into breathing again. After this episode, the dreams and the strange occurrences with the pets and toy continued until my son came off the oxygen and caffeine. Once that happened, the odd occurrences stopped, the pets stopped acting weird, and the big bird toy never went off on its own again. I really believe that something or someone came back from the hospital with us to keep him safe. The feeling I got from my dreams was that it was a young woman, maybe early to mid twenties and indigenous. I'm Canadian. I will always be grateful for them watching over him and shaking me awake that night so that I could startle my son into breathing again. In November of 2017, I was in the end stages of my pregnancy. Our apartment was heated by a gas fireplace and, stupidly, the carbon monoxide detector was in an adjacent room with the door closed. It wasn't until the door opened that my husband and I were aware that I was slowly being poisoned. I was sent to the hospital. While on oxygen, I went into labor and thus began a very horrible ordeal. I could elaborate, but I'm skipping it for now. Anyway, three things happened. Number one, my daughter was born. Number two, something latched onto me while I was in the ER for the poisoning. And number three, my husband took a job out of state to support us while getting his career going. Week one after leaving the hospital. The whole time I'm in the maternity wing, I'm having issues sleeping. Insomnia is common for me, so I didn't think of it too much. However, every time I started to sleep, I would wake up from a panic attack. This went on for the week that I was there, and about a week after coming home. Eventually, I was able to start sleeping, but then things started to happen. I lived in the apartment for three years prior, with no incidents but onwards of week two coming home from the hospital, a lot of things started happening. I kept a journal and I've written it out here. So this is exactly what happened and how I felt about it at the time. November 22nd, 2017, whispering coming from the audio baby monitor. This is a common occurrence from this point forward. December 8th, first unusual cold spot. Living room was always about 20 degrees warmer than the rest of the apartment, but suddenly it was freezing in one spot of the room, never cold there again. December 11th, the baby mobile's batteries drained rapidly. This also became common. First set of batteries last a month. All following batteries died within 72 hours, was eventually moved to my mother's house where the mobile operated as intended. January 3rd, 2018. Never felt comfortable being alone in the house. Felt cold no matter where I was. Started living in my mother's house to avoid being in my apartment. February 17th. Mother's landlord threatens to up my mother's rent if I don't leave. I return home. Was greeted with a horrible stench and was forced to clean my whole house top to bottom to get rid of it. Daughter begins to scream in her sleep. This occurs about once a week. I can't wake her, but she's screaming. Doctors find nothing wrong. April 1st, husband returns home. Everything stops happening. I feel like I'm crazy because no one has witnessed this but me. He gets a job at home. Everything seems fine. We live happily. August 6th. 
While outside on the balcony, the door handle that I had just used with no problem breaks, trapping me outside. While trying to climb down from the second floor, I fall, break my back, and end up hospitalized. My aunt moves in to help with my daughter while I recover. Months later, my aunt confesses from day one of being there that she felt like somebody was watching her and was often cold. I was drugged up for two months while recovering, so I don't have much to say. October 27th. We decide to move my daughter into her own bedroom before her birthday. We had the baby monitor, a blanket, and a bag sitting on the coffee table when we all stepped outside, my husband, my aunt, my daughter, and I, to see our friend in the parking lot. When we returned, the baby monitor was sitting on the floor, three feet away in an upright position. This is when my husband believed me about what I'd said while he was gone, and my aunt confesses her issues listed above. October 29th. A doll that had been sitting on a shelf in my daughter's room is sitting upright in the middle of the living room the next morning. My daughter could not reach it, nor leave her crib. My aunt was sleeping on the couch and heard nobody in the night. November 2018 to July 2019. I'm grouping this together because there's too much stuff in the journal, but basically the house went haywire. I have several days where multiple entries occur. Thumping, lights flickering, bad odors, cold spots, toys turning on by themselves, objects moving, whispering, and my daughter develops nightmares on an almost nightly basis. March 9th, our friend W comes to visit. In a very disturbing way to greet her, the word hello is written on the bathroom mirror from a marker that originated from a separate room. This isn't her first dealings with hauntings, so she replies with, Hello, who are you? Later, it replied with, Rick. June 14th. Our friend L asks to use our apartment to host a party for some MLM she was a part of. 30 plus people show up throughout the night. One, who has never set foot in our apartment prior, commented that the bathroom light kept turning on and off the whole night, even when no one was in there. June 29th. My mother and her boyfriend come to visit. Everyone was drinking and goofing off. Suddenly, the boyfriend demands to go home and leaves without explanation. Later, my mother informs me that he saw a black mass floating around the ceiling, hovering around me, and moving like it was pulling something out of me. He convinces my mom to have a cleansing done. July 1st, evening. My mother, with the aid of her boyfriend and guidance from his friend, performed a cleansing, drawing everything out of the main door. My daughter screamed the whole time this was happening, but immediately fell asleep once it was done. The house felt still, like frozen in time until sunrise. July 2nd, morning. A black handprint was found on the roof of the outside stairs. I lived in a multi-family home, and the stairs to the second floor were outside because the second floor is a separate apartment. From then on, we didn't have anything else happen. We moved out in June of 2020. Two months after, my daughter asked me why we no longer lived in the old house. I told her why, and that we weren't moving back there. She replied with, Good. Mr. Black was scary. He wanted to eat my face. To start off, I haven't gotten much sleep over the past few months. My insomnia has gotten really bad, and my doctors act as if I'm medication seeking whenever I ask for help. Anyway, the house that I'm in currently, I know for a fact, has some kind of beings living in this big hedge in the backyard. They've been seen all around the house though. I saw one on a snowy day, run from behind my neighbor's parked RV to behind one of those weird trees that looks like a bunch of skinny trees just growing from the same spot. 
I'm not sure the name of the specific type of tree, but the main point is that you can see through to the other side pretty easily between the little trunks. Anyway, I saw what appeared to be a fat little man, about a foot tall, run from the RV to behind the tree. So, without breaking eye contact with the tree, in case whatever it was ran, I walked over to see if I could find footprints or something, in case maybe it was a rabbit. I got to it, and of course, there were no footprints, nothing in the tree, not even a rabbit or a squirrel. I knew what it was, but I just decided to leave it be, and went back inside. A few months later, my little brother saw the same looking thing run in between two of the same types of trees that I mentioned earlier, just on the other side of my house. All he said was it looked like a tiny roundish man, running, definitely on two legs, and again, no footprints. It was muddy that day, so if it had been an animal, there should have been footprints. It seems to me like they use those specific trees as some kind of portal or entryway to something. So that's the first being that I had questions about. The second has been happening a lot more recently, and is why I mentioned at first that I have insomnia, because that very well could be what the cause of this was. Our minds are fragile things when not being cared for properly, after all. Within the last month or so, I have seen this thing in my living room. I sleep in my living room because I have too much anxiety to sleep in the back end of my house. I have babies, and if something were to happen, I feel like I wouldn't hear it. Both times I've seen this figure, I've been laying in bed trying to sleep. I'll roll over and look at my brick fireplace, and I'll see this tiny little humanoid type thing run for just a split second. But it's not fast. It seems like it's a slow motion echo of a child running. I'm not very good at describing these things, but I will try. It was transparent, but I could make out what seemed like bones. It honestly looked like an x-ray or an ultrasound of a child. It was like a sheer white color, like a ghostly skeleton in a way. It had a disproportionately large head and a tiny body. It couldn't have been more than 10 inches tall. As I mentioned before, it looked like I had just seen a slow motion flash of this thing running. It just kind of dissipated after I saw it. I've seen this thing twice in almost the same spot. The spots are maybe five to ten inches away from each other. I saw it the first time almost a month ago, and then last night as well. I was hesitant to tell this story because I had recently heard from people that talking about seeing dwarves or elves or fae will just piss them off. I don't really know. I just wanted to share the experience and ask if anybody has any idea about what this could be. I'm still thinking fae, but not sure. It doesn't feel bad. It seems more playful or curious, but I know things like this can easily deceive. Any input is appreciated. So, let me know if you have any ideas. Over a week ago, my friend and I were out on the town. Later that night, we drove up to the forest about a mile up the hill and away from my house. It was about 9 p.m. when we arrived up there. It was a very strange night, to be honest. The moon was visible behind the clouds, and everything was very dark. We pretty much were just standing around for about 10 minutes next to my car, in the darkness, looking into the forest and having a smoke break. Then, the forest got super quiet. After that, a guy with a dog came by, but nothing unusual, right? Well, then it got even quieter. That's when I spotted some strange lights in the forest. Probably half a mile inside, between the trees. It almost looked like candlelight. We didn't have any snow by then, 
It had been about a week or two since we'd had any, so it wasn't that. I told my friend and pointed over to the lights. They just shrugged it off and told me that it was clear. It was probably a house in the distance. But it wasn't, because I knew for a fact that there was no house there. There was only one farther up the road, not over there in that area of the forest. I knew that forest well. We were looking at and watching it for a bit, until this really strange feeling hit us, as though we were being watched. We heard some leaves rattling and some branches cracking. Otherwise, those lights looked like they were coming closer. I could swear it. Then I started to feel like I was hearing some kind of voice from where those lights were. But I couldn't be sure. It was very strange. After finishing the smoke break, we got back in the car since it felt way too creepy. Just to kind of put everything at ease, I said, No worries, we're just visiting and we come in peace. I know you're out there. My friend just glared at me like I was a madwoman, knowing that at least one Wendigo and some other beings roamed around this forest. At least that's what the stories say. Well, nothing really eventful happened until afterwards. I went to bed that following night and I had a very strange, lucid dream. I could almost say it was astral for what it was worth. In the dream, I was going close to the forest, looking down to where the swamp was. It was a bright afternoon in the middle of winter. The snow was covering almost everything. Then there was a windigo. Now, there's one windigo that always appears in my dreams, but this one was different. It looked kind of like a bear's skeleton, with a skull, a big skull that looked strange and had antlers, and half a skeleton rotten like a corpse for a body. I stared at it, and it looked at me, and then just started running at me. The sound was deafening. You know that sound you hear after a loud explosion? It was like that, but with white noise and static in my vision. A moment later, I was awake, looking around. I said, what the heck? And then turned around and went to sleep again. I fell asleep and I woke up to the same dream. But this time, I was really mad. The next thing I remember was me bolting toward it, bearing some unhuman wrath ramming my fist into its ribcage and tearing it apart. Moments later, I saw him fall apart, letting out some kind of screech. I later woke up, and that was pretty much it. I don't know if the dream is connected to that place and what we saw, but something weird is definitely going on with that forest. My boyfriend and I absolutely adore hiking, and there are many places to go because we live in Oregon. Anyway, we decided to go hiking after 11 p.m. at night to one of the most used trails in our area. We had both been there multiple times throughout our lives, and neither of us were concerned about something happening. There was only one thing that we were kind of nervous about, and that was the wildfire that had just happened. We parked on the side of the road and walked to the start of the trail. Even though there was a fire path, it was actually very clean and stable. We started walking up the trail when we started talking about paranormal things. I know it was probably a terrible move on our side to talk about that sort of thing at night in the middle of the forest, but anyway. Now it is to be noted that we both had flashlights, very good ones and we were both being very observant as to where we were on the path. As we got deeper into the conversation, we both realized in just a second that we weren't on a trail anymore, or anywhere near one. I mean, it was like in a blink of an eye. All of a sudden, I remember walking on the trail, and then we just weren't. I freaked out and told him that we needed to start backtracking. 
But thankfully, he said no, because we couldn't see any trail around us or anything that we recognized. I truly believe if we had tried to backtrack, I wouldn't be here telling you this story. He told me that we needed to start walking up the hill in hopes of either standing on a ledge to see where we were or to find another path. We walked for a while up the hill when thankfully we popped out on a fire road. We walked all the way down, terrified, and came out on the road about a mile from where our car was. It was a really strange experience and I don't really have any explanation. I just know in my gut that it's a really good thing we didn't turn around. I'm a 30-year-old man, blonde, blue-eyed, and a work ethic like boxer from Animal Farm. I work at a BJ's wholesale club from 8 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon, pushing carts, filling propane tanks, and helping out where they need me. In the mornings, I usually walk around the parking lot while listening to a queue of music and podcasts that I line up for myself the day before, all of it going in through one earbud while I have the other ear open paying attention to my surroundings. Also, I'm not really prone to unusual or paranormal happenings in my life, so needless to say, the following event really caught me by surprise. To set the stage, it was between 8 and 9 in the morning. The sun was out, and I'd already gotten the propane filling station set for the day, and I pushed all the shopping carts left in the parking lot and stalls overnight back to where they needed to be near the store entrance. I'm about to do what I call my morning perimeter walk. This walk involves walking the outer edge of the parking lot and behind the store to make sure that nothing is out of place and that nobody has taken it upon themselves to tag the back of the store, leaving me to photograph it and show the store management at the most opportune moment. I've just started my perimeter walk and I'm just about into an episode of the Rooster Teeth podcast, always open on Spotify. I'm minding my own business, tunnel visioning out, and suddenly I hear a woman's voice humming in my left ear. Thinking back, it reminded me a little bit of the lullaby hummed by the Huntress in the game Dead by Daylight. This snapped me out of my routine. I paused the podcast and I took the earbud out of my right ear. I listened carefully to get an idea of where the humming was coming from for about a minute and a half, but it had completely stopped. All I heard was the usual background noise. It was too close for it to be any car audio from a car pulling out from behind me. I would have heard the engine and the sound of the tires against the pavement and veered out of the way for them to pass. I want to make it clear that nobody is walking around the parking lot aside from me. Everyone else is either filling up at the gas station or in the store. There's a manager who comes out and sits in their truck at the end of the parking lot where this happened, but he wasn't anywhere to be seen when this took place. After coming to grips with the fact that I'm nearing my two-year anniversary working at this store and that there's no way it was anything that wanted to hurt me, I just shrugged it off and continued onward to tackle the rest of the day. I had never had an auditory experience like that before in the nearly two years that I've worked there, and I didn't experience anything like that for the rest of that weekend. I don't know if anybody else has had an experience like that, but if you have, let me know. I'd honestly like to share in the experience. My grandmother would always tell me about knocking that she would hear, either a few days before or moments before somebody close to her would pass away. It would usually be around three knocks, in no particular place. She said that she would sometimes hear it at the back door, behind the wall, or coming from outside. My grandmother had always kind of had this weird gift to see and experience things that were 
I guess paranormal for lack of a better word. She would always tell me her experiences, and me, being not the bravest person on earth, would get so scared I wouldn't be able to sleep well for days. I always thought the knocks were interesting whenever she told me about them, because not long after, it usually happened, someone would die, or she would complain for days that she wasn't sleeping. Then the knocks would happen, as well as other weird things. I was very open to the idea of these knocks due to the fact that evidently people sometimes passed away after, and I believed that things like that could happen. Last year, the three knocks happened to me. It was a Friday morning, and that entire week, my grandmother's sister, Sari, was fighting COVID in a hospital. Sari was the second closest thing to a grandmother for me, so I had a great love for her. I wouldn't say we were close, but there was that grandmotherly love that she had always given me. When I woke up, I was still between that state of being very sleepy, but also fully aware of my surroundings, as I wasn't asleep. I know that I had my back to the door of my room when I heard three faint but audible knocks on my door. I opened my mouth to say, yes, and then it hit me like a train that I heard absolutely nobody walk to the door or open any of the doors we had in the hallway. And trust me when I say I have the loudest family, so I should have heard someone or something. My body froze and a chill went right down my back. For a good minute, I was too terrified to move. I laid in bed for a while to listen if anybody would maybe walk away or open the door to confirm that it was indeed one of my family members, but nothing, just silence after that. I even thought maybe it was my brother trying to scare me, but long story short, exactly three days later after I heard the three knocks, my grandmother's sister, sorry, passed away in the morning. The whole experience freaked me out and I still struggled to comprehend what happened, but it did. There's probably a logical explanation, but the fact that she died a while after really scared me, and it made me think about what my grandmother had always told me. So, maybe a week ago, at my friend's suggestion, I asked my spirit guides for guidance. If you believe in that sort of thing, or any of this, great. If not, bear with me. An owl landed on top of the flagpole in my yard that night. I spend a lot of time in my car smoking cigarettes and listening to music, so that's why I was out there. So after that, I subconsciously started directing my prayers to the top of the flagpole. Keep in mind, there's no flag on it. It's just a knob of some sort in an odd shape, like a bird, almost. I don't think this knob is anything in and of itself, but here's the thing. One night, while I was looking at it, I realized that it was shifting. The dark silhouette of the thing looked like it was subtly changing and moving almost the way that a flame behaves, but it's dark because it's just a silhouette at night. I realized that this shifting shadow type energy is something that I've seen before, and that scared me. I was worried because it looks like shadow people, the way their silhouettes shift. But for some reason, I decided to talk to it. Now, I know I might sound crazy at this point, but there's more. I talk to it a lot, and it usually can't really respond, but it did tell me its name is Tether. That's one of the only things I was able to understand. I know, kind of a creepy name, and that seemed like a red flag to me too. But the owl landed there, so I figured it must have been the same thing, or they were connected somehow. I've been sharing my problems with Tether and asking him to help me. I made it clear that he's not allowed inside the house, and that in return for being chill with me, I would dedicate tobacco burnings to him. 
Some Native American tribes used to burn tobacco to spirits for reference, and I'm half Native American. Anyway, everything was fine, but I noticed the other night that the gate was wide open, which was a little creepy. And then tonight, the passenger seat of my car was fully reclined. I told Tether not to move things anymore because it makes me uncomfortable. I've talked to one of my friends about this because she sees things too. She said that shadows aren't always bad. It might just be the only way we can perceive it. She called it a gnome or a fairy. That's why I've been treating it like an acquaintance. But I can't help but wonder if it's something else. I don't want to be alarmist and jump to the worst case scenario, but does anybody know what this might be? I have had many paranormal, seemingly extraterrestrial, glitch in the matrix and skinwalker experiences. I think one too many for one person to have. The one I am going to tell you about freaks me out to this day. There is quite a bit of detail to this story, so I will try to make it as coherent as possible. The time was 2011, my final year of high school. Now, I am a Navajo from a small reservation in New Mexico, and the nearest city is 30 miles west. I attended a public school in that city. Therefore, I had to wake up at 5 a.m. every morning to catch the bus at 6, which picked up more kids along the way, and we would arrive with just enough time to get breakfast before class at 7.25. This particular morning seemed normal, my alarm went off at 5. I showered, fixed my hair, and was ready by 5.40. I would usually give myself 10 to 15 minutes to make some breakfast and pack my lunch. I did just that, and decided to have Pop-Tarts that morning. I checked the time on the stove clock, and it was 5.50. I popped the tarts into the toaster and went to my room to gather my things into my backpack. As I was finished with that, I saw that my alarm clock read 5.55, and I went to grab my Pop-Tarts. The stove clock read 5.56. We had a big clock right by our front door, and it also read 5.56. I checked the time often so that I could perfectly time my walk to the bus so that it showed up just as I arrived at my bus stop. Additionally, it was a winter morning, and it was dark out. The sun didn't start to come up until about 7, and I didn't want to be stuck in the cold dark for too long. Normally, when I stepped outside, there would be cars driving about, neighbors who turned on their vehicles to warm them up from a frigid winter night. But that morning, there was nobody, and that was a bit strange to me, but I didn't pay that fact any mind. Now, since it's the reservation, aka the middle of nowhere, where I lived, there wasn't much light either. Few residents had street lights in the cluster of homes where I lived. Unfortunately, the route that I walked every day had no street lights, so the only lights I could see in the near pitch black were the ones at my back from our porch light in the north, a neighbor's porch light who lived three acres away in the southern direction, and the far off lights of the city that lit the sky in the east there were also the lights from the reservation clinic, which was about a mile south as well. I should also let you know that each home in a cluster of homes is set on an acre lot. My bus stop was two acres away. I would walk directly south to meet up with the only paved road, the highway, which met the dirt road in the east. From my home to that stop, it only took me a minute or two. When I stepped outside, Nothing was astir, which, like I said, was really odd. However, I wasn't out there alone, because although it was almost pitch black, I saw the silhouette of a girl who caught the bus at the same time as I did, and at the same stop. Good, I thought, I'm not out here alone. I followed about ten feet behind her. When we neared the stop, she veered off to the cattle guard, where she always sat to wait for the bus. 
I always sat on the porch steps of my uncle's house when the bus hadn't arrived yet, which was only about five to ten yards from the bus stop. When I sat on those steps, I started to notice more and more things that were out of place. One of those was the fact that my uncle, an early riser who was always awake by five, who always had his lights on by the time I was catching the bus, was not awake. He wasn't out having his morning coffee as usual. No lights, no sounds from inside his house. I thought, maybe he's sleeping in today. Then the neighbor whose home was three acres away from mine, my uncle's next door neighbor, whose porch light was on, would normally have had their vehicle running, warming up by now, and their lights would be on showing that somebody was awake and probably getting ready for work. But there were no signs of anybody being awake at all, and the truck wasn't on. Well, maybe they have the day off, I thought, still waiting for the bus. The other girl's silhouette I could see from the city lights that lit the sky to the east, and she was still sitting there and waiting as well. I was a little bit unsettled, but I didn't start to feel really creeped out until I started to hear the howls and yelps from what sounded to be a pack of coyotes that seemed to be only across the main highway. Since I didn't have a cell phone at the time, I had guessed that I was waiting for about 10 minutes. Finally, I thought, okay, this is ridiculous. Where is the bus? It should have been here by now. I was on time, and it was very unlike the bus or the bus driver to pick us up more than five minutes late. I decided to wake up my uncle and ask if maybe we had missed the bus, so I knocked on his door for a good three minutes, to no avail. Then I just decided to walk over and ask the girl if she wanted to walk back to our homes together since I was sufficiently weirded out by the events. As I neared her and where she sat, my eyesight adjusted in the darkness, and when I was within arm's reach, I saw that there was nobody there. I thought I was going crazy. My mind raced and I felt panic and queasy in the pit of my stomach. All the creepy skinwalker and paranormal stories that I had heard over the years began to run amok in my mind. But what remains from those stories was that I was always told to never fear any of it. You should never be afraid of the evil things that lurk in the darkness, because your fear is their fuel. I decided not to panic and run home. Instead, I just walked briskly back home, still able to hear the whoops and calls from the nearby pack of coyotes and trying to figure out what was going on. When I got inside, I went to my mom's room and asked to use her cell phone. Just as she was about to hand me her cell, she took a second glance at the screen and said, It's four in the morning. What do you need my phone for? Shock took hold of my body, and all I could do was stand there with my mouth wide open as she trailed her remark with, Are you awake? Have you been sleepwalking? I have never sleptwalked in my entire life and my reply felt forced, like I had to convince her that I was awake. I ran back to the kitchen. The clock read 4 a.m. The clock by the front door read 4 a.m. And the alarm clock in my room read 4 a.m. I don't know anything about any of these types of sleep disorders, but I seriously think that there's no way for me to have gone through with my usual routine the way that I did asleep. Needless to say, I was sufficiently freaked out and crawled back into bed. So freaked out I didn't even take my shoes off. I fell asleep thinking of the whole situation, and ironically I missed the bus that day. I told my third oldest sister, there are four of us and I'm the youngest, about what had happened. She was a little shocked at what she was hearing, and then she began to tell me of a dream she had before my experience. Now, her dreams we have begun to revere as visions of sorts, since she's had many of them end up coming true. Her earliest one, I remember, was when we were in elementary school, and my dad called and said that earlier in the day he was in a small airplane, and that they nearly crashed into the mountains near San Carlos, Arizona. She told us about a dream about being in an airplane, in a heavily forested area 
that the plane was about to crash, but was able to land safely a few days before we got that call from our dad. Since then, she's had others, and some she tells us about, and others she doesn't. Before I tell you about the dream, I must also tell you about a weird incident that happened to said sister at my eldest sister's house. This particular incident happened the summer preceding the winter. I had a weird experience. My sister, the dream visionary, would stay over at my eldest sister's house to help babysit my nephews. They would stay up very late, and one night or morning, because it was around 2 a.m., they heard a sort of banging in the back of the house. My sister and the nephew went out to check. When they opened the door, they saw two horses, one white and one brown, kicking with their hooves and hitting their heads against the big garbage bins, which were knocking into the house. It was as if they were trying to get in, but for what, we had no clue. To add to that weirdness, my sister's house is in a housing development that has two entrances, and since it's on the reservation, those entrances have cattle guards. So how could those two horses have gotten in? Anyway, they chased the horses out of the yard and they galloped off to who knows where. Anyway, back to her dream. She said that she was asleep at my eldest sister's house and woke up to the same banging noise that those horses had been making that night in the summer. She said she got up and walked to the front window and looked out past the blinds and saw those same horses standing just inches from her on the other side of the window. Then she saw the two horses shape shift into people, an in-law and his son. They had menacing looks on their faces, and she said she felt that they were pure evil. She yelled at them to go away, and as soon as she turned away, she saw me, sleepwalking toward the back door. She went to grab me to put me back in bed, but as she got closer, she saw that the back door was wide open and that the sun was beckoning me to follow him, to go outside. As I took a few steps out the door, she pulled me back inside, slammed and locked the door, and laid me back down, and that was where her dream ended. The story, however, gets creepier. After that weird time warp occurrence coupled with my sister's dream, my mom decided to take me to see a medicine man to have a prayer ceremony. He said that it was a skinwalker who was messing with our family. He said that the skinwalker intended to destroy my mom's life, but that she was too strong and that the harm it wished for her would then fall to her children, the weaker ones. And here I thought I was being pretty strong. Further, he said that the skinwalker impersonated the shadow of the girl who usually rode the bus with me and was also the one who created the sounds of the coyotes. The skinwalker created an illusion to lure me outside, and that the skinwalker was someone within the family. After the prayer ceremony, he said that I should never repeat anything that he said, or even the events that occurred. I don't think a lot of people heed that, though. I don't know if he would call it a warning or advice from the medicine man, but a lot of Navajos, if you get close enough to them, and they're not super traditional, will tell you all about scary and weird skinwalker stories of their own. They're pretty common, and even the ones that caused them to have to get a prayer or ceremony done, they'll tell those too. And this story is mine. About five years ago, when I was 14, my best friend and I, both female, went for a walk on a hiking route in our village. We had always known that it existed, but we'd never gone there, so we didn't know how long the hike would take. About halfway through, it started to get really dark outside. The route was a road through the woods that had no street lights whatsoever. So we called one of our guy friends that had a crosser bike to come so that we wouldn't be alone. He came and we continued our walk in complete darkness. He turned off the bike because it was loud and decided to just push it. We didn't use our flashlights because the moonlight illuminated our path. 
As we were walking and talking, I heard something about 20 feet away in the woods that sounded like a loud scream through crying. I immediately stopped and looked at my friends because I thought I was the only one who had heard it, but their terrified looks told me that they had heard it too. The two of them jumped on the bike and I ran after them to the first streetlight. Yeah, I know, they left me behind. We were panicking and trying to find an explanation for that sound. Maybe some kind of animal? Until I remembered a story about the Drekovac. I live in Balkan, and I don't think the name has a translation, but I guess I would call it maybe a howler or a screamer. Basically, it's a mythology creature characteristic in the Balkans, and there are probably 20 different beliefs as to what it is. This is the only paranormal thing that has ever happened to me, and to this day I get goosebumps when I tell the story to somebody, because I remember it like it happened yesterday. When I was 17, my 13-year-old sister died. I was moved out and living in Michigan at the time, and she was living with our mother in Texas. She and a friend that was staying the night with her snuck out to meet her friend's boyfriend, and at 1.50 a.m. in the middle of downtown, she was struck by an oncoming train and died. A little side note that I find strange is that that night, I had the feeling that something was coming. I was too afraid to sleep. I left the light on all night and I pushed my mattress far to one side so that I could line the bed frame with my crystals and hopefully protect myself from whatever was coming. I messaged a few of my friends even, telling them to stay safe. It never crossed my mind that my younger sister was in danger. At 5 a.m., I'm up watching TV with my roommate and my mom calls. She asks if I'm sitting down I run into my room and sit, and I ask her what's up. She tells me that Nan is dead and explains what happened. I swear my soul left my body for a moment. I heard my own screams like I was underwater. I barely remember the rest of the day, but I was able to go pack and I was on my way to Texas in a plane very early the next morning. I listened to how it's going to be on repeat for the whole ride. When I finally made it to my mom's, I bypassed everybody and went into my sister's room and sat on her bed, soaking up the last of her scent. The week was a blur. I held my mother, wrote the obituary. My older sisters and I planned her memorial. I wove together a crown of flowers from our yard for her to wear while she was cremated. I don't think any of us ate a single morsel of food, despite loving community members pummeling us with casseroles. Exactly seven days after her death, nearly to the minute, my older sisters and I were hiding behind the garage sharing a smoke. There was a light directly above us, illuminating the space we were in, and shrouding the rest of the farm in an even blacker darkness. Suddenly I hear, Josie's on a vacation far away, come around and talk it over. So many things that I want to say. You know I like my girls a little bit older quietly at first. We all joined in for the chorus, confirming that they heard this song as well, and the next verse was louder. We joined in for the chorus again, and she's louder still, surrounding us. It sounded like she was singing from the darkness, directly next to the garage, and inching closer with every word. She sings the entire song, and then suddenly my sisters take off running and I follow. It's strange, I was scared. I mean, I was sure it was my sister, and yet I felt fearful. We all run inside and stand in the dimly lit living room, talking over what just happened. Two of my sisters swear that it was my mother singing, on top of our old windmill, so the sound was traveling. My other sister and I swear it was Nan. One of my sisters creeps upstairs to check on my mother, and she's fast asleep. At this point, we all run outside shrieking Nan's name into the dark, trying to get her to come back. 
she doesn't. We googled the song lyrics and they were just absolutely perfect for expressing what she was trying to. She sang the whole thing, loud and clear. It still rocks me whenever I think about it. Absolutely crazy and unbelievable. This happened in 2009, during my summer holiday when I was eight years old. As we had done for many years, my family and I went to Cordoba, Argentina, and rented a cabin. Strange things often happened at that cabin, like objects moving around, strange noises, or even items that just disappeared. One night, I was sleeping when I suddenly got up in the middle of the night I looked in front of me, and there was an old, creepy woman who was just staring at me. She didn't say a word, so I just closed my eyes, and when I opened them, she was gone. I ran to my father's bedroom and told my parents, but of course they didn't believe me. About two years ago, we went to those cabins again. One day, I struck up a conversation with the owner, and he was telling me about some strange noises he had heard that night. Surprised, I told him about the creepy vision that I had had. He just answered, You are not the first one that that has happened to. Many people have reported having visions of an old woman or a girl who stares at them in the night. I've always had an open mind when it comes to spirits, ghosts, specters, whatever you want to call them. I'd never personally experienced anything until the night that I'm about to describe. A little background. I was about 23 years old and I had been in the US Air Force for about five years. I had moved from Texas, where I was raised, to Alaska. I had been deployed a couple of times and had been halfway around the world at least twice. While traveling, I had seen the dance clubs in the Philippines and seen the party scene in the areas just off base in South Korea. I was married to my first wife, and we had since moved to a base called K.I. Sawyer Air Force Base in Michigan, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan to be exact, about three and a half hours northeast of Green Bay, Wisconsin. For some reason or another, the first wife and I had several of our friends come over and we were having some kind of movie or game night. In our base house living room, we had two TVs running. One had a movie, another had a game system, and we were all just playing some games and having fun. We were one seat short for the number of folks we had over. And we would take turns standing as somebody would get up for some reason or another. Move your meat, lose your seat rule was in full effect. I was sitting in the middle seat of our couch, and a friend, Fox, was standing near some windows behind me to the right. I thought I heard somebody whisper my name from the kitchen area that was behind me to the left. I craned my neck over to see if there was someone in there that I wasn't aware of, but nope. I figured I was just imagining things, and I got up to check the kitchen and head to the bathroom. The bathroom was right near there. When I came out, Fox had taken my seat, so I started standing where he had been. From where I was, I could see our whole living room and kitchen area, just watching the movie and people gaming. Then I heard it again. Somebody whispered my name, but louder. Fox craned his head around to look into the kitchen, just as I spun my head over to look in there. Fox, did you hear that too? Yeah, he said. Someone said your name. From where I was, I could see everybody that was in my house at once, and nobody was in the kitchen. Fox could see everybody except me. I trotted into the kitchen and turned on the light, and that's when I saw a shape outside of the kitchen window on the little porch where the door was. 
The best way to describe what I saw next is this shape was something that looked like The Undertaker from WWE. Big, broad-brimmed hat and all dark colors. The shape turned and stepped down the steps and turned out of the little bit of light that was coming from my window. I was a young buck and I was thinking, ain't no way someone's going to peek into my windows, so I beat feet to the door and out into the night. But there was no one. When I came out of the door, I had a clear view for about 75 to 100 feet in all directions, and there was nothing moving out there. Most of my neighbors had dogs, and none of them were barking. It was silent. No barking dogs, no insects, no engines, nothing. A couple of my friends had joined me outside, and none of us saw or heard anything. Now, I've been six feet tall since I was 18 years old and I went back in and had my ex-wife hold her finger where the shoulder of the shape was. I went outside, and the shoulder of this thing was around four inches higher than my shoulder, so this thing was at least 6'4". No one in the house other than Fox heard my name called, and nobody saw the shape except me. The fact that Fox did hear my name is the only reason I don't think I imagined it. That was the night that I became a true believer in the supernatural. Back when I was 18 or 19, I had decided to go into a church in Cherokee, Alabama with my once friend, we'll call him Joel, and his family. I had gone in and Joel and I were directed to the basement with all the other people under 20 to do something. I forgot what it was, but maybe five to seven minutes in that basement, I got the most blinding headache I've ever had and excused myself outside to get some air. I waited for everybody to get done and then we headed back to where Joel and his parents lived. The whole ride, this headache did not go away. I stayed at their house maybe an hour or two while this headache just continued to get worse and worse, so I attempted to drive home to Crooked Oak. As I'm driving, the headache becomes all but blinding, and halfway home, in the night, on this dark road, I stop at this little tiny backwoods church. The pain was so immense that I couldn't focus on anything. At that point, I literally was wishing to be struck dead to escape this. I stumbled out of my Jeep, and I landed on the first bit of grass I could find, and I almost passed clean out. After a good stretch of time, once the pain had left me, I went to drag myself to the Jeep with my senses returned. And that's when I realized that I was laying on somebody's old grave. I have no idea why it helped. And I didn't do it intentionally, but there it is. To this day, though, I refuse to go near that church. So this is a true story that happened to me which I'm weary to share, as there have been many times where I've opened up only to be met with ridicule. But I hope you take this seriously, because I do. Back in 2008, my girlfriend and I decided to go to an abandoned mental asylum off of Highway 82 in Alabama called Old Bryce. It shut down a few years back due to malpractice, and some of the ghost legends, like the number two ghost, involve murder by staff at the facility. Essentially, this was a dumping ground for people that society didn't know what to do with. Thousands of people were sent there, and died there. The facility consisted of four buildings. Bryce, the residence hall, S.D. Allen, the medical facility, the crematorium, and the guard shack. I have seen two ghosts in the residence hall. The bigger of the two, I'll share with you now. My second visit to Old Bryce was strange. It was my first time inside the building, and I came prepared. It was me, my girlfriend, and our friend Chris. 
I had a flashlight and a DVD camcorder. Through the main entrance is a staircase on the right, which zigzags up to the second floor, complete with an anti-side fence at the top. Make a left, then another left, and then a quick right, and you are in the hall that led to the children's corridor. I had the flashlight in my left hand, and my camera in the right, scanning, trying to catch something. On the left, at the entrance to that room, there was a bathroom with only a tub in it. I thought I saw something in the bathroom, and shined the light that way. Nothing. I moved the camera and light, thought I saw it again, and shined it back. Nothing. Our night continued and finished without incident. The next day, I reviewed the footage. In that bathroom, I shined towards something I thought I saw, and I was right. When the light pans to the right, a bluish-white, illuminated little girl's face peers out from behind the door to follow the light. As the light shines back in her direction over the course of just two frames, she's behind the door halfway, and in the next frame, she's gone. My heart felt like ice water had run through it. I was in such shock. I proceeded to show everybody I knew. The girl's appearance was that of a younger one, maybe ten, hair parted in the middle, an unusually large forehead, and was deformed in some way. I made the mistake of leaving the camera at a friend's house overnight, who apparently was not my friend because he stole it. This is where it gets even weirder, though. Two and a half years later, I was living in a different city. One of the legends of old Bryce is that windows grow back, and if you do any damage to them, spirits will follow you home. I broke a window on accident. I was laying in bed one night at about 3 to 4 a.m. I was on the verge of sleep, aware of where I was, and very comfortable. Out of nowhere, this immobilizing, tingling sensation started at the tips of my toes. I was laying on my stomach with my arms under the pillow, completely helpless, as this sensation crept its way slowly up my legs, midsection, and eventually my entire body over the course of maybe 20 seconds. Once it covered me, I heard the whisper of a little girl directly in my ear say, I'm in your room. I cringed tightly, and for some reason I said out loud, I love you. The feeling stopped, and the whole incident left me on the verge of tears. It may or may not have been that little girl from the asylum, but according to legend, it makes sense. In order to really convey how scared I was when this happened, I'm gonna have to back up and give you a little context. For starters, I've told the whole story to maybe a handful of my closest friends, and the only family I've ever told is my twin sister. Even then, it only came up because they initiated conversations about similar topics regarding the paranormal. If I can help it, I'd rather not talk about it in real life. But here, on the wilds of the internet though, I guess I feel a little bit safer. It's also worth noting that I've included several instances that may or may not be related. Whether or not they truly are is a matter of personal speculation, but they are all paranormal nonetheless. If I had to pinpoint where it all began, I would say it was 2008, when I stayed home alone pretty much all summer. My sisters attended the Boys and Girls Club, and my parents worked all day. I was just a 13-year-old boy then, so staying home alone was pretty much the greatest thing I could think of. All I had on the agenda every day was eating junk food, playing video games, and doing whatever small chores I was assigned. Not a bad way to spend a summer. And it wasn't. For a few weeks, anyhow. When things started, though, they started small. Every couple of days, my mom would come home pissed off when she saw both of our dogs outside. We lived in North Alabama, so summer was hot and swampy. Because of that, we tended to keep the dogs inside until they needed to be let out to do their business, 
but it would never be any more than about 10 minutes. I loved those dogs, so I adhered to the 10 minute rule very strictly. It was also why I was so confused to see them outside on those days. I definitely did not let them out. Sure, I can be forgetful sometimes. Maybe one or two of those times I really did just have a brain fart. But I was 100% sure that most of those times I never let those dogs out. When I told that to my mom, she looked kind of concerned. Then I started hearing things. With freshly installed hardwood floors, I was familiar with the sound of them settling when the AC kicked on. It would be one or two popping sounds, then it would stop, until the AC turned off again. Rinse and repeat. Nothing crazy about that. One day, while I was binge playing old Nintendo games, I heard the boards settling again. But this time, it wasn't because of the AC. And instead of one or two pops, there were several dozen, moving around. They went up and down the hallway, like somebody was pacing around. I paused my game and I listened to them. Thinking maybe my mom or my stepdad were back early from work, I went out to see them, and make sure the dogs were back inside so I wouldn't get chewed out again. But nobody was home. I shrugged it off as the floorboards just being particularly active that day, and I went back to playing my game once more. About an hour passed before the sounds repeated. The same quiet little footsteps. I paused my game again, and I listened harder this time. Another sound surfaced on top of the steps. It was kind of like trying to hear somebody else's phone call from across the room. You know there's a conversation going on, but you can't quite make out what it's about. I went to look again, this time going all the way across the house and into my parents' room. Still nobody. Then I thought, well, maybe the conversation was coming from outside in the neighborhood. I brought the dogs out back with me, and they went and did their business while I waited on the porch. From what I could tell, it was just another stiff, silent summer day. This particular thing happened a few more times, and it always made me feel really uneasy. It was even worse when I told my mom about it. She replied, oh good, you hear it too. Then she went on to tell me not to tell my stepdad, because he was very religious and for some reason didn't believe in any of this stuff. Things settled down after summer was over and they stayed that way for a while. I had school to keep me occupied, and other than a few small instances, we had two quiet years. 2010 was the year things picked up a lot more. While my twin and my girlfriend at the time were hanging out in her room, they started messing around taking dumb pictures with digital cameras. Now, my twin's room was the coldest in the house, and nobody could ever figure out why. It also used to belong to my older sister. Both times either of them moved into the room, their demeanor would change over the course of a few months. Where my older sister became more manic, throwing tantrums with growing frequency, my twin was starting to get depressed sleeping all the time and always being fairly disconnected. While all three women in the house suffered from manic depression, bipolar disorder, and sometimes both, there was a very noticeable difference when my sisters occupied the room. In that digital camera my twin was playing around with, there was a picture on it that we didn't find for weeks after the fact that showed my girlfriend at the time and a really weird, smoky, veil-like presence in the room with them. Neither of them smoked, and the room never smelled like anything, so we weren't allowed to have candles in our room either. I'm still kicking myself for not saving that photo somewhere, because I think it might have been a good piece of evidence. On top of the apparition caught on my camera, my mother told me of an instance where footsteps walked from the kitchen and into the study, where she worked on some stuff for her job. When the steps entered the room, she heard a voice whisper, ouch, very clearly into her ear. The next few experiences were things only I witnessed. They are, by and large, the more extreme parts of what I now guess to be a haunting, and they started in the summer of the same year, with my first episode of sleep paralysis. I had known about the phenomenon before it happened to me, 
my mom was a sufferer of frequent night terrors and the occasional paralysis. I also had a friend with narcolepsy that told me about it at school. The first time it happened to me, I wasn't too unsettled. It was on a weekend, and I drifted off watching Netflix. The next thing I knew, I was wide awake, and a few episodes of the show had gone by. I reached for a bottle of water by my bed, but I found that I couldn't move at all. It was strange, and almost calm. I just kind of accepted what was happening, and I let it run its course. It eventually did. I got up, had a drink of water, went to the bathroom, and then went back to bed. A few days after the paralysis, things started moving around on their own. Another day spent home alone, I was once again playing video games and avoiding any responsibilities. As I had tried giving up soda that year, I almost always had a cup on my desk, filled either with orange juice or empty. There was rarely an in-between. This cup, however, just fell over in front of my eyes. There was no slant on the desk or anything like that. Nothing other than the cup was on it. It just tipped over, like someone had smacked it over. While I thought it was odd, I set it back upright and went on with my gaming. I had settled that it was some kind of trick of gravity, which in hindsight sounds way more ridiculous than a poltergeist. This was immediately followed by the sound of a bird hitting my window, my light bulb exploding overhead, and the cup once again tipping over. Unable to rationalize it this time, I scrambled out of my room and into the kitchen, where my stepdad was eating. As I said earlier, my mom asked me not to talk to him about anything paranormal, but I was pretty shook up by what I had just seen. He asked me if I was alright. I told him that a bird had flown into my window and kind of scared the crap out of me, to which he laughed. I didn't sleep very well that night. The last and most extreme incident I had at that house happened just about a week later, my second episode of a sleep paralysis. It was a Sunday morning and I could hear my family moving about the house to get ready. It didn't take me long to prepare myself, so I tended to sleep in an extra 15 minutes. As I fell back to sleep, a familiar feeling came over me. Unable to speak, I couldn't call for help. A weight on my chest made it difficult to breathe. I was incapable of moving. Thinking it would pass like last time, I just waited. It became evident very quickly that this was not going to be like last time. What little daylight there was coming in through the curtains turned blood red. Instead of the calm I had during the first episode, I grew very unsettled. It was dark now, and the room looked like one of those photo development rooms in terms of color. My door opened on its own. A figure stood there, just looked like a silhouette, all dark and shrouded. It wore what appeared to be a robe made of thick fur, and kept its hood drawn over. Even though my room was normally comfortable, I felt the temperature drop. I could see my own breath, and the breath of this figure. It just kept staring at me. Something about it felt evil like it was waiting to do something awful to me. I tried to yell and make it go away. I even attempted to invoke the name of Christ, but I couldn't speak or breathe enough to do so. The blood red changed to pitch black. The figure disappeared into it, but a pair of dark red eyes pierced through me from where it stood. I then saw two numbers sort of fly at me. 13, and three. That's when the paralysis ended, I got up, and I went to church. I've since lost my faith and I'm no longer religious. Just what I saw that morning is still a mystery to me. But I did follow up on those two numbers that same morning in church. Psalm chapter 13, verse 3, reads in the King James Version, quote, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Needless to say, I got chills, and I still do every time I tell the story.
This started a few years ago, and so far, there's been no explanation of the things that keep occurring. I live in the southern United States, near a national park, in a fairly rural area. So, our first guess was that this had to be some kind of wildlife, something that was just scaring us for no reason other than to get into our own heads. However, after a ton of internal explanations, we finally came to the conclusion that we had none. The first thing that occurred was fairly brief. It was shortly after the death of my uncle, who was fairly close to us before he passed. He was a veteran, and while in the army, he had volunteered to have shock treatments that altered his personality greatly. This had occurred during the Vietnam era, while he was stationed in Germany. My grandmother was in the bathroom, and I was in my room just playing a game, when out of the blue, the wall sounded as if somebody was beating on it, trying to get our attention. Three loud knocks, then nothing. We were worried that something had happened to our neighbor, an elderly woman, and she needed our help. But after we went outside to check, there was nobody there. Fast forward a few months and we started hearing footsteps on the roof. They started out light and easily explainable, something along the lines of a cat walking on the roof. We had seen it happening a few times, so we thought nothing of it, until the footsteps started to get a bit heavier. Eventually, it started to sound like something that weighed more than I did was sprinting across the roof every night from one end of the house to the other. Things got worse after that. We started to find dead animals around the property. While some of it could be explained as roadkill, we do have a lot of problems with people speeding due to a lack of police presence in the area. But there were a bunch of random things we would find dead nearby as well. We would find crows and ravens with broken necks lying in our backyard, the occasional snake, and at one point, we found a deer that literally walked onto our property and dropped dead. There was no visual wound anywhere on the deer's body when we found it. We started to hear things inside the house soon after, see things out of the corner of our eyes that would vanish before we could turn to get a good look, scratching mainly. We've put rat traps and every kind of poison we could think of in the walls, but there are no sign of any vermin. We would hear whispers at night, like somebody was trying to talk to us. We're rational people. We check to see if there were cracks in any of the windows or door frames that could make the wind blow in and sound strange. But from everything we've checked, there doesn't seem to be any opening that could make that noise. One of my old friends, who, before this story was as skeptical as I was, was sitting in my living room playing something on our PlayStation when he thought he saw somebody walk past the window. Not too scary, right? Well, my windows are nearly 10 feet off the ground. Our house is raised to allow water to pass under it to prevent any water damage. And the place he claims to have seen the man wasn't near any stairs. He came to visit another time about a month later. We were sitting and talking to one another when he said he had to use the bathroom and left to do his business. He goes, and when he comes back, he's pale white and terrified. When I asked him what was wrong, he was evasive, to say the least. So we got in the car and we drove down to Sonic to grab some food and talk. He told me that he saw somebody staring at him from my room as he was walking back, smiling at him with yellow eyes. He doesn't really come around anymore. At least he doesn't stay past nightfall. I don't know if what he claims is true or not, but it still scares me to think about just how scared he was. I've tried cleansing the house with sage. We have a crucifix in every room. Near the front door, we have three. We've even duct taped the back door shut and have it locked to be absolutely certain nothing can get in. But still, everything persists. Update. It's been nearly a year and the activity got much worse after I shared my story. At first I thought maybe I had angered whatever was in the house However, I think my experiences deserve at least some form of documentation. Whether you can believe it or not is up to you. First of all, I'd like to talk about a story that I originally didn't share. Obviously, everybody in this story will have aliases. One year prior to sharing my story the first time, my younger cousin had committed side following a manic episode. He had hanged himself saying that he wanted to see his grandfather 
who had passed away earlier that year. One year later, just two weeks before I shared my story, his older brother followed suit, just through a different method. Whether it was paranormal or just mental illness or depression, I don't know, but following some of the experiences that I've had over the past year, I think there could at least be some kind of connection. Then again, I'm not even sure if I'm sane at this point. The month following my first story was extremely active. I would feel sick and nauseous almost constantly, and sleep was a constant struggle. Even now, I find myself unable to go to sleep until morning, thanks to the anxiety and the feeling of being watched. Knocks on the walls are a daily occurrence. The smell of excrement has become a normal thing. I wake up with the sheets pulled off my bed so often that I actually had to buy clip-on straps and connect them to the bed so that they would stay on overnight. And it gets so cold that even in the middle of summer in central Alabama during a heat wave, I found myself having to use multiple blankets just to stay warm at night. These are the normal events that happen almost every day, but some nights it gets much worse. Thanksgiving of last year, I had a terrible nightmare that culminated in me waking in a cold sweat just before I smelled smoke in the room. One of the electrical outlets had caught fire. For those who have been in a fire, you'll likely know some of the things that occurred. The smoke inhalation caused me to cough for weeks. I was barely able to speak through my scratchy voice and ash had gotten into my PC, leading to it needing heavy repair, taking months to finally get fixed. I spent the next few weeks sleeping in a different room, more afraid of a fire breaking out than I was of a paranormal experience. Since I didn't sleep in my bedroom, I would sleep in the recliner in front of my TV, usually falling asleep to YouTube that I played through my PS4 or some kind of music to calm my nerves. Nightmares at this point were a regular thing, I didn't bear them any second thought, and although ironically they seemed to get a bit better outside of my bedroom, they still happened regularly. Some nights I would wake up to the heavy footsteps moving on the roof before finally falling back asleep. Some nights I would wake up to something violently shaking the chair I was sleeping in. Others I would wake up to see a shadow figure in the mirror placed behind my TV. Nothing could compare to the things that were going to happen once I moved back into my room, though. Shortly after moving back into my room, I remember having a nightmare and waking up to a figure standing near the foot of my bed, pointing down to the electrical socket that had caught fire previously. It was as if it was mocking me. The tall and thin figure was almost featureless, with its yellow eyes depicting almost a joy in them. I don't remember much from that afterward. I think I may have fainted due to the fear. The nightmares afterwards started telling me to do things, like an invasive thought that I would keep having dreams of walking to the cliff outside my house and jumping off of it, the feeling of falling before waking up in a panic, usually just after I would see that figure in the dream. Then it wasn't just in my dreams. I would start having these thoughts throughout the day, too. The same sort of invasive thought of going out to the cliff and jumping. I'd like to note that I am in no way suicidal. I've never had one of those thoughts in my life before. It's only been since these paranormal things have started to occur. I eventually started to get angry over really simple things. Small, inconsequential things started to infuriate me, which would always come back to, you should just jump and I started to question why. Once I really started to question those thoughts, the activity started to worsen. It got more violent. I'd feel pains like needles pricking into my legs at night. I'd hear growling around the house. At one point, I even woke up feeling as if somebody was sitting on me and choking me. The nightmares eventually became less about self-harm and more about violent acts being inflicted upon me usually by the figure that I previously described. Insects began to be a normal sight around the house. Flies, roaches, spiders. It seemed like we were getting invaded by anything and everything that I hated. The walls of my room at this point looked more like an insect graveyard than a paint job. Granted, I don't know if insects are connected in any way to the paranormal, 
but it never happened before. I just wanted to make sure I got all the details down. I've considered just documenting things, getting a spirit box and an EMF, just seeing what I can do with them. I'm afraid it'll just anger whatever's here, and that it will lash out and get somebody else hurt. If it were just me living here, I'd be fine with it, but I don't want to risk it hurting my grandmother. She's had experiences too, but according to her, if she just ignores it, then there's nothing to worry about. Once, she told me about a shadow figure that she saw when she woke up. She told it, you aren't real, and just went back to sleep. I don't know how she can do that. Maybe it's morbid curiosity, but I can't just deny the things I've been seeing and experiencing. Anyway, I just had to talk about it to someone. I'm afraid if I talk to anybody else about this in real life, they'll just think I'm crazy. At times, I think I'm crazy. But this stuff has been happening, and I have no idea why. Ever since I was 13, in 2008, I have developed an interest in aliens and UFOs. I have grown enough of an interest to actually create a scrapbook of pictures of UFOs, declassified government documents, newspaper clippings, and things like that. All of these things were available from Google. I even recorded my own UFO sightings here and there, but I eventually threw them out because I was worried that I was sticking my nose where it didn't belong. In any case, this is one of my UFO experiences. It was somewhere between 2009 and 2011. I was around 14 to 16. It was around 8 or 9 p.m., and I was looking into the sky to see if I might get lucky and find a UFO. I noticed a large triangular-shaped silhouette facing west into my backyard. It was huge, and it had a red light at the center. Parts of the craft warped into a boomerang shape. One part was invisible at times, and the other part wasn't. It was as if it had some invisible shield that was on and then off. It was able to change its shape from a boomerang and then into a triangle and then just disappear. In the past, I've had other UFO experiences, but this one was the most convincing one of my whole life. Does anyone else have any UFO experiences? If you do, I'd love to hear them. I saw a UFO. And I just want to know if there's some kind of explanation for what I saw. I didn't have my phone with me, so I don't have any evidence. But I did see a UFO. At first I thought it was a glare, but the moon was behind me and I was seeing Orion's belt and some other stars in front of me. The first one I saw was on the left. Then I realized it was moving in one direction, so it couldn't be a glare. It was going northward. I also don't think that it was a plane because of the lockdown. Planes weren't really allowed to fly, and if they were, it was really limited. I definitely know what a plane looks and sounds like, and this was not it. The thing that I saw was just silently cruising in the sky. Seconds later, I saw one to the right. I saw small dots emitting light. It was as small as what stars look like at night, but they weren't twinkling, and the lighted dots were aligned in a constant position. I also saw that it changed its angle a bit after I saw the lighted dots. I asked myself if they could have been birds, migrating or passing by, because sometimes flocks of birds fly in a V-shape, but that doesn't explain the glow. I'm not sure how high it was exactly in the sky, but it was definitely in the zone where a plane might fly, but it was way too big to be a plane. It was cruising for a good few seconds until it literally just vanished. Would there be any other explanation? Is that what a stealth bomber looks like at night? 
It was definitely a UFO because it was an object flying in the sky and I didn't know what it was. So it was an unidentified flying object. I just want to know if it was alien or not. I wanted to share a few UFO encounters that I've had. The first was when I was about 11. I was riding home with my dad in the car. I looked out the window and saw a ship. It was shaped more like a small city, black with multiple spires. I told my dad and he saw it as well and gunned it home. The odd part was his reaction, which is connected to the next encounter. I asked about the ship and he went ape shit, started screaming about nothing being there and that we never saw anything, even though he described it when I pointed it out. Fast forward to about four years ago, which makes me around 34 years old at the time. I was at work at the hotel and the housekeeper calls me over. It's Veterans Day, so I figure she wants me to check out the parade. Instead, she points out a white sphere in the sky. We stare at it, and it moves at an insane speed, then splits into six smaller spheres. I tell her, congratulations on your first UFO sighting. It keeps moving around the parade, and I tell her not to worry. It's probably just observing. The thing is, when I asked her later if any more weird stuff came out, I got the same reaction. Total freak out screaming about not seeing anything and it not being real. It was like the mind couldn't handle the situation and completely melted down. This final one is a bit more interesting. I had let my dogs out at night for a potty break, then a head count as they came back inside. Before I went in, I noticed a star bigger than the others. Not being a runner, I stayed put. It got closer and I got a better look. It was a four pointed star with mini points about the size of a pressure cooker, all pulsating different colors. I decided to try some telepathy. I mean, I didn't do anything fancy like cross my legs and say om. I just thought in my head, like you do when you have a grocery list. I asked it if it meant any harm. Give me red for no and green for yes. I got a red for no. I asked if it came from the stars. It turned green. I asked if it was just here for recon. Again, green. Finally, I thought, okay, you can be on your way. And it flew higher and farther. My point on the last one is to try to stay calm. It might scare you, but it's the best way to remember what you saw. I didn't get any missing time or the usual stuff like strange markings. It was just an odd encounter. So I'm currently 16 and this happened when I was three. I'm from New Zealand. We have this RNZAF Air Force base called Ohakia. Apparently, a lot of really mysterious things happen around Air Force bases, so I'm not sure if this is common or what. But it may be 2.30 in the morning. My dad and mom and I are in the car driving back from Wellington. I have family there. And we're maybe 10 seconds past the base of this tree. Well, it's a tree-like thing those big tall bush tree things that farms use for privacy. All of a sudden, there's a light slowly moving along the tree line. My dad thought it could have been a farmer out trimming hedges, but my mom says, not at nearly three in the morning. So we pull off to this rest area and watch this light. It's completely stopped moving and it's just spinning when another light joins it and spins in a counterclockwise triangle. Maybe two minutes later, another comes from literally thin air and joins the triangle, now having three points, and they just spin and spin and spin. 
Then they stop. Then they start again. After about five minutes, which seems like 10 years, they stop again and stay still for maybe five seconds. Then one flies straight up into the sky and disappears at warp speed. The other two lights just keep spinning when another flies off to the right and disappears. So now it's back to just one light spinning, starts to move along the tree line again, and then it just flies off to the left and disappears also, never to be seen again. All this started and ended within 15 minutes. After that, we just drove back, but we're all looking around, amazed and terrified. To this day, we've never seen anything else like it. It started on my commute home from work. I got about halfway through the 20 minute walk and at roughly 10.10, I saw these two flying objects that were blinking red and white. I didn't think much of it being as I live near an airport. That is, until I saw them fly toward each other, hover for a moment, and then depart in opposite directions. It's something that I've never seen drones or planes do before, and it got me really suspicious. I began following one of them, and it kept variating between moving very quickly, slowing down, and hovering in midair. I kept on the trail of that one up until I saw two more on the opposite end of the horizon. I began chasing them down, one by one, trying to get videos and keeping notes on what I'd seen. The main thing that spooked me, aside from the weird movements, was the oblong shape of them. They were just far enough visually that I could only really see the shape through the horizontal row of blinking lights, of which there were three on each flying object. Each one would blink the same pattern, the red lights flashing one after another, and then a white flash at the end, occurring uniformly every few seconds. I only saw them do bizarre movements a handful of times, otherwise I was just chasing them as they sped by. There were at least five of them throughout my entire voyage, all around the town. I would truly love to believe that they were just regular aircraft, but every single thing about them was weird. I took a couple of videos, but they didn't really come out. My camera can't shoot that well in the dark. If anybody can point me in the direction of what these things might be, or what the light patterns might mean, or really anything at all, let me know. It's been haunting me all night. One night, my sister's friend, who we'll just call Sally, was still at our house after my sister had fallen asleep at about 10 p.m. She asked me if I would walk her halfway home, and I said yes. It was just down a hill, and then you just walked one street, and then there was like a cut to over to her street from there. But mind you, it's the middle of December, and it's really cold. So we walked to the stop sign, and we were both like, nope, and turned around, because it was freezing cold. We could easily beg my aunt to give her a ride, because it wasn't that far. So as we're walking back, we stopped at my next door neighbor's house, which isn't actually occupied. It's completely rusted out. It's actually owned by a sheriff that comes by like once a week to work on it. It's been like that for about the last three years but my old neighbor lived there for about 20 years before he finally sold it to the sheriff for like $5,000. Anyway, we stopped at the house because we kept hearing weird noises from the side of the house. It almost sounded like cats, so we started calling them. Then they started hissing in a weird way. And then we saw their legs. They were long and skinny and super pale. I don't know what it was, but we just ran to my house and we told my cousin's dad to go look. And he didn't, of course. Maybe it was just a weird cat. 
but those legs were so abnormal. I've never seen anything like it. And their sound changed when we became aware of it and started calling it. It was like as soon as whatever those things were knew that we knew they were there, their whole demeanor just changed. It was so weird. Some of my friends and I ventured into an old abandoned hospital that's pretty securely boarded up. We climbed through a broken window that was maybe eight inches at most. It was nighttime and most of the large hospital campus is abandoned, with welded doors and boarded windows. And though people had obviously gotten in before us, there was much less graffiti and damage than we're used to seeing in these places. The campus has several buildings and we were clueless as to which one we were in, until we found a morgue in the basement and medical equipment strewn about. We didn't hear anything or see anything out of the ordinary, except for the light in the attic. The building had no power, yet we could see from the top floor that a light was on above us. We couldn't get into the attic as the only staircase up there had a chained and bolted door. It was a little odd, but I'm not sure if it was paranormal. I suppose it could have been a solar-powered light, but why? Would the bulb ever go out? It didn't scare us off, we did continue wandering around for a while, and like I said, nothing crazy happened. But it's still very strange to me that there was a light on in a powerless attic. My parents own a sprawling three-story manor built in 1912. This house has a finished bedroom in the attic, which is mildly weird on its own. But when I turned 14 and was going into high school, I begged them to empty the junk out and let me live there. I thought it would be totally awesome, like having an apartment away from the rest of my family. They agreed I could do it and I got to paint it, and put in new carpet and fill it with the furniture that I picked out. All vintage, because that's what I like. The place was awesome, but the door didn't quite fit into the jam anymore, so it would swing open on its own. I was not cool with having the door open to the rest of the attic in the middle of the night. I shut the door as tightly as it would go, and before bed, I jammed it shut with my desk chair. I mean, I really wedged it in there. I had my sister test, and the door would not budge from the attic side. Cool. I went to sleep. The next morning I woke up feeling refreshed, until I noticed that the desk chair was tucked back under the desk, the door was shoved all the way open, so hard that it had actually dented the wall, and I had no explanation. To this day, all present family members swear they didn't do it and I think I would have had to have heard them anyhow. I decided the ghosts in the attic didn't like me shutting them out. For the duration of my time living in the attic, several years, I left the door open, and nothing else really happened, so I guess all they wanted was some freedom. Still, definitely freaked me out. I live alone, unless you want to include my cat, and then I live with a cat. I have a house with an attic conversion, but since it's just me, it's basically an empty room. I think the previous tenant had used it as a bedroom. Obviously, when I first moved in, I did go up there just to have a snoop around. There are two light switches for the room, one at the bottom of the stairs, and one that is a long string that you pull which is right in the middle of the room. There's a door at the top of the stairs that I always keep shut. I close every door behind me. An open door really bugs me. 
After living in this house for about three months, I noticed that the door was open and the light was on. I could see the light on the wall opposite the door. No big deal. I obviously forgot to shut the door and turn off the light, so I go and do that. About two weeks on, I arrive home from work. It's early January and it's dark out. I can see the window to the room from outside, and I can see that the light is on. My first thought is, ugh, I've been robbed. I barge into my home, quickly sweep the first two floors expecting to find someone, but there's no one there. Ah, oh, they must still be up there, I thought. So I fly up the stairs, and the door is shut, but the light is still on. I swing the door open, and nothing. I will say that I'm very skeptical about stories when I hear feeling of dread or felt I was being watched, but I had both of those. I had this horrific feeling that I really wasn't alone up there, but it's a simple empty box of a room. I try my best to shrug it off, I turn the light off and I shut the door. I've been living there nearly seven months now, and since that day, I get the same feeling when I walk past the stairs to the attic. Day or night, the light is on at least twice a week, but now, it switches itself off after a while. Recently, I've started hearing very loud bumps coming from the attic, which is right above my bedroom. The first time I heard it, I naturally assumed that somebody was trying to get in through the attic window, so I ran up there, but nothing. Lastly, my cat, who is very tiny and during the night stays downstairs, refuses to go up there, and has actually done the whole arched back hissing thing at the door. It could be because he's just out of sorts, but given the situation, and the fact that he never hisses at anything ever, it really freaks me out. This is the first time I think I've encountered something related to the paranormal. If anybody can help me understand what this might have been, please tell me. Before I start my unexplained encounter, I would like to say that I live in a duplex with my roommate and friend who goes to college with me. The duplex isn't that big, and neither is the attic. It's small enough to where an average sized person would have trouble even crawling through it. I also have one camera on the front window and one on the back. So on January 24th, I had suddenly been awoken at about 4.30 in the morning. I checked my phone. I usually wake up about 7 or 8 a.m. so I can get to work on time. At first, I didn't really understand why I was awake, so I decided to just try and fall asleep again. But after a few seconds, I heard what sounded like very loud footsteps walking above me. I was too afraid to get out of bed, so I just laid there. My first thought was that it must have been an illusion, but now I know this isn't true. When I suddenly woke up a few hours later, I went out to eat breakfast with my roommate. We asked how each other's sleep was and I decided to bring up the fact that I had heard something at about 4.30. He responded by saying he had heard something at exactly 4.34 in the morning. At this point, we were a little bit freaked out, so we decided to open the hatch into the attic. Like I said before, there was really no way anybody could fit up there because it's just too small. We decided to look at the camera footage, but there were no signs of any motion or anything out of the ordinary, other than just leaves blowing around. Our only thought was that somebody had come from one of the sides of the house and climbed onto the roof for some reason. I asked my neighbors if they had seen anything, and they said no, so that kind of eliminated one side. But I also knew that it wasn't the other side, due to the fact that we sleep on that side and would most likely wake up easily if there was a disturbance. Now we're stuck, believing that it's something paranormal. Since then, we haven't heard a noise, but it's only been a few days as I'm writing the story. And before anybody says anything, it is not an animal. We know what those sound like. These are footsteps. But like I said, 
It's pretty much impossible that somebody with footsteps, physical anyway, could be walking around up there. Anyway, if you have any ideas as to what it might be, let me know. I've had many paranormal experiences growing up, all very different. On this night, I saw something that I never thought I could see with my own eyes. I slept over at a friend's house one night, and that night, as I was laying on the floor next to her bed, my head was by her feet, facing the stairs leading down to the second floor. I closed my eyes. I could feel somebody staring at me. Their presence was dark, and something told me to open my eyes. There he stood, at the top of the attic stairs. I couldn't see his face or his body, just the outline of him. A completely dark shadow of a man. He stood over us, staring a hole through my soul, and I, completely unaware of how unreal he was, couldn't move or blink. I could only stare back. It wasn't until what seemed like minutes had passed that I was finally able to close my eyes again, and somehow I fell asleep. The next morning, I had asked my friend if her siblings had one of their guy friends over, being that one of her sister's rooms was next to hers in the attic. She said no, that nobody but us had been in the attic that night. I was confused. I told her about the man I had seen, and she turned pale white. She goes on to say how she felt like somebody was holding her down, she couldn't move or breathe. Later on that day, her older sister, who we evidently told the story to, had told us about the man who had lived and died in that house years before their mother bought it. A man in his early thirties had committed a murder of his children, three daughters, and then himself. Since then, he has haunted the house and would bother the females in the house. All she knew about that man was just that, what he had done. Nobody knows why he would do all those things, but what I saw was very real, and I'll never forget it. This all happened when I was a kid. I was spending the weekend at my mom's house, my parents were separated, and I woke up one morning and watched some cartoons in her room while she slept. Eventually, I turned the TV off and went downstairs to make a bowl of cereal. I sat down at the table, which was about 10 feet from the open basement door. As I was eating, I heard my mom call me very loudly from the basement. The only things down there were a washing and drying machine and a toilet. I walked over to the door and peeked down there, and it was pitch black. That's when I remembered that my mom was asleep upstairs and hadn't come past me at all. So I freaked out, ran upstairs to her room, and sure enough, she was there asleep. There was no way that it could have been her, and it was just us in the house. The apartment gave me off, strange, and creepy vibes. My mom and I and a few other people all hated the feeling that you would get in the basement and the back room upstairs would give off very negative energy. Every time you went in there, you would start feeling kind of sad and very alert. She never used that room. It only had a couple of boxes in it for the five or so years that she lived there. Has anyone else had similar experiences? My brother and I were staying the night at our grandma's house. For context, her house is in the middle of the ghetto my brother and I were watching TV, and my grandma was at the store. Suddenly, my brother says, want to go in the basement? 
Not trying to sound like I was weak, I said yes. Now, this was the worst decision of the month. So we go into the basement and it is really creepy. When we reach the bottom of the staircase, the door shuts behind us. I just shake it off as natural, but still a little uneasy. We go into the garage because her garage is in the basement. So we start going through there and we find a rusty pipe and a motorcycle handlebar and some faint writing on the wall. Obviously there were other things like lawnmowers and stuff like that. All of a sudden we hear bam, like a metal door slamming. It was the laundry room door. So my brother and I are crabbing our pants. So we run back upstairs, scared out of our minds. Later that night, we start to fall asleep. Grandma's asleep. And then we hear what sounds like all of the basement doors opening and slamming. My grandma's not awake and we end up falling asleep. We tell grandma about it the next day and she just laughs and says, oh, that's just Jim messing with you. Then she explains that Jim was the old house owner who died there. That didn't really help us, but I guess it eased our minds a little bit. I have this problem since I've moved in to where I currently live. It's a rather basic problem. The lights in the basement go out at night. At first, I thought it was just the light bulb itself, so naturally, I changed it. Yet, whenever I wanted to grab something from the basement and it happened to be around 1 to 5 a.m., the light just wouldn't go on. I changed the bulb several times and it did nothing. The strangest thing is that I can literally have it turned on all evening and it's fine. Then I watch it go dark at night. It annoyed me to the point where I recently called an electrician to check if everything was all right with the wiring. Maybe it's some sort of automatic switch that turns it off during the night, right? Long story short, I paid quite some money for him to check everything and he found nothing. I can't blame him since everything works perfectly fine during the day. The next thing I did was set up different lights inside of the room, a light with a battery. At this point, I got a little freaked out since it turned off as well. I carried it back upstairs and after a minute or so, it worked perfectly fine again. I carried it back downstairs and after a few seconds, it went out. I'm not exactly on the edge because my house isn't really haunted. I don't have bad dreams, no poltergeist activity or anything. It's literally just this strange light situation. As you can probably tell, I'm quite the skeptic. But could this actually be something paranormal? Could it be something natural? Magnetic fields or something? I'm not experienced with these kinds of things. Maybe there are other things I could try. I just think it's really weird that the lights in the basement, all of them, go out at night. This story happened a long time ago but I still remember it like it was yesterday, and so does my cousin. Our families were very close growing up. We were there often, usually just watching movies. We were young, and this was around the time that the killer clown thing was happening. So when we would watch movies, they would usually be horror, The Conjuring, Annabelle, etc. I was about 12 at the time. My cousin was 14, her brother was 12 and my brother was eight. We were in their basement one night while our parents and older siblings went out for the night. Babysitters weren't something we had. It was lock the doors, stay together and don't answer the phone. My cousin's basement had a TV in the corner of the room and on the same wall was a projector. 
My cousin, 12 year old boy, and my brother had the hockey game playing on TV and Call of Duty on the projector, while my cousin and I, she was a 14 year old girl, were sitting shoulder to shoulder on the couch, back to the wall with our headphones in, watching videos on our phones. Our brothers decided they were hungry and turned on the lights as they went upstairs to find something to eat. My cousin and I sat for about five minutes before her brother's bedroom door in the basement slowly closed. When the door came to a full close, the lights in the room turned off, along with the projector and the TV. I paused the video that I was watching on YouTube and first assumed that it was a power outage as I didn't believe in ghosts. But when I checked my battery, I saw that my iPod was still charging. Before I could do anything, I heard the sound of my brother and cousin laughing, almost giggling behind my head as if they were right behind my ear. But it sounded off. It didn't sound exactly like them. It creeped me out and my head shot up and toward my cousin, who was already looking at me with her eyes wide. Like I said, we were backed up to a wall, so there's no way anybody could have been behind us. Neither of us missed a second to get up and run upstairs. The first thing we did when we got up there was to look at each other. I said, you heard it too? She agreed, explaining to me what she had heard, which was exactly what I had also heard. We walked toward the kitchen and saw her brother. We explained to him what had happened. He didn't believe us and told us that my brother had been on the third floor bathroom ever since they left and they didn't talk or laugh. This creeped out my cousin and I even more. And when he went downstairs, everything was turned back on and the bedroom door was open. We talk about that night every few years and it still creeps us out to this day. I'm not sure if I'm haunted or something, but I do have a lot of ghost stories that started happening after that night. Kids that I babysit keep telling me that they see things around me, or similar things from that night will happen to me in my basement, with or without other people there. Whenever I tell people about these events, they seem to have something happen to them afterwards and stories come back to me. Usually the ones who joked about what happened or didn't believe in it had an encounter. I think something followed me out of her basement that day, but I don't know if it's evil, if that's possible. I still can't really explain it. It's just odd. About three months ago, I went backpacking in the Allegheny National Forest, and I heard drumming. At this point, I'm chalking that experience up to actual people banging on drums, but it was still strange. This weekend, we returned to the same trail system, Minister Creek. We set up camp at a different site, about three miles north of where we had stayed the last time. The evening was uneventful, and we went to bed in individual tents at about 9.30. About 2.30 in the morning, we were woken up by a huge boom. It was not a gunshot. It sounded more like a black powder cannon going off. It echoed throughout the valley. We came out of our tents and discussed what we had all heard, a little on edge since it was so close to us, but eventually tried going back to sleep. Now the boom really has nothing to do with what happened later, but it was just a weird night from the beginning. As I'm laying in my tent, unable to sleep, staring at the ceiling, I kept seeing shadows on the tent walls. I could swear that I saw a silhouette of a person walking toward the tent, but as soon as I would look, it would disappear as quickly as I noticed it. I decide I'm just seeing things, and I closed my eyes. And eventually, I fell asleep. The next thing I know, I'm being woken up by a young-sounding female voice saying, Dad, dad, dad. I jolt awake, unsure that I've actually heard this. So I'm just laying there, checking my watch, which says 5.13 AM. 
I'm wide awake at this time, and about 30 seconds later, right next to my tent, I hear very urgently, Dad? Dad? There was something off about the voice, too. It was just creepy. I got major chills, like nothing I've ever experienced. Now, A, my daughter didn't come with us, and B, there wasn't a single female in our small group. It's pitch black out. I see no flashlights, no more light from the fire. I'm trying to rationalize what I'm hearing, and I sit up in my tent, thinking maybe a camper from another site wandered into our site thinking she was at her dad's tent. Maybe I should help. I unzip my tent, shine my flashlight out, and I catch a glimpse of a black bear walking off into the woods. I uncontrollably at this point let out a huge, oh, F, waking up the rest of my group. The bear didn't care though and just walked off into the darkness. So of course we're searching around with our flashlights and there's nobody else around us. Clearly we don't think the bear said it, but this whole experience was just nuts. I mean, what did I hear? Maybe black bears do make noises that sound like a girl calling for her dad. Or maybe it was a ghost warning me that there was a bear. A guardian angel? Or maybe I had some kind of auditory hallucination. Either way, both of my experiences overnight backpacking in the Allegheny National Forest have been pretty weird. This is a real experience that happened to me when I was around 10, camping with my family at a provincial park in Newfoundland, Canada in the mid-1980s. In Newfoundland, there's a lot of traditional folklore about fairies and being fairy-led. It's sort of like being mesmerized and stolen away by the fairies, and although I've never really believed in that stuff, whenever I hear those tales, I can't help but think about this experience. We arrived at the campground in mid-afternoon. I remember that it was strangely empty. We saw no other occupied sites as we drove around, looking for the perfect spot. We picked our site, and as my parents were setting up, my older sister asked if she and I could go check out the little beach area, which was a shortish walk along a clearly marked downhill path through some birch woods. Our mom said yes, but told us to be back in two hours. We found the sign pointing us to the beach trail and headed down the path. Almost as soon as we were out of sight of the campground, things started to feel off. It was weirdly quiet, with a sort of muffled feeling. No birds calling, no breeze, just a thick, velvety silence. I also noticed that there were strange-looking ferns growing thickly along the path all around us. Ferns are not an unusual sight in the Newfoundland woods, but these were different from the ones I'd seen before. Bright, almost luminous green, and very, very large. Some were as tall as I was. I couldn't shake the feeling that there were people, or animals hiding in them, watching us pass by. Although it had been a lovely, clear day, the weather started to change as we walked. A low-lying fog rolled in as we descended first in tendrils close to the ground, then gradually rising around us as we went lower toward the water. Even living in Newfoundland, I had never walked into a fog like that before, and it did nothing to relieve the eerie feeling that I was trying to ignore. Finally, we arrived at a steep set of wooden stairs, and following them, we emerged onto a small, foggy beach. With the woods behind and above us, it felt very closed in and I started wishing that we were safely back with our parents at our campsite. My sister made a small noise beside me, and I turned to see what had caught her attention. Although I thought we were alone, I now noticed that there was a man several meters away, standing very still and gazing silently out over the water. My sister called out a friendly hello. It was Newfoundland in the 80s. People did that sort of thing but he didn't move or appear to hear her. After a minute or two, I started to feel nervous, so I talked my sister into heading back to our campsite. 
This is where things get a bit fuzzy. I don't remember leaving the beach, but the next thing I knew, we were on a wide, unfamiliar dirt road. It seemed like no time had passed, but I was tired and my legs and feet felt like I'd been walking for a long time. The sun was also pretty low in the sky, which was strange because I thought we'd been gone for less than an hour. I felt disoriented and I had no idea where we were, and I started to panic a bit, thinking that we were lost. My sister immediately went into protective older sibling mode, saying not to worry because she was pretty sure that she knew the way back. We headed off down the road in the direction she suggested and walked for about 45 minutes or so until we finally emerged at the campground, not far from our campsite. It was now almost completely dark and we ran to our trailer to find our dad there, worriedly asking where we had been. Although we thought we'd been gone for under two hours, my dad said we'd been gone for more than five. He said that our mom had headed to the beach to look for us while he had stayed to wait for us at the campsite. By now, full-on darkness was setting in, and our dad was worried that our mom hadn't returned with us. As he prepared to go out looking for her, she burst through the door, frantically saying that she'd run up and down the trail multiple times and still hadn't found us. She was amazed when she saw us. The only way to access that beach, aside from cutting through steep, thick woods, was to take that trail, and we had not passed her. Once we'd all calmed down, we ate dinner and headed to bed. As I lay in my bunk, I remember hearing my mom quietly tell my dad how creepy and strange the trail had felt. Although we'd planned to stay longer, we packed up and left quickly the following morning, and we never returned to that campground. I always wanted to try the car life thing after watching so many YouTubers who live in their vans and travel around the country. I lived in Fort Lauderdale for five years, and I thought that I would be stuck there and that was it. Then the pandemic hit, and when I checked my bank account, I was back paid thousands of dollars. Before I knew it, I was packing up all my stuff, and the landlord said I could leave all my furniture and that was fine. Now I'm on the 95 heading north, laughing, actually leaving. I couldn't believe it. I managed to get a hang of the whole car life thing, and I became more comfortable stealth parking in different places and not being detected. I hadn't done any off-grid stuff yet, but I was more comfortable by the time I reached Lake Tahoe. I was hiking, and I asked some guy with his dog if he knew where I could sleep in my car, because Tahoe seemed a little tricky. He said there was a place up in the mountains called Hope Valley. It sounded good, so off I went. Lake Tahoe is already very high in altitude, so this was a few thousand feet higher than that. It was this past July. As I reached the area, I saw a small parking lot that was an entrance to a wildlife nature preserve. It was closed and empty, so that would do. I'm all settled in with my blanket and the sun is setting and the temperature plummets. Before I know it, it's pitch black and visibility is zero. I start to hear wolves howling, and at this point, I'm game. This was the experience I wanted. It was a little creepy, but I was fine. I was living what I would normally be watching on YouTube in my apartment. Before the sun went down, I noticed that there were garbage cans that were overfilled, about 15 feet from the car, at the entrance to the preserve. I finally drifted off to sleep, and I was awakened by something at 3 a.m., I couldn't see anything, anywhere, it was so dark. And then I heard heavy footsteps right outside my door. At this point, I am really freaked out. Then something brushes up against the car. I'm scared and I'm not really sure what to do. I wait for a couple of minutes. Then I open the door, run around the car as fast as I could and got in the driver's seat. 
I drove down the mountain and slept at a Motel 6 parking lot like a baby. I never made it through my first and only off-grid car camping adventure. And I won't forget it. The only other time that trip that something creepy happened was in Mount Shasta. I drove halfway up the mountain, parked on the side of the road, and got out and started walking to this trail. I made it about 70 yards, and I heard a low growl. I've never run so hard back to my car in my life. The rest of the trip was just the best hiking I've ever had in Montana. Still, I'll never forget the sound of those footsteps. First of all, I don't know if this will be scary to you, but it was for me when it happened, and I still get a little frightened when I remember. I can assure you that this story is 100% true. My story starts when I was 15 years old in 2012. Three of my very best friends and I decided to go camping. Luke, who was 17, Lewis, who was 16, and Gary, who was 15. Since our dads all worked in the military, we had access to some woods that weren't very far away from our homes, three miles at most. Of course, we weren't trained on anything, but since I lived some time in the middle of the Amazon forest, I had confidence that I could handle a not very far from my house night. It was July, which is winter here in Brazil, and it was really cold, like five degrees Celsius kind of cold, and things were pretty much going as well as you would expect from a camp in the woods. We pretty much sat there and chatted until about one in the morning. Then we decided to take shifts in duos to watch out for any animals that could be near us. We were afraid of jaguars, but probably the most that could get near us would be some capybaras that are pretty common in the region. At around 4 a.m., Gary, my duo, was outside the tent calling for me to stay up with him. But as it was so cold, I wanted to stay inside saying that no animal would go near us with the noise we were making. After like five minutes of back and forth between us, we noticed that we couldn't hear any kind of forest noise. No crickets, owls, twigs breaking from passing animals, nothing. And a feeling of uneasiness began to grow between us. Now I know this whole thing of no forest noise and yada yada sounds a little bit cliche, but I swear that this is real. When something weird is about to happen, everything goes quiet. With this feeling that appeared, we stopped arguing and we started to pay attention for what was happening around us. We didn't want to wake up Luke and Lewis because we thought we were just being silly and nothing would happen. Then, from the middle of the woods, we hear a scream. It sounded like a woman screaming, but at the same time, it didn't. The scream sounded human, but something was off. It had a kind of animalistic tone to it. It's really hard to explain. I've searched all over the internet and I can't find any creature that sounded like that. I firmly believe it was not a human screaming. Besides, what would a woman be doing in the woods, alone at night, screaming? With the sound, Luke and Lewis woke up, a little disoriented, while Gary and I jumped out of the tent and grabbed some sticks. That was the only thing we could find that would serve as a weapon. Needless to say, we didn't sleep the rest of the night, and we not so patiently awaited the morning. After what seemed to be hours, but was probably no more than five minutes, the forest resumed its regular noises, and we calmed down a little bit. When the sun rose, we packed our things as fast as we could, and left. When we were getting outside the forest, we told the military that was guarding the woods what we heard but I'm not really sure if they believed some random teenagers. I'm still friends with those guys that camped with me, and every time I see them, I ask them if they remember this, and they all said that they do, and none of us can imagine what could have been screaming that night. We'll never know if we were in any real danger or not. I'm just glad that we got out of it alive.
I'm going to preface this story by saying that paranormal experiences are not abnormal to me. I have seen ghosts many times over my life, and my mom claims to have seen me playing with them as a child. My mom was a psychic medium, so I spent a good deal of my childhood around this stuff. But those are experiences for another time. This is just a little context to assure you that I have had experiences with the paranormal before, and that what I experienced this time I consider to be abnormal, generally, as most of my experiences up until now have been positive or at least neutral. This was a few years ago, in my very early 20s. I hadn't had any paranormal experiences since a little while after my mom died when I was a teenager. I was starting to think that the things I had experienced didn't happen at all. General denial. One night, on a whim while driving around a suburb near my house, I managed to convince my boyfriend to come with me to the local cemetery. I was going through a bit of an edgy phase and thought going to a cemetery at night would be cool. This is a cemetery in a big city, and it's extremely large. I didn't believe in ghosts hanging around in a cemetery, so I thought it would be fine. I believed that ghosts usually hung out around the places that they died, or places where they had unfinished business, and that it was very unlikely that they would be hanging around a graveyard. It was some time in October, but not Halloween. We got to the cemetery at about 11.30 p.m. and messed around in the car for a bit before getting out sometime around 12 a.m. We had our phones with us and were using them as torches. We hopped the fence to the cemetery and started to look at all the graves, pointing out the most interesting ones and just kind of messing around. The place was completely deserted, as cemeteries tend to be at midnight. We walked farther and farther in and entered a part of the cemetery where the graves were quite a bit larger and much older. By now, it had likely been around a half an hour. As we were walking down the path, my boyfriend commented that there was a strange smell lingering around, which was extremely weird because my boyfriend can't smell at all. He lost his sense of smell due to a bunch of infections and other problems with his ears and sinuses as a child. I don't know all the details, but regardless, he can never smell anything. I couldn't smell anything, and I have an above-normal sense of smell, so we both shrugged off the experience. I was looking at one of the graves some time later, when my boyfriend shook my shoulder and pointed at one of the largest graves a few meters into the distance. I'm terrible at knowing what people are pointing at, but this time, I spotted it right away. It was a little girl, I would guess around 11 or 12 years old. She had very dark brown or black hair that looked well cared for and quite long. She was sitting on top of the grave with her legs dangling over the edge. At first I saw her wearing a lacy white dress, like a nightgown that a rich girl would wear. It looked old, but I'm no expert, so I couldn't tell you how old. Maybe early 1900s? But I looked away to look at my boyfriend, and when I looked back, she was wearing a different dress. All I remember is that it was red, because at this point I was super scared. Something about the whole situation just felt wrong to me. I felt extremely fearful. And due to the fact that ghosts were very normal for me, this was extremely unusual. I had never felt unsafe seeing a ghost before. It was around this time that I noticed that the cemetery was eerily quiet. No sounds of bats, and there are lots of fruit bats in the area. No other animals. The air itself felt stale and stagnant. We just stood and stared at the little girl for what felt like an eternity, strangely transfixed. And then, we both ran for it up the path at full speed. I turned for a second to see if she was still there, but she was gone completely, and that made me run faster, honestly. The whole run out, we were both dead silent. When we were back at the car, we sat there for ages trying to work out what we had just experienced and seen, trying to rationalize it. But as we've both had paranormal experiences before, we knew it had to be a ghost. 
For a few months afterward, I continuously felt like I was being watched. I had frequent nightmares about seeing the little girl in our apartment. I always felt uneasy. We eventually moved around 30 minutes away, and the feelings and dreams stopped. I have since tried to research the ghost, but haven't turned anything up. Though there is a local ghost tour at that cemetery. Maybe the guide might know something. Ever since then, my paranormal experiences have been more frequent, and have been getting more unsettling and disturbing. My boyfriend has been experiencing more things too. I'm not really sure what happened there, but nothing's quite been the same since. One day, I decided to go to an old cemetery in San Diego, California, in a town called Julian. This town was home to gold miners and citizens that built the town. The average year on the tombstone was 17 to 1800s, some ranging into 2000 to 2008. We went out there around the time of 12 p.m., just going around asking basic questions of anything that might be there. I stumbled on a gated burial dating 1825. I asked if he was there while someone was taking a video and pictures. All of a sudden, I got so tired and drained that I felt like we had to go. I felt like I was being attacked. When we got to the car, we reviewed the photos first. What I saw was disturbing. White, blue, and green lights flying all around me. Listening to the audio was even scarier. I heard an old man with a deep crackly voice laughing and saying Marissa, and then I heard growling noises. I asked to leave immediately after hearing this. We were driving away and about a half mile to a mile out, our car started doing really frightening stuff. The radio would turn on and off, headlights would stop working, our mirrors kept moving dramatically. The lights in the car were turning on and off. We pulled over, we were so scared. Eventually it stopped and we drove off, scared and confused as to what had just happened. When we arrived home, we could hear voices and banging in the house. We didn't sleep at all that night. I never did return, and until this day, eight years later, I can still hear that voice, and I hate driving by that cemetery. When I was about 13, I was staying with a friend in the Colorado Rockies, the foothills, in January. While we were at his buddy's house, I walked to get food from a nearby gas station. On a small, windy country road, a car took a turn too fast, skidded on the ice, and rolled over in my direction. I was lucky that there were woods right to the side, and the dense trees saved me from the vehicle. As I ran away, I looked back, and I could only see his arm dangling limply out of the broken driver's side window. I was scared, and I still get shivers about it today. I think the person ended up dying just minutes later from the injuries. But for three days after that, I had strange dreams. They were very short, just small details. The feeling of grass, the moon, and a name. I only remember the last name now, Alton. On the fourth night, I had gone to bed early in an effort to get some sleep. I ended up drifting off at about 10 p.m. according to my friend's family. I heard a noise and woke up, but when I opened my eyes, I was laying right in front of a grave with the name Alton on it. It was a small village cemetery surrounded by pine trees. I would say it was less than 900 square feet. Despite it being mid-January in the mountains, there was no snow past the gate, and in the cemetery. I was very cold, though, and scared. I managed to locate a fire watchtower, where they drove me back to my friend's house. 
This was no dream. I woke up in a cemetery and got taken back home. According to them, they went to check on how I was doing at about 1 a.m. and I wasn't in bed. Their home security said that I had left their back porch at 12.40 in the morning. When the park rangers picked me up, it was almost 3 a.m. I explained my story to my friends and family, and they told me that there was no cemetery behind their house. I told them what the area looked like, and they said that they had a clearing like that, but it didn't have any graves. They offered to take a look if I would lead them, but I was too shaken. I also remember there being a small gate in this fence. But before I went back home, that gate was gone, and it was just a solid fence. I don't know what happened, but I'd really love some answers, because it's been bugging me recently, so I decided to share my story. My grandmother, on my mother's side, has always been very superstitious, for lack of a better word. She's not necessarily religious, but she does believe in a lot of paranormal stuff. Her mother was full-blooded Navajo, and her father was Irish. Either way, she'd never been anywhere east of Montana, and she grew up in Nevada. One year, when I was in grade school, we went to visit her. Most of the visit was pretty uneventful, typical, boring, old people stuff. Except she always kept her curtains drawn shut and would always peek out the window. And whenever somebody would ask her what she was doing, she would simply reply, Yenoglushi is watching me. This went on for nearly the entire visit until a few days before we were due to leave. My grandma and my then baby brother, he's 19 now, we're in the front yard that evening planting flowers when all of a sudden my grandmother starts shouting, get away from that creature, it's not safe, to my brother. Of course, being in Nevada, we all assumed that my brother had found a scorpion or a rattlesnake, so we all run outside to see my grandmother clutching my little brother and shaking in terror against the side of the house. Standing out in the yard, was a large, black, Great Dane-sized dog. It was staring at my grandmother with an intensity that I have never seen before. It looked up at us, gave a little huff, and bounded off. I don't remember if it moved unusually fast or not, but I do remember that it had very deep yellow eyes. When my mother asked my grandmother what had happened, she kept repeating, the Yenoglushi has found me. She moved a couple of weeks after that. I guess this story is a little boring, but it just happened to me, so here you go. I was rock climbing with two other guys in Colorado and was belaying one of them when the two of us on the ground heard something weird. The commands we use to communicate that we are safe at the top of a route are, name of the guy on the ground, off belay, which prompts the belayer to unclip the rope from his belay device so the climber can pull slack out of the rope. The response to that command is, name of the guy at the top of the route, belay off. The climber was approximately 40 meters up on an about 50 meter route. I didn't know this at the time. The rope stopped moving, which isn't uncommon when someone is having a hard time with a move or is setting up an anchor, which is what we thought was going on. But then we heard it. A voice that sounded way closer to the ground, like close enough that we could have had a shouting conversation and way farther left off route of where the climber should have been, said, my name, off belay. I looked at the other guy in our climbing party who was just as confused as I was. He said to me, what the F was that? 
and we discussed where the climber should be at this time and that we shouldn't be able to hear him that well. The rope still wasn't moving, but I decided to keep him on belay. I figured it would be best to keep him safe and just feed slack through my belay device in the event that it wasn't him. Turns out it wasn't. A few moments later, the rope starts moving again, later followed by a faint syllable counted my name off belay that sounded way more like it should have. We didn't really think anything of it, but we had been traveling down the wall and hit a few routes without seeing anyone. We also had a friend just a few months ago that got burned in on a route when someone took him off belay when he wasn't safe. I remember seeing a video of a hiker or rancher or something walking down the road when he hears the voice of a woman calling him off the road. The guy stops to figure out what's going on, then just gets out of there because of how weird it was. I'm starting to wonder if there's a cryptid that can mimic the voice of a certain person. We're not entirely sure what happened, but we know two things. Number one, it's a really good idea that I didn't listen to that first voice. And second, it wasn't a person. This happened a few months ago, and I've kept it to myself until recently when I told my dad about it. I was with my brother, who we'll call John, and one of our old friends. We were walking back through a forest back to where we'd come from. Since I'm younger than both of them, they tend to annoy me a lot, but this time they were being really annoying, so I decided to walk ahead. I was about halfway between them and the exit to the forest when I heard things snapping on my left. I just brushed it off and kept walking, but then I started to hear a low mumbling noise, so I stopped and looked around. I asked if anyone was there, and I got no reply until about 30 to 40 seconds later. I heard what sounded like my brother saying, come here, I need your help. So I asked what was wrong while keeping my distance because something about his voice sounded wrong. It was distorted. So I waited a few seconds and then he said again, come here, I need your help, but in the exact same way as before. So I moved to the side and that's when I see it. It was a deer, but it was on its back legs and its body was rigid and twisted. The worst part was that its eyes were exactly the same as mine, like a human's. I didn't believe that it was a bad creature. It actually seemed quite friendly, but nonetheless, I was scared. So I ran a mile back and the whole time I could feel it behind me. When I got out of the forest, I fell to my knees and looked back to see it disappear behind some trees. But here's the weird thing. Ever since then, I've been having bad dreams. Not about being chased by it or anything. In the dreams, I am it. So I told my dad about this and he didn't look surprised or confused at all. He told me of a similar event he had when he was young. To this day, I remember how it felt. That was the first time that I saw it, but I doubt it will be the last. I just got home from a road trip, and I've been thinking about something I saw and can't make sense of. Maybe some of you have also seen something like this. My wife and I were driving on Highway 97 South, near Mount Shasta, California. It was about midnight, and we were driving through a heavily wooded area without any street lamps. We rounded a corner when I saw something fast and low to the ground dart across the street, 
about 50 to 60 yards ahead of us. I saw the glowing animal eyes and a body that was the size and shape of a big dog. We saw animals the whole road trip and like usual, I asked my wife if she had seen it too and she confirmed. The body wasn't 100% clear because of our headlights, they hadn't reached that section of the road yet. When we got to the exact point in the road where the animal had crossed, we looked to that side to see if there was anything there. All there was, was a man dressed in army fatigues walking down the road. He didn't look at us, he just kept walking. It was pitch black and he didn't have any type of light with him. He was only illuminated by our headlights. We both got full body chills when we saw him because we were expecting to see an animal. I know that area has a magical and mystical history with a lot of unexplained sightings, but this is unlike anything I've ever experienced before. We were fully creeped out. I still can't make heads or tails of this, so I figured I'd tell you the story. Does anyone else have a story like this that happened to them? My story is nothing special, but I feel like I should write it down and tell it. It was during the summer of 2017 when my family had gone on vacation to California. We were at the end of our trip, in which we'd been driving from San Francisco to Los Angeles to catch our plane back home. We had just finished seeing John Steinbeck's family home in Salinas earlier, and we were heading back to Los Angeles. I remember us passing the golden valleys where several wineries dotted the landscape. The sun was beginning to descend, as it was some time in the mid-afternoon, possibly around four or five. We were all packed into a rental van, with most of my family members being asleep save for my dad, who was driving, my grandmother, who sat in the front with him, and myself, who was sitting in the right side of the back. As we were coming around a bend in the road, our backs to the wineries, I suddenly heard my dad say, what is that? Being in the back, I could only peek at his side of the van, but I definitely could make out a dark figure crossing from the left side of the road. Reasoning that I would see it in just a few seconds, I quickly darted to my side, where surely I would see whatever or whoever it was come into view. As we got closer, I saw the figure suddenly change posture from upright to walking on all fours before disappearing behind the hill we were coming around. I attempted to see if I could see it behind the hill, but to my surprise, there was nothing there. There was nowhere for it to hide, considering it was man-sized, so I was dumbfounded. My dad and I were both confused. As he was paying attention to the road, he had only seen it upright. My grandmother was more than likely zoned out, as despite being in the front, she failed to see anything. Both my dad and I believe in the paranormal, and while he believed it was a Sasquatch, I believe it could have been a skinwalker or something similar. So far, it's the only instance of the paranormal I've come across in my life, but I still think about what that might have been to this day. I've had a few unsettling experiences in the woods, but this is unquestionably the strangest one. I've been mulling it over for years, and I still can't come up with a rational explanation. A few details have been changed to protect my identity, but the story is 100% true. In 2018, my partner and I drove up to a national forest in Oregon for a day hike in early summer. The area was somewhat remote, but nothing too isolated. 
Hiking is huge in the Pacific Northwest, so there are plenty of other people on these trails at any given time, especially during peak season. Because of this, we chose a less popular trail in the hopes of getting some alone time. It was an approximately six mile out and back moderate difficulty hike with a waterfall at the end. It followed a river and didn't intersect with any other trails. Simple enough, right? We were both experienced hikers in good physical condition, so we had no reason to think that we needed anything but day packs with a couple liters of water and sandwiches. Getting back before dark should have been a piece of cake. We set out sometime after noon. At first, we took it slow and meandered around the riverbank for a few minutes. I found a cool animal bone and we mused over what it might be. It was clearly a vertebra from a large animal, a mammal, so we guessed it was probably a deer bone. Because I'm a little bit morbid and I like collecting things of that nature, I put it in my pack. That might not have anything to do with what happened next but I feel like I should mention it since it was out of the ordinary. The hike to the waterfall was beautiful. We passed a few other people on their way back to the trailhead, but for the most part we had the place to ourselves. We stopped a few times to look at wildlife or take photos of flowers. I was tracking our progress on my Fitbit, so I always knew how many miles we had traveled and how much time we had before sunset. We reached the waterfall at about 3.2 miles, which matched what the map had said. I paused my watch and we settled on a huge boulder to rest and eat our lunch. Another young couple was there with their dog. We said hello and then minded our own business. Here's where everything went wrong. As we packed up our stuff and prepared to leave, my partner Michael slipped off the boulder and twisted his ankle badly. The other couple heard his surprised scream as he splashed into the water, so they rushed over to help. The three of us hauled him back to dry land and assessed the injury. None of us were doctors, but we thought it was a sprain. The swelling had already begun, and Michael said that the pain was serious. He could barely stand. Upon realizing this, the male half of the couple started backing away and seemed very anxious to leave. I asked him if he could go get help, but he didn't respond. Neither did his wife. They both just turned around and started booking it up the trail, with the dog trotting behind them. I called out to them in frustration, but they didn't even look back. Needless to say, we didn't have cell reception that deep in the woods, so we couldn't contact anyone else. We had to hike back. It'll be okay, I said to Michael. It's only three miles. You can do this. We shifted the water bottles and our modest amount of gear into my pack, so that he wouldn't have to carry anything, and we made decent progress. I was still tracking the hike on my Fitbit. After about two miles, Michael ran out of steam and we rested again. I told him to lean on me to take the weight off of his injured ankle. Even though I'm a head shorter than him, it seemed to help. We're almost there, I said. Just one more mile. Despite the setback, we were in pretty high spirits. The sun was still up, and the woods were still beautiful. We made light of our predicament. Michael joked that he can't do anything without getting hurt or breaking something, and I comforted him. We both thought the ordeal was nearly over. Eventually, I realized we had been walking longer than expected. I assumed it only felt that way because we were moving at a slower pace, but when I checked my watch and saw that we had gone farther than a mile, I started to worry. We were at 6.6 .6 miles total, that meant the walk back to the trailhead was longer than the walk to the waterfall. That couldn't be right. But I figured I must have made a mistake at some point. Maybe I hadn't started the tracker until we had already traveled a ways at the beginning. Regardless, the parking lot had to be around the next curve on the trail. But it wasn't. We went another half a mile or so before stopping to assess the situation. Over seven total miles and we still weren't back. What the hell? I checked the map of our hike on the Fitbit app and saw that there weren't any gaps. It was a straight line from beginning to end, with the line doubled back on itself, indicating that we were on the same route. But where was the trailhead? We talked it over and concluded that it had to be a glitch. Michael was adamant that we hadn't passed the trailhead, and we couldn't have taken a wrong turn because there were no turns. 
there were no other trails. Plus, the scenery was all familiar. We saw things we remembered passing on our way to the waterfall. It was definitely the same trail, and well-maintained, too. A big, wide dirt track that followed the river and didn't veer off into the undergrowth. Losing the trail was impossible. At that point, we started to feel demoralized, but what could we do except keep going? Our phones still didn't have any cell service. Michael was in a lot of pain and struggled to put weight on his sprained ankle. It was twice the size of his other ankle. He was sweating. I was sweating. The whole thing started to feel like a nightmare. When we went another mile and still didn't reach the trailhead, we panicked. Night falls quickly in the forest and we had little daylight left. We were almost out of water, we had no rain gear or other food, and the only flashlights were the ones on our phones. Of course, we cursed ourselves for not bringing more supplies, but we were only supposed to be out there for a few hours. It was just a short day hike, and we had no idea how it could have gone so wrong. Out of desperation, I yelled for help. We'd seen no people since that strange couple had abandoned us near the waterfall, but I was sure that we had to be close to the parking lot. That didn't mean there was anyone there, but we were both so freaked out, I was willing to make a fool of myself if it meant rescue. To our dismay, nobody answered. We were alone. In an attempt to get a grip, we reasoned that maybe we really had passed the trailhead we started at. Maybe we were so focused on keeping Michael off of his bad foot that we had simply missed it and were hiking toward the next trailhead. We were pretty sure that wasn't the case, but it was the only explanation that made any sense. We were definitely still on the same trail, and though we couldn't be certain, it seemed like the landscape had changed. We no longer recognized any of the landmarks except the river, and that seemed to support our theory that we had gone too far. We knew that we weren't walking in circles. That wasn't possible. Should we turn back? We mulled that over for a few minutes. If we were wrong, backtracking would guarantee spending a night in the woods. Michael couldn't deal with that ankle forever. We decided to press onward. I'm not crazy, right? I asked. That initial hike was only three miles. We went three miles to the waterfall. Yes, Michael agreed. The entire hike was supposed to be a little over six miles out and back. We've walked a lot farther than that. We should have been back a long time ago. I don't understand what's happening. When night fell, we picked up the pace. Michael stopped leaning on me and limped down the trail as fast as he could. He later said adrenaline dulled the pain of his injury and gave him the motivation to continue. That part of Oregon is mountain lion country, and I had just read about a lion attack a few weeks prior to our hike. Being caught out there in the dark was the absolute last thing that we wanted but there was nothing we could do about it. We were scared. Michael shone his phone light on the path ahead to make sure we didn't lose our footing, and I shone mine in the trees, scanning for cat eyes. I was crying. Fitbit said we had hiked nine total miles. At nine and a half miles, we finally saw the sign for the trailhead and scrambled toward it. Relief didn't completely wash over me though, because I expected that we would have to either hitchhike back to where we started, or trudge along the side of the road for a few more miles. There was simply no way that this could be THE trailhead. It was three miles past where it should have been. As we climbed the short set of steps up to the parking lot, sweaty, thirsty, exhausted, and completely unnerved, I hoped to see a car. My prayers were answered, but it was my car. We were at the same trailhead. For a moment, Michael and I stared in shock. Our fear and misery were replaced by sheer confusion, and we just stood there. Then a twig snapped somewhere in the woods behind us and broke the spell. We hurried across the parking lot toward the car, and in those few seconds, I felt an intense dread. The best way I can describe it is the feeling you get in a nightmare when something is pursuing you, and you're trying to run away but moving in slow motion. Like your legs just won't cooperate, and you know the thing chasing you is going to catch up. This is the only time in my life that I have ever felt that way outside of a dream. We managed to pile in the vehicle and peel out of the lot. 
I was shaking. Michael was rambling about time distortion and dehydration and how we must have lost our bearings somehow. We got out of the national forest and onto the highway, and it was a while before we encountered any other cars. I didn't fully relax until we made it back to civilization. Neither of us can figure out exactly what we experienced. Michael was on crushes for months following that incident, and his ankle has never been the same. I still have the bone I found, but I keep it in a box because it gives me bad vibes. When we go hiking these days, we stick to the crowded trails. Whatever happened that day, we do not want it to ever happen again. I grew up in England in what my family referred to as an upside-down house. Basically, the row of houses were built on a hill, so you entered into the upstairs, your hall, living room, dining room, kitchen, and toilet, and then went downstairs for the bedrooms, which opened out onto the garden. The house itself was never comfortable. For context, I would have birthday parties where kids would line up to use the upstairs bathroom instead of daring to use the downstairs one. My mom found a cross necklace in her wardrobe one time. Another time, her work shirt disappeared, and she tore about the whole house, only for it to show up at the very front of her wardrobe, all pressed and clean. Another time, I was in the downstairs bathroom, and I was just singing nonsense lyrics that I was making up in my head. A male voice sang the next line that I had in my head. I ran to the stairs, sat down halfway up, and all I could hear was his laughter. So yeah, fun house. The doll story, though, still remains the single most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me, paranormal-wise. I honestly can't recall my age, but it was before 10. I had one of those bunk beds with storage underneath. The night before, I had set up a stuffed toy sleepover in my bed. Not relevant, but there you go. I woke up that morning and I didn't immediately open my eyes. I could sense somebody watching me. I finally opened my eyes and I noticed that something felt really off about the line of dolls and toys on the shelf over my wardrobe. It's a long, thin room and this is exactly opposite my bed. One doll's eyes felt different still doll eyes but not not blinking or moving just different i could feel its eyes on me as if it were a human looking at me that's the only way i can describe it i closed my eyes and reopened them nothing changed i counted to 10 mentally i threw off my covers and practically jumped down the ladder and i just bailed out of there no matter what i did i just felt that that one doll was watching me I turn back to the door as I'm going, and I swear by all things holy, this thing is leaning out over the edge of the shelf to watch me go. I hid in my mom's bed with her, terrified that it would somehow follow me. I cautiously went back in later and stared at it, but it was just a doll again. I took it down and hid it in the back of the wardrobe for who knows how long. I've never been comfortable around dolls since. Whatever was in that house, at least whatever the masculine presence was, really liked to scare me. I visited the street about eight years ago, after having moved out over a decade ago, and that house still gives me the creeps. My mother's friend still lives down the street. She signed up for permanent night shift at her job, because she said dark shadows would peer into her windows at night, and she'd rather just be gone. She also says that she senses people coming up behind her when she's home alone. So yeah, fun house and fun street. About three weeks ago now, I got this doll from this antique store that I was at with my boyfriend. 
The doll was sitting in a rocking chair, and it caught my eye. I brought the doll to my best friend's house, and his girlfriend refused to look at the doll. She hated being in the same room as it. My best friend and I started playing with the spirit box, and nothing that creepy spawned out of it. The past week or so has been slightly weird, though. The doll's legs seem to cross on their own. I uncross them, and they always end up crossed again. Now, paintings keep falling down near the doll. My paintings are canvas paintings, and not on paper, so I hang them up over pushpins. The pushpins themselves completely fall out of the wall. Today, an extremely small painting was just off one pushpin, and it was just crooked. My paintings have been hung up on my wall for a year now, and not once have they ever behaved like this. It could all be a coincidence, sure, but I don't know. It's kind of creeping me out. I'm starting to wonder if that doll really is haunted. When I was around 13 or 14 years old, my great-grandmother used to collect dolls. One of the dolls I took a particular liking to, because of how creepy it was. She picked up on it and actually gave it to me not too long before she passed away. Fast forward to the story at hand. My two stepbrothers and I were sitting in the living room, chatting late at night, around 1am or so. For context, this is a cookie-cutter house. So when you walk in, you basically have to choose between going upstairs or downstairs. The living room is directly upstairs from the front door. There's a fireplace on the left-hand wall, but not much else to note since it was an open concept. Adjacent to the wall, there was the railing overlooking the doorway area, and in front of the railing is a couch. There's also a television sitting on the ground on the wall opposite the couch. During our conversation, we got on the topic of childhood paranormal experiences. Joking around, I went and grabbed the doll from my bedroom and leaned it up on the shelf above the fireplace. I made sure that when I put the doll up there, it was leaning securely so as not to slip off. Some things that are important to note. The television was on, but just in the no signal screen. And because we were preparing to move, there were boxes and trash bags piled up in front of the fireplace, at least three to five feet out. We were all sitting on the couch at this time. In the middle of a story that my younger stepbrother was telling about an experience he'd had in the basement of a childhood home, the doll was flung forward from the shelf, landing a good few feet away from the boxes, meaning that it had to fly a good six to eight feet from the fireplace. At the exact time that the doll made contact with the ground, the television shut itself off and then turned back on. We have never had any electrical issues in that house or with that TV. I know people are going to say that it's possible the doll just fell, but the doll didn't fall. It flew forward off the shelf, even though it had been leaning backwards. And things that fall don't typically fall seven feet to eight feet out. They fall down. So, I don't know. But I think we might have a haunted doll on our hands. I was a CNA working third shift at an end-of-life senior care facility in Upper Michigan, near Lake Huron. The hours were usually quiet, as everybody was in bed or heading there, and meals were over. The overnight job entailed lots of cleaning, mopping, dusting, and prepping for breakfast at 8 a.m., as well as answering night calls or being on death watch every 15 minutes. Those were the worst, as you knew death was soon. One resident was close, but would linger for days, the doctor said. People said and did the oddest things at those last gasps, too. 
Needless to say, it was not an easy job. But the pace sucked equally as well. Small town blues for job prospects. Watching other people's family members die is not for the faint of heart. It's a constant reminder of life's worst parts and the limited time we've been given. One of my favorite co-workers with a great upbeat attitude, Val and I, shared this night shift together. We knew our preferred tasks and set about them happily chatting to each other in the dining room, getting it ready for breakfast. Val needed to use one of the nearby employee toilets for an extended stay, so I proceeded to mop the opposite hallway facing the nurse's station and bathroom where Val was. I mop backwards, pulling rather than pushing so I don't leave footprints. So naturally, I don't see where the carpet begins. I need to dip my mop to turn my direction until my shoe heel hits the edge. I can mindlessly do this while looking around the hallway. I was in the process of dipping and squishing my mop when a form caught my eye in the hallway arched entrance to the doors leading to both the nurse's station and the opposite bathroom where Val was. I thought it was her returning back to the floor refreshed and unburdened of previous meals, but no. What I saw gave me this great open-mouthed silent scream pause peeking and stretching out across part of the hallway ceiling, maybe 15 feet long into the main, taller hallway where I stood frozen, was a dark human shadow form, all smoky and eyeless. It stayed there for maybe two to four seconds, and then it shot back into the hallway. I stood there scared silent and immobile as I heard the bathroom door open. Val screamed and then slammed the door again, I heard her call my name through the closed door and slowly crept to the hallway to see nothing there but the doors to the nurse's station, the bathroom, and now the break room across from the utility closet where the cleaning supplies lived. The hallway was clear. I called Val's name from outside the door, knocking too. She asked, squeaking, Is it gone? I responded quietly, Yes. What did you see? Because I saw... Something. Get out here now. Don't leave me alone with that. Val came out and grabbed me in a hug so hard I knew she was scared. Val shook, saying that she had opened the bathroom door and should have seen the nurse's station through the open door and part of the hallway. But what she saw blocked the door and most of the wall. It was huge. It filled the wall and was smoke black. She didn't see a top or face shape to it but it blocked her exit like a smoky haze right against the door and leaking in. So she slammed the door fast and screamed my name. We worked side by side for the rest of our shift, never leaving each other's sight until it was time to leave. The morning shift supervisor wondered why we both clocked out and then bolted in a huge hurry that day. Val told her about it later in a text message saying that she was taking a day off. I'm not sure if it was a reaper we saw, but right after we clocked out, a resident died. Growing up, one of my favorite things to do was to sit down with my grandma and listen to all of her stories. Happy stories, sad stories, and everything in between. As a kid, my grandma was the best storyteller ever, and she would always be open with me. My favorites were her scary stories, and every one of these stories that she would tell me were true. My family has experienced a lot with the paranormal in the past, and this story is just one of many that makes me believe and respect the supernatural and what's beyond. During one summer, my aunt and uncle in Alabama were planning to make the trip to Michigan and spend some time with us and our other family members up here for a few days. They were planning on driving and wouldn't get in until very late in the night. They were planning on staying with my grandma and grandpa. My grandma was such a sweet and genuine lady who felt that it was her duty to take care of everybody in the family and make sure they were safe at all times and were doing okay. She would normally stay up very late watching her TV shows, 
so waiting for my aunt and uncle to arrive wasn't a big deal for her. As the night went on, my grandma heard my aunt and uncle at her side door, talking and using their key to get into the house. All of my aunts and uncles and my mom have the key to my grandparents' home, because no matter what you need, my grandparents' home is always open to family. So my grandma went ahead and pretended to be asleep, and let my aunt and uncle get settled in, and then surprise them afterwards. But as my aunt and uncle approached the living room to go upstairs to their guest room, something inside my grandma's head told her not to open her eyes. Not because she would ruin the surprise, but because there was something there that she shouldn't see. After a couple of minutes, my grandma got up from the couch, and that's when she heard my aunt and uncle's footsteps and my aunt's laughter upstairs. So she just decided to go to bed. In the morning, my grandma gets up and begins to prepare breakfast. While she's doing that, she hears and then sees my aunt and uncle arriving through the side door with their luggage. Confused, my grandma asked them if they had stepped out after coming by the house last night. My uncle answered, no. And he told her that they just ended up getting a room at a local hotel since it was late and they didn't want to disturb my grandparents. She then remembered that when she was pretending to be asleep to surprise them, something told her not to open her eyes. My grandma knew then what it could have been and was happy that something inside her told her not to look. Until this day, we still bring up this story and wonder what it could have been that made it seem like my aunt and uncle had arrived that night and were in the house. My grandma has passed, but her stories are always so comforting to bring up and talk about because we know she's still here, watching over and taking care of us. My boyfriend of two years and I go to the same college. We both take night classes and live in an apartment complex across the street from campus. Neither of us are paranormal enthusiasts, no Ouija boards, etc., and we're also agnostic. So class is from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. We walk over together, but usually I walk back on my own unless I run into him coming back from the lecture building. This time, I was walking alone. It's about a 10 minute walk to the apartment. I could see the light was on as I approached the building, and I thought he had gotten home first. I thought that was a little strange, since I hadn't seen him walking in front of me, but I figured his class had let out early. For some reason, I stopped to look in the window before I went in. I could see what looked like him sitting on the couch, but something was weird. He was sitting very stiffly, with his shoulders kind of lifted, and staring out the window. He, or it, must have seen me, because he gave me a very hateful scowl, got up, and walked to the back room, down the hallway, and out of sight. When he stood up, he kind of swayed, like he was drunk. This was bad, because my boyfriend is two years sober, also, he has never scowled at me like that, for no reason. I went inside, calling out to him, but I got no response. I went to the back room, and nobody was there. I searched that whole apartment, which didn't take long because there's only two bedrooms, and only so many places a grown man could hide. The only way that this thing could have gotten out other than the door would be to take the screen out of one of the back windows and climb out. But we had to replace one of the screens last year, and it was difficult to remove and put back in. You needed to remove four screws. It was an old building. It would have only had seconds to do this entire process. My boyfriend got back at around 10.30, and I told him what happened. He's a lot closer to an atheist than I am, and managed to convince me in the moment that it wasn't real but I'm not so sure, really. Nothing else has been weird since, and this happened a week ago, but it keeps bothering me. I 
I barely remember this story, but my brother, who is four years older than me, remembers it vividly. My dad was on dialysis and went through eight hour cycles. One night, my brother and I are in the computer room playing games at like 2 a.m. Suddenly, from around the corner, my dad appears. He starts being mischievous and trying to scare us. My dad was never a jokester. Plus, he was supposed to be on his dialysis machine. My brother was so unnerved, he said, Dad, what are you doing off your machine? My dad replied, Oh, it's fine. The facial expressions and manner of speaking prompted my brother right then and there to ask, Are you a ghost? To which my dad replied, laughing, No, of course not then started heading up the dark stairs. My brother watched as my dad climbed the stairs and decided to follow him. When he reached the bedroom door that my dad turned into, he saw my real father was in there fast asleep and was already hooked up to his dialysis machine, which was running properly. Not only was my father never one to kid around, he was also very sick at this time with kidney failure and cancer. To scare us in the computer room, he would have had to go out of his way to literally come from the dark shadows of the dining room, which meant going down the stairs and looping around. My brother knew something was up right away, and he won't ever forget this story. So, my girlfriend has been experiencing issues with a dark entity for about seven years, since she moved out of an old house a number of years back. This entity started showing up in the house, in a room where she said she felt very ill just being near it. This entity looks exactly like her, to the point that when she cuts her hair, it has her new hair. She's shrouded in all black and it seems that she has facial features, but you can't make them out. She only seems to show up when my girlfriend is doing bad mentally and seems to feed off of the negative emotions. She has been described to somewhat sound like my girlfriend, even to other people who have seen her. Along with her, there have been other spirits documented by other members of the house, with a local ghost crew coming over every once in a while. The hot spot is the closet in her mom's upstairs bedroom, where they're most sighted. Any thoughts on what type of spirit this could be? Other than filling people with a feeling of dread, this entity hasn't harmed anyone, but any help would be appreciated. One day, I went to my friend Nicole's house with my friend Crystal. While I was there, Nicole tells me this story and asks what I think it is. For anonymity, I'll change out some names, and for context, Nicole, Nicole's boyfriend John, and Crystal all work together. I hope this isn't too confusing, but I'm curious as to what you think. Nicole parked her car at work one day, and saw John and Crystal having a smoke together. John was facing Nicole, and Crystal was facing John with her back to Nicole. Nicole went upstairs to her desk and everyone was asking where Crystal was. She said she was downstairs, having a smoke with John. John comes up and goes to his desk. She asks him where Crystal was, and he said he didn't know. She asked him who he was standing with, and he said no one. Nicole then gets a text from Crystal, saying she was going to be late and could she tell their boss. Nicole starts freaking out because she knows she saw Crystal downstairs. She described her in detail, hair up in a top knot, white long sleeved shirt, black leggings and black sandals, with her purse hanging from her right elbow. To be clear, Crystal was just married and John is not her type, so that can be eliminated as a possibility of lying and cheating. 
I asked Crystal what she was doing while Nicole saw her with John, and she said she was sleeping at home. She also said that she lost those black sandals on vacation a few months back. My mind goes to a few places. Number one, how stressed are you? Your mind can play tricks if you're not feeling well. Two, astral projection since Crystal was sleeping. Three, residual energy since this is something that happens frequently. Four, Crystal's mother? Crystal is the spitting image of her mom. Her mom passed many years ago. John's dad went into the hospital the evening I was there, and the event happened a few days prior. Or a doppelganger wearing the missing shoes. Now something else super freaky happened that night when I was at her place. The night she told me this story. I was getting ready to read Nicole's tarot cards and I went to the bathroom to wash my hands. When I came back, Nicole had my cards out already and was shuffling. Anyone who is familiar with tarot knows that you do not touch the cards until they're handed to you, and she had never done this before. I did leave them out for that crazy moon about a month ago, and they've gotten a lot stronger from it, so their pull to touch them is overwhelming. But still, she knows better. I had previously explained the rules to her of how I read tarot for everyone's safety, so I have no idea what possessed her to do that. I sat and took them back and began to shuffle, but the energy was off, like really off. Her dog was chill all night, but the second I began to lay her cards, after giving them back for her to shuffle, he began to bark at the sliding door that led to her balcony. We're talking over 10 stories here, so no one is there. No birds, no other animals, nothing. I started to become unsettled since the off feeling was getting stronger. We tried to shush him and settle him, but nothing was working. I decided to put the cards away since there was something amiss going on. From what I saw of her reading, it was a very good one, but there was something else stopping me from reading her. I urged her to smudge the house and everyone in it, and once that was done, I felt better. The next day, I am so freaking sick. Coughing, sore throat, nauseous, weak body. I can't eat, I can't sleep, I can't drink anything. This lasted for two days and I'm on the mend now, but still not 100%. So what in the world did she see? What was going on? Does anyone have any idea? I am at a total loss. I'm definitely not going to touch my cards until I'm 100% well again and do a cleansing on them. I will eventually ask the question, but I wonder if you may have some input as to what happened that night and what Crystal saw before. I'm a 39-year-old woman, and I had a really strange dream last night. In my dream, when I turned my back, my 10-year-old self was looking at me. I was quite shocked to see her, and I asked, What are you doing here? She didn't say anything and left the room. I regretted my reaction and thought, Oh, now she would think she wasn't wanted. I had to fix it. I left the room in the hopes of finding her. And there she was, doing her homework in my grandmother's small room. When she noticed me, she smiled at me, and I felt love for her. I just remember thinking, oh, she's alone and trying so much, as always. And then I woke up. When I told the dream to my mother, she told me that I always did my homework in that room when I visited my grandmother's. Somehow, I had no recollection of it until that dream. I know dreams are dreams, but this one just felt like it had a deeper meaning, and I wanted to share.
Back in 2004 or 2005, I was leaving a buddy's house headed home. He lived on Lake Ariel in Wayne County, Pennsylvania. I was a good 15 miles away, so I decided to take back roads to save time. As I crested this mountain road, I see a van off to the side, doors open, lights on. It's well after midnight and no one is on the road. I slowed my car, a 1989 Volkswagen Ragtop, down to first gear, looking for a person or people that might be hurt. Not a soul is around, and the woods are quiet. The van off the road is not running, but all the lights are on, and the driver's door is open. I remember thinking, man, I don't have cell service until the top of the mountain. I've got to call the cops. So I proceeded to go toward where I knew I had cell service. I was maybe going 30 miles an hour tops. I knew this situation was dicey, but then it got worse. No more than three or so miles away, the brush thinned on the roadside, so you had a better view of what was in the woods. I see movement, so I let off the gas, thinking that I don't want to pace a deer. As I let off, this man, soaking in fresh blood, comes from the tree line and into the road. He's so covered in gore, I honestly couldn't tell it was a man at first. He stumbled out in front of the car and waved me down. I was in my ragtop, top down, of course. He was yelling and grabbing at my door. I dropped into first and took off. In another mile or so, I would have cell service to call the cops. The dude was obviously hurt, and his grab from my door scared me. There was a wide space on the mountain where I agreed to wait for the cops. They were there in under 10 minutes. While I waited, I put the top up and locked the doors. An officer took my statement and he looked over my car with a flashlight. The guy from the woods had left a bloody smear down my door. Another officer found the van but couldn't locate the guy who came out of the woods. The cops let me go home and said that they would call if they needed anything further. Within a few days, I did get a call saying the van was located and they asked if I could describe the man. They never found him that night and as far as I know, they never did. Apparently the van was stolen and the cops surmised that this guy banged himself up and took off in a panic. As far as I know, they never did track him down. This experience has stuck with me and to this day, I keep a lookout for a bloody man running out of the woods. Despite my experience, I am still hesitant to use the word haunted. Many people have asked me what I think caused what happened, and I don't have an answer. I can describe it, but I cannot explain it. Therefore, I tend to avoid the usage of words and terms that attempt to explain the phenomenon in any manner. I'm a man of science. I'm not religious or spiritual. However, I cannot simply ignore what happened to me. Here's my story. It was 2009 to 2010. When I met the woman who would later become my wife, we started renting a small house within the city limits. I was in the process of beginning a new job and circumstances prevented me from staying in the house with her for the first week. Each morning we would talk on the phone during my drive to work. She explained to me that each morning she had struggled to sleep the previous night. She described sounds that were keeping her awake, like someone running through the house, objects falling off the kitchen counter, doors slamming. After three days, I made arrangements to go ahead and move in with her. I was convinced that somebody was breaking in and harassing her. She was convinced, however, that she was sharing the house with a ghost. I took off work the third day. It took me about eight hours to get everything moved in. I was taking a break on our bed, 
when I felt somebody or something tug on my pant leg. I remained motionless, hoping that it would happen again. After a few seconds, it did happen again, much more aggressively this time. I felt a hand firmly placed on my leg, just before it grabbed my jeans and started pulling. She was on the bed next to me, and nobody else was with us. We had no pets, as they weren't allowed. I immediately started having the same experiences throughout the night, as she had described over the phone. It was like somebody was destroying our kitchen, but nothing was ever out of place. There was running, as she described, which sounded like a smaller person, perhaps a child. I woke up one night to somebody standing next to my bed. I heard giggling, and then the individual bolted out of the room as I turned my head. It was too dark to notice any features. Over the course of eight months, many unusual things happened. To make a long story short, I'll skip ahead to my last experience, and perhaps the most frightening. I was alone in the house, waiting to join an online seminar. I was sitting on my couch with my laptop on the coffee table ahead of me. I heard the back door slam shut, and a person began running through the house. These footsteps were heavier, and this person was moving quickly. Given the design of our small house, this person was running in my direction. I shot up and ran out of the house, and I didn't stop until I reached the street, and that's where I remained until my wife returned. As I was standing by the street, I was looking back into the house. A balloon from a recent party made its way from the kitchen into my bedroom, then back into the kitchen moments later. It felt like I was watching somebody search for me, going room to room, all while holding this balloon. This was the last thing that happened to us, and it stopped after that. We continued living there for another four years. I would give anything to experience it again. I would try to be less afraid, and I would approach the situation more analytically. My wife, on the other hand, was never afraid of it. Unfortunately, my wife passed away a few years ago, but I know she would have enjoyed sharing her story. I still drive by that house occasionally, and nobody has ever moved in. For reference, I live in Sweden, and my family is very anti-religious. The house we live in is fairly old, dating back around a hundred years. My dad is a very productive person, always getting new hobbies on the fly. One day, he decided to start a bee farm in our backyard. When you take care of bees, you need room that is very clean, too, to keep out the bacteria from the honey. He decided to use our shed in the backyard, which is extremely small. The room can only fit about two people. In the room, we have one desk, which has a couple of drawers in it. In those drawers, we keep all of the necessary equipment when making the jars of honey. My dad had to put labels on each jar of honey, which is a very tedious process. The labels are on a huge scroll, about the size of an average adult's small arm in diameter. My dad and I were putting labels on the jars for about 30 minutes before he goes outside for about 10 seconds to get some air. I can see him the entire time. When he goes out, he puts the scroll on the top of the desk. During this time, I was watching and I took out my phone. When he comes back in, we proceed to start again, but out of nowhere, he asks me where I put the scroll. I told him that he put the scroll on the top of the desk but it's not there. Without the scroll of labels, we couldn't continue working. We start looking all over the room, but nothing. As I described earlier, the room was tiny, which is why it's so odd for something to disappear. We searched everywhere, behind the desk, in each drawer, outside, but still nothing. This happened about a year ago, 
and it's still freaking me out. Usually when my family and I experience something paranormal, we just blame it on something logical and ignore it. But this incident cannot be explained. There is seriously nowhere for that thing to have disappeared to, and that's why it's freaking me out. Even in the unlikely event of it rolling outside, my dad and I would have easily spotted it or just heard it. Moral of the story is, gnomes might still exist in Sweden. This happened when I was 13 or 14. This was probably one of the last times that I went consistently to see my aunt. She lived very close to a mountain near Oaxaca. Her husband, my uncle, was a pretty wealthy guy. He sold and bred livestock. He had a lot of horses, cattle, goats, and dogs. Their house was a pretty big place with lots of land for the animals. Of course, their house was very isolated. The closest town was quite a ways away. We went there one year to stay with her and everything was normal for the first few days. When the weird things started happening, it was early in the morning. I wear wristwatches and I always take mine off to go to bed and put it back on after I brush my teeth and whatnot. I remember waking up grabbing my watch and putting it on the top shelf of this shelf outside the bathroom, brushing my teeth and coming back to find it gone. I thought for a second and I looked around in the shelf and under it, but I couldn't find it. I went back to the room I was staying in and looked around there and it wasn't there either. I thought maybe one of my siblings was playing with me and I looked around, but all three of my siblings were fast asleep on the floor. That's when I started getting, not scared, but worried. I go to look around the shelf once more and I still can't find it. I remember saying out loud, whoever took my watch, give it back because I'm getting mad. I walk away to put my shoes on and from the living room, I could hear a slight noise. It was my alarm on my watch going off. I peek my head into the hallway and I could see the blue light from my watch. That's when I got scared. I walked up to it and put it on and got a really uneasy feeling. I go to watch TV and I see my aunt walking into the kitchen. I say good morning and I ask her if she grabbed my watch. She says no, but not to leave valuables in the open. I asked her why and she says, the duendes will take them and hide them I gave an uncomfortable laugh and said, right. She obviously saw that I thought she was crazy. She told me she was serious and that the Duende probably grabbed my watch. In my mind, I'm thinking this lady is nuts. Later on that day, I asked my mom if Duendes were real. She gave me a concerned look and asked me why. I told her that my aunt said that there were Duendes in the house. She steered away from the question and just said, if you feel scared, just start to pray. I didn't think about it much after that. I remember that we watched a movie in the living room and I fell asleep on the couch. I woke up to a thud coming from the kitchen and footsteps running from the kitchen. The footsteps were light, but still audible, kind of like when a cat runs. I see lights turn on from the hallway and I see my aunt running toward the kitchen. I hear her say, Mendingos duendes, which means roughly damn elves. I slowly get up and peek into the kitchen and it's a huge mess. A lot of stuff knocked over, most of it food. I asked if an animal got in, maybe a raccoon. She's so irritated by the mess, she just says, duendes. I roll my eyes and look at my watch. It was almost 4 a.m. I decided to help her clean up. We finished cleaning up in about 20 minutes, and that's when I helped her with the dustpan. It was one of the sucky ones where you have to crouch over and hold it. 
When I crouch over, I look to the huge pile of food and I can see either sugar or flour. And that's when I made out little tiny footprints. Not like baby footprints, but smaller, like if a lizard had human feet. I look to my aunt and she says, I know, I saw them, I told you. I'm still not completely convinced, so I go to bed and I wake up and nothing happens for a few days. The last experience I had with these things was when I was sleeping and woke up for some reason, or rather no reason at all. I remember feeling uneasy, trying to figure out why I was awake. I could hear those footsteps again as something small was running in front of the bed. I sit up fast and I see a small shadow running weird, like it was kind of waddling but still moving really fast. All this happened in a matter of seconds. I turn on the lights and nothing is there. I couldn't make the shadow out, but it was small, maybe a foot tall. That's when I started believing in them. I was so uneasy after that, and I was glad I was getting out of there. I may have been a skeptic going into it, but after that visit, I'm a believer in Duendes. One evening, a group of friends and I were hanging out in the city. First, we went to a local restaurant, and then we went to a liquor store to pick up some drinks. As we each threw out suggestions on where to hang out, one of my friends mentioned Stowe Lake, a small lake in San Francisco. As we get a couple of swigs of liquor in us, we start walking down a trail at about 11.45 p.m. First, we stopped at a creepy gazebo in the middle of the forest and then began heading toward the lake. I began to power walk and try to scare my friends down the path. I see a huge tree up ahead. As I was turning right behind the tree, I noticed a small figure start to waddle away from me. I noticed a dark blue pointy hat and a red coat on him. That sucker started running and panting into a hole in the tree. Sort of looked like a doorway. I didn't think twice to stick around and I tried to play it cool as if nothing happened and returned to my group. I never mentioned it to anyone, but can confirm. I think there are gnomes in San Francisco. I have never believed in the paranormal, and even to this day I'm not sure if I believe in the events of this story. It's been stuck in my mind for years and I thought I would just share it. My father served in the Royal Military Police and left the army four years ago after 30 years of service. My father has always been a very serious man, worked very hard, and the little humor he has is very dry. He has traveled the world with his work and experienced all manner of life. He is the last person to believe in the paranormal. Just over 10 years ago, he was on a posting in Germany, the last of the British troops before all the bases were closed. He had moved into a big old house. This house was where Hermann Göring, head of the Germany Luftwaffe, lived. My father lived there with three other high-ranking officers from different regiments, all of whom mostly kept to themselves. After four months, he happened to have a weekend alone in the house. In the evening, he was sat downstairs watching TV when he heard footsteps coming down the stairs and into the hallway. He thought nothing of it until the fourth time he heard somebody come down the stairs. He assumed one of his housemates had returned from leave early. He had gone to look, but there was nothing there. And after checking the rest of the house, he went to bed. The following two nights, the same thing happened but my father put the noise down to it just being an old house with creaky floors. Monday morning, he reported the noise, along with a draft in the bathroom and a leaky tap, to the site maintenance office. 
His housemates had returned and he had forgotten entirely about it. A couple of weeks later, he happened to mention the noises he had heard to the old German cleaner. She said in the most matter-of-fact way, that was Cedric. It turns out Cedric was a Polish prisoner of war who used to work in the house. Cedric was sadly beaten to death in the house, and it is believed that his spirit has remained in the house ever since. The cleaner told my father that Cedric walks the stairs every evening and makes occasional noises or gusts of wind during the day. My father told us occasionally about the noises and things that could have been Cedric, but none of us believed him. He learned the ways of Cedric, but there was never any flair or imagination to his stories. Just simply, there is a ghost that wanders around my house. Six months later, I went to Germany for a work experience placement near where my father was based. He picked me up from the airport and took me to the house where he lived. I stayed the night there, and there was no sign or mention of this so-called Cedric. In the morning, I was going for a shower when my father said, don't worry about the wind, it's just Cedric, but he means no harm. I thought he was winding me up, but I still put a towel under the door to avoid any drafts. I had just about finished my shower, about to go and tell my father that his made-up ghost doesn't exist, when this breeze or gust of wind or something blew right through me. It was like nothing I had ever experienced or known before or since. It left me cold for the entire rest of the day. I grabbed my towel and raced out into the bedroom. I got changed, packed my bags, and walked out of that house. I believe it to be the only paranormal thing I have ever experienced. Thinking back, I cannot see how that could have been a draft or my father just winding me up. I don't know what it was, but I do know that there was definitely a presence in that house. My boyfriend of five years has crushed on me for probably 12 or 13. He was two grade levels below me and was a bad boy while I was popular and in all honors college level classes. So I wasn't aware he existed until I met him at my dad's business about seven years ago. He apparently talked about me being his dream girl and was teased that it would never happen. So in 2009, he and his best friend, I'll call him Josh, were getting into pills due to Josh's grandfather being an amputee and unable to properly attend or understand hiding the medications, thus leaving large amounts of methadone and other drugs lying around. This was before the opioid crisis that has affected my generation deeply in the last 15 years. Two days before Christmas 2009, Josh overdosed in the bedroom that my boyfriend is currently staying in. It's a long story, but we moved back to our respective families because we were laid off during the pandemic and were in a bad wreck, losing our extra car. The room has never felt spooky, never anything strange about it, but I've had a few pranks pulled on me that we believe Josh does to basically congratulate my boyfriend on being with the woman he waited for. I have woken up to sticky notes completely covering my body, my drinks poured on the floor, and random objects moved right where I exit the bed so that I step on them first thing in the morning. I swear I've heard giggling. Each time I have angrily asked my boyfriend if he was messing with me, and I know when he's lying. He always says no, and I believe him. We like to think that this is Josh playing practical jokes, something he was known for but this is nothing compared to what Josh did for me in 2017. It wasn't a prank, it saved my life. Four years ago, I went into anaphylactic shock. I lost all ability to speak or move my lower body. I was upstairs with a curved and steep staircase separating me from my phone. I remember crawling to the stairs, knowing it could be fatal if I smashed into the wall that the stairs led to before the turn with very large steep steps. 
I know I was extremely oxygen deprived, but I immediately saw Josh and two of my deceased best friends ascend the stairs and carry me to the living room couch with my nebulizer and cell phone. I called 911, but I had no voice. My friends were gone, except Josh. He told me he was going to go wake up my boyfriend from the hammock in the back of my yard. All of a sudden, my boyfriend dreamed of this friend saying that I was in trouble. My boyfriend came running into the house, and by this point, I was literally dying. I could no longer use any part of my body, and no air came into my lungs when I inhaled. I remember thinking of my daughter and praying her father would navigate my loss to her and keep memories of me alive. He actually died in a freak accident eight months ago, so now I'm fulfilling that for him, but I digress. I struggled to remain conscious, but I was fading. My boyfriend saw the 911 operator on the phone and my sweaty blue body. He told them he didn't think I was breathing, and by some absolute miracle, there was an ambulance passing my neighborhood. The hospital and dispatch were 30 minutes away. This coincidence, plus my boyfriend's sudden premonition that I was hurt, saved my life. Josh and those EMTs saved my life. I remember the EMT asking my boyfriend if I had overdosed. I hadn't. And I thought of how Josh had died. I was blabbering on about dead people saving me after a large amount of epinephrine, so no wonder they thought I was high. The doctors and EMT were baffled at how I managed to get down those stairs, or even stay alive long enough to get help. I had one bruise on my leg, and it was really tiny. That was it. Well, and the worst headache I've ever had. Turns out I'm allergic to the latex and spray paint. I just told them that I slid down the stairs, but that's not how I remember it. The weird thing is, I'd never met Josh when he was alive. I don't know how I recognized him or hallucinated him, but he looked exactly like the picture I was shown after the fact. I've had a lot of paranormal encounters, but my run-in with Josh saved my life, and he never even knew me. So thanks, Josh, for giving me more time on this earth, and I wish we had met many years before. I do hope that he's resting peacefully, but just periodically decides to pop in and check on us. When I was 11, my dad, my sister, and I moved into a townhouse. At night, I would wake up and see two different men, they were different every night, walk into my room. My room was right next to the bathroom, which is where the two men would walk in from. One would have a top hat and a tailcoat. The other wore dark sunglasses and a trench coat, but the silhouettes would change. It would creep me out so much that I would hide under my covers. Sometimes I got too scared and slept in my dad's bed. One night, I was sleeping in my dad's room, and two identical twin girls with long black hair and hollowed out eyes came up to my dad while he slept. They didn't say anything. They just stared at him, and then they went away. Our neighbor John told me that I could see ghosts. I've been told I'm a medium, but I block it out as an adult. I'm 20 now. In John's house, I saw a woman hanging by the neck in his kitchen, and then in the basement, a man with a cleaver dripping in blood. I was so scared that I left. Now I'm 20, and I still believe in ghosts. People tell me that I should develop my gift, but I don't know if I want to develop it any more than it already has. So I've had a couple of ghost encounters that really messed me up, but this one in particular was the worst. So my mom was dating a guy who I wouldn't call redneck, but definitely not like a normal country guy. He also had a son, who I still stay in close contact with to this day. Basically, almost every Sunday, we would go out to my stepdad's mom's house. 
She lived in the middle of the woods, but not secluded like there were no other houses in the area, but directly across the dirt road, there was an abandoned house that pretty much looked like what you would expect an abandoned house to look like. So my stepbrother and I would go in there every once in a while for fun and would see some weird stuff, like a random chair in the middle of a room and a cooler full of dead roses. But one day we were headed in there like usual, but once I took a step in, I just wanted to throw up. My brother kept going and was telling me that it would be fine and to just come in, but I was not going in there. A couple of minutes of talking go by and all of a sudden, my brother's face turns pale and he drops his water bottle and runs out without saying a word. I follow him, asking him to slow down and he says that we're never going in there again. When I asked why, he said that he heard a voice whisper in his ear and tell him to run. We never told our parents until like two years later. At the time, we were 12, but he was true to his word. We never went back. My twin and I had adjoining bedrooms, and she had to enter my room to exit the house. We shared in experiences. If she got hurt, I would have sympathy pains, etc. She would always come over to my bed in the night complaining that she heard something or had a bad dream. One night, she called out to me, Sissy, can you come to my bed? I refused and told her to come to me. She replied that she couldn't and absolutely begged me. I could hear in her voice that something was very wrong. I got up and walked to the light switch to turn on the light and I looked through her door. I saw a tall, dark hooded figure at the bottom of her bed. It turned around and looked at me. There was no face, only a void. I immediately flipped the lights on and it was gone. Before I could say anything, my sister asked me, did you see it? Chills ran down my spine. She said, did you see it? Did you see the tall, dark thing at the bottom of my bed? It's been watching me all night. I'm not a believer in ghosts, but I cannot explain what we saw together that night so many years ago. She's convinced that it was something evil. To this day, I don't know. My partner and I have recently moved into a new house, which I love and am happy to be in. But some curious things have happened that I can't really find an explanation for. Last night, however, was the most bizarre. The original house was built in 1942, and we highly suspect that half of it was added on later because it doesn't quite fit the rest of the house. My partner, a sincere skeptic, noticed this from the architecture, but I can sort of feel it in the energy of the house. The newer front area, a combined living room, kitchen, and bathroom, feels very calm and welcoming, while the older back of the house, a master bedroom, bathroom, office, and sunroom, is darker and sometimes uncomfortable for me to be in from time to time. The air feels heavier to me and seems to put off a lot of static that I can feel under my feet. Though, to be fair, I do spend less time in that part of the house, so this sense of unrest could be due to that, I suppose. The bathroom in the master bedroom is the oddest place for me. There is a small door in the ceiling that leads to the attic, and for whatever reason, it particularly draws my attention. Also, the door to the bathroom has a tendency to swing open when it's ajar, but I'm aware that that could be a draft. We also tend to hear a lot of noises at night. But again, this could easily be dismissed by a draft and the fact that it is a fairly old house. The first strange thing to happen. I was laying in bed, half asleep, and suddenly a glass water bottle fell over and rolled across the floor. 
My partner and I were both startled, and he immediately yelled out, Who is it? Who's there? In his sleep, then laid back down and has no recollection of this. It was about four feet from the bed, so there's no way I could have knocked it over. And, like I said, I wasn't completely asleep yet when this happened. I remember laying completely still, on my stomach, with my knees facing the direction away from the bottle. There were several things between me and it that would have been knocked down as well had it been me. Last night I was having an excruciating time falling asleep, with just a general sense of unrest despite how exhausted I was. Finally, when I did fall asleep, I had a nightmare that there was a woman walking through our house. She was inhumanly old, with a severe hunched back and a shuffling walk. The most unsettling part, though, was that she had her arm outstretched in front of her, and in the center of her palm she was holding her own eye. She stopped directly in front of the door to our bedroom and peered sideways at me both with her head and the eye in her hand. I woke with a violent start and knocked the remote off the bed, which was pretty loud. My partner began to sleep talk, and we had a conversation. He said, Is she here? I said, Is who here? He said, The woman. What woman? What are you talking about? The woman from your dream, he said. I said, how did you know I was dreaming about a woman? It's okay, go, go back to sleep. He said, is the woman here? At which point I began to rub his back and just tried to get him to stop talking. He said several other things in his sleep and was very restless, tossing and turning and moaning all night. As soon as I woke up this morning, I asked him about it. And again, he has no recollection of talking in his sleep or of anything happening. Although, he says he doesn't feel rested at all, and can tell that he must have slept poorly. I know some people are going to say he was just screwing with me, but he's not that kind of person. Anyway, he's a devout skeptic, who respects my belief in attached energies and the paranormal, but doesn't share those beliefs himself. He would have no reason to pull a trick on me like that. More importantly, how would he have even known that I was dreaming about a woman? I have two stories to share. Let me first start by explaining why most corner rooms in hotels are always the most haunted places. In my culture, we believe that corner rooms must be avoided in any hotels due to the fact that it's the least populated or visited area by humans, since they don't walk toward the end of the hallway often. Thus, spirits can have that space to themselves without much disturbance. Starting with my personal story. Back in 2017, my mother and I visited Korea and went to Jeju Island. We stayed in a pretty new hotel. It was spacious and big, and the price was rather cheap for a four-star hotel. Upon our dismay, we were allocated the corner room. Thinking it was a new hotel, my mom and I brushed off any unpleasant feelings and checked into our room. It was pretty late at night, around 11 p.m. when we checked in. In Chinese beliefs, when checking into a hotel room, you always knock on the door and politely tell any spirits inside that you're merely staying for a few days and won't disturb them. Flush the toilet immediately upon entering, and also place your shoes in a somewhat messy manner. We did everything. However, upon entering the room, we felt really drained and uncomfortable. We received two keys in a card format, one for electrical usage in the room and one for the door key. My mother put the card on the table and we started unpacking. To our horror, after unpacking and wanting to go to the convenience store to buy some snacks, the keys had disappeared and were not on the table anymore. 
My mother immediately started blaming me for misplacing them, and we spent a good 20 to 30 minutes arguing while flipping the whole room over for the key. When we were about to give up, the keys sort of magically appeared at the same spot on the table again. There's no way we would have missed it. It was right smack dab in the middle of the table in front of us. Also, we realized that the beverages in the fridge were all half drank. Not sure if the hotel staff just didn't change it or if it was something supernatural, but it's worth mentioning. The feeling in the room was still particularly ominous, so we decided to check out. I called the receptionist hotline with the phone provided by them in the room, but all I heard was static. In the end, we packed everything and went down to the reception to request a room change. The next room we checked into didn't have any heavy or ominous feelings, and we had a good and comfortable stay overall. The next story is my friend's. We'll call her Giselle. Giselle went to Perth on a school trip and was paired with Lindy to be her hotel roommate. Unfortunately, they got the corner room. Giselle was strongly against this as her dad is a medium and had always advised her to stay away from corner rooms, or if the room made her feel uncomfortable regardless of where it was. She immediately felt cold and uncomfortable in the room upon entering it, but she tried her best to shrug it off. Giselle and Lindy turned on the TV. The only thing that came up on every single channel was horror shows. They started to feel a little bit creeped out, because no matter how many channels they changed, it was always horror shows or previews. What broke the camel's back was when they checked on their water supply. They all received a full water bottle from their school since they had to compete in a choir competition. It was essential to finish the water at designated timings. The water bottle only had half the water left. Neither of them had touched or drank any of the water, but it was only half filled for both bottles. They were 100% sure and adamant that they received a full bottle of water. They were unable to change rooms despite telling their teacher in charge what happened. So they packed up all their stuff and crashed in other people's rooms. My mom, who passed away about three years ago, seemed to attract something off. Every house we lived in had activity, and one house in particular in Merritt Island, Florida, was particularly dark. I sometimes have nightmares about this house, which was in the area where a fierce tribe lived long ago. We were also just about a mile or so away from the famous Georgiana Church and Graveyard which is reputed to be haunted. My mom had some psychological issues, but they were never clarified to my brothers and I. There's so much that happened over the years that I don't know where to begin. My mom was always complaining about the ghosts, and things happened a lot. Even my skeptic dad felt touched one night while he was cooking fish or something on the stove, and I could tell that he was a little unnerved. Faucets would turn on, lights would flicker, an electronic battleship buried in my closet started beeping one day. My younger brother and I started searching for the source of the noise, and we found the game under a bunch of junk in my closet. We took it out and opened the battery case to take the batteries out when it wouldn't turn off, but there weren't any batteries in it. As soon as we took off the battery cover, though, it stopped beeping. The smoke detectors at every single house we ever lived in would go off every so often, when they weren't supposed to. It was completely unnerving. It still happens occasionally when I walk under one. One time when I was very little, I had a dream about a fire. In a half-sleeping state, I thought, stop, drop, and roll, just like we were taught in school. I rolled out of bed and sleep crawled into the living room where my parents were watching TV. I guess I sat on the couch at that point, but I don't remember that part. What I do remember 
is that when my dad walked me back to my room, as we passed under the smoke detector, it went off loudly. Weird for that to happen after I'd had a dream about a fire. It blared once, and then stopped. I never sleepwalked again, to my knowledge. I remember many times when the smoke detector would go off when I was home alone after school, and I would run outside and sit in the yard until someone else came home. The scariest thing happened when I was grown, and my oldest daughter was about four years old. My dad had had a heart attack and was recovering from surgery. I was an Air Force lieutenant at the time, and I took some leave to come home and help out for a week or so. We arrived at the house and let ourselves in. The guest bedroom used to be my older brother's bedroom. My old bedroom and my younger brother's bedroom, along with the bathroom we shared, was at that end of the house. My parents had set up a toddler bed for my daughter against the wall, opposite the queen-sized bed. From the toddler bed, you could see clearly into the hallway. I tucked my daughter into bed and crawled into the queen-sized bed. I had just pulled up the blanket when my daughter started screaming like a banshee. My instincts kicked in and I ran to scoop her up. I noticed that she was crying and frantically pointing into the hallway, like something was there terrifying her. I took her back into the bed with me and held her until she calmed down. I was afraid to ask her what she'd seen, but I had to know. Her answer chills me to this day. She said, A baby man. Over the years, as I grew older, and eventually had two more children, my mother would frequently complain about the ghosts haunting her at a few other places she lived, and the kids and I also experienced minor bits of activity at each home. Kids would hear their names being called by family members who weren't home at the time. One time, while visiting my mom with my three kids after my dad passed, my mom and I arrived home to find my three kids and my nephew, who was also visiting, waiting outside. They had all heard me calling them from the kitchen in the loft where they were watching TV upstairs. Of course, I wasn't home, and they were pretty shaken. One time I woke up to the very strong smell of talcum powder, which brought back the memories of my grandmother, who had to sleep in my bed with me when she used to visit when I was young. I hated my grandmother having to sleep in my bed at the time, but this experience was sort of comforting. About six years ago, my mom became too ill to live by herself, and she came to live with me and my three kids in New Smyrna Beach, Florida. She complained about the ghosts in her room, saying that they would growl and run around her room like dogs. She said the growling noises weren't scary, though. It just sort of sounded like a man saying, grr, grr. My mom had terminal emphysema, and my house had zero paranormal activity before she moved in. So I tried to attribute her experiences to lack of oxygen. Keep in mind that I never talked about these experiences with my mom in front of my kids. I continued to blame my mom's hallucinations, as I thought they were, on her lack of oxygen until my youngest daughter heard the growl too. She was about 13 at the time. Like I said, my mom and I never talked about the ghosts to the kids because we didn't want to scare them. But one night, my daughter came into my room crying and scared, saying she heard a man growling and saying, grr, grr, in exactly the same way my mom had explained. I have two theories about why my mom attracted this activity but I don't know that they matter. So many strange experiences happened with her, and although these memories aren't exactly pleasant, they do make me think about my mom. I kind of wish I had asked her more questions about her and her life before she passed. Either way, these are just some of the things that happened. The high school I attended was said to be haunted by a girl who had been pushed off of the bell tower and broke her neck, causing her to pass away instantly as she hit the ground. Before it was turned into a modern day high school, I believe it was an all girls boarding school. Strangely enough, I can't find a lot of information on the building. 
It would have been a boarding school around the time when this unfortunate event happened. There were a few small stories circulating about the school being haunted, but alas, they could have been rumors completely made up. However, I had an experience of my own that made me believe them. I'll start with one of the stories that I heard from others. Either a teacher or a student, I forget which, needed a guide dog or a therapy dog, which they would bring to the school with them. However, the dog would refuse to go anywhere near the stairwell, which led to the bell tower. It would whine and try to back up, and it just wouldn't go toward the bottom end of the second floor, the ICT corridor, which is where the doors led out to the stairwell. It's also where I had my own experience. I'd also like to add that there is no longer a bell in the bell tower. It wasn't there when I first started at the school, and it's still not there to this day. I believe it was removed and the door leading up to it was sealed shut, meaning that even if we ascended the stairs to it, we wouldn't be able to get much farther than that. Now onto my experience. It was lunchtime and I had taken a shortcut through the math corridor, turning right into the ICT corridor on the second floor toward the door that leads to that stairwell. One set of stairs led down to a small foyer and the canteen on the right and the other set of stairs led up toward the sealed off bell tower. As I was walking along the ICT corridor, I realized that it was awfully quiet. No one was around, no teachers or students whatsoever. It was so quiet it made my ears ring. A set of footsteps joined me and were walking behind me, about halfway down along the corridor. I thought it must have been another student, so I didn't bother turning around to see who it was. I just wanted to get to lunch. I got to the doors, which are big, heavy wooden doors that don't stay open on their own. They have to be pushed with quite a bit of force and latched onto a heavy-duty magnet that holds them open, unless you press a button to release them. The amount of times I was smacked in the face by these things is astounding. So I get to the doors and I push one of them open, not bothering to latch it to the magnet on the wall, thinking that the person walking behind me will just catch it as I let go and walk through it down to the canteen for lunch too. As I began walking down the set of stairs to the canteen, I suddenly stopped mid-step. Something didn't feel right. I realized the doors hadn't made the noise that they do when they slam shut, and the footsteps had stopped at the door. I waited for someone to pass me on the stairs, but nobody did. So I turn around slowly, and the door that I walked through is stood open on its own, without being latched onto the magnet. It was ajar, far enough open that I could see down the corridor, but not quite far enough for it to catch the magnet and stay open. And the student that I was sure was walking behind me was nowhere to be seen, even though I would have sworn up and down that they were right behind me. Their footsteps weren't that far away. Before I could even gasp, the door shuts, slowly, as if somebody was holding it open and then slowly and gently shut it so it wouldn't make a noise. I couldn't get out of there fast enough. I turned and ran down the rest of the steps. I never took that shortcut alone again, and I always made sure I went the long way around if no one was with me. What was even weirder to me was the fact that it felt like somebody was watching me during this whole event. It was so creepy. The following case was narrated during a famous radio program called La Mano Peluda, The Hairy Hand, around 2001. A civil engineer, who wishes to remain anonymous, shares his story. This happened in Tepotzatlan, Mexico City. When I was studying, I met my wife at Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, where she studied medicine. When we got married, my father-in-law gave me a piece of land in Tepotzatlan, where we decided to build a house. Little by little, we were building the home, and when it was finished, we decided to have a celebration with friends and family. The party transcended without eventualities. However, when everyone had retired, 
At dawn, we heard strange noises inside the house, like laments, dragging chains, strong blows, etc. This worried my wife a lot, and as a strong believer, she prayed for protection. I used to be kind of skeptical of these things, and I didn't give it any importance, always trying to find a logical explanation. On one occasion, I went to work, and my wife called me on my cell phone, asking me about a pair of mining boots that she found near the basement. I usually wear this type of footwear due to my work in construction, but it seemed strange to me since I only had one pair and I was wearing them at work at the time she called. Upon arriving to the house, I found my wife somewhat worried, and when looking for these boots, I found them just at the entrance to the basement over a puddle of water. None of this had a reason to exist, since the boots were not mine and there was no water leak that could justify the large puddle that was there. At first I thought they were from one of my subordinates and that he had possibly forgotten them there, but looking at them carefully, they were not the type of boots or brand that we usually use, so not knowing who they belonged to, I threw them away. After that day, the wailing and the noises became louder and louder, until the point that I got used to them. However, my wife spent terrible, horrified nights praying. For this reason, I decided to buy a firearm, a 45 pistol, for anything that came along. On one occasion, we went to my nephew's christening and returned to the house late at night. But since we were already tired, we went to bed to go to sleep. The main bedroom is located on the second floor, and to get there, there's a wooden staircase that creaks when you step. In the early morning, the creaking woke me up, and I got very nervous. Then the creaking stopped. I prepared my weapon, thinking that it was a thief, and suddenly, someone started punching on the door as if it wanted to break it down, giving me the impression that this intruder had enormous strength. At this point, my wife woke up abruptly, and I, with weapon in hand, instructed her to lock it as soon as I left to confront the stranger. I opened the door suddenly, and clearly saw a man descending the stairs in a hurry when he saw that I was armed. I emptied the gun, hitting him more than five times in the back, and I watched him roll down the stairs. Call the police, I yelled to my wife. Then I ran to turn on the stair light. But to my surprise, there was no one. Instead, what sat there on the stairs were those boots that I had thrown away months ago, but this time over a pool of blood. My wife was so scared that she called a priest to bless the house. I personally set the boots on fire until they turned to ash in front of me. For some time, things seemed to be normal, so much so that we decided to have children. And to make my wife feel calmer, we took one of her uncles into the home. Her uncle was an old man who, due to an accident at work, had been disabled, but his company made her feel good. Everything was going along well, so I dared to work out of state without concern. More than three months had passed since the last incident. It was already dark when I returned home after a work trip. My assistant and another trusted employee were with me. Upon arriving at the house, I was surprised to find the lights off. At first I thought they had just gone out, but I listened to the television and it was on. I moved over to the living room to see what was happening. I found my wife's uncle out of his chair. He was dead, and immediately I was alarmed. I began to scream for my wife. I finally found her, hidden to one side of the dining room, sitting in a large pool of blood, sobbing uncontrollably. Thinking someone had hurt her, I called emergency services. The paramedics immediately took my wife away confirming that she was fine, but that she had lost her baby. Upon checking the uncle, they just confirmed his death. They said that it was due to cardiac arrest, but his face reflected absolute terror. Had it not been for my assistant and the other worker accompanying me and serving as witness, the police probably would have accused me of harming my wife and killing her uncle, as they found nothing that suggested the entry was forced there was no evidence of a stranger in our home. My wife spent three weeks in intensive care until she finally began to show improvement. When she woke up, due to the trauma, she had lost her memory. 
She doesn't even remember me. I have taken her to psychiatrists. Even with hypnosis, we've tried to make her remember. But as soon as she begins to relive what happened, she becomes completely hysterical. She'll just say, here it comes. Here comes the one who will harm us. Take care of him. We've never been able to find out who he is, what he is, or what he wants. Due to the state of her health, I was forced to confine her to a psychiatric hospital in Guadalajara City. I visit whenever possible, although she doesn't remember me. She believes that I am a friend. After everything was over, I returned to the house, and the first thing I saw when I opened the door were those damn boots in a pool of blood next to the basement. Since then, I haven't returned to the house, which is, to date, uninhabited, as it has been completely impossible for me to sell it. It was October 26th of 2017. It was the night before season two of Stranger Things came out. As a huge fan, I was super excited and decided to stay up the whole night to watch all of it. I was half awake, half asleep, watching YouTube when I started hearing a light banging noise on the downstairs window. It was almost like a bird had flown into it and was flapping its wings against it. Keep in mind, I live in a heavily wooded area, so it's not that uncommon to have animals around your house at night. I just ignored it and figured it was a bird. About two to three minutes later, I hear three sets of three bangs, except it sounded more like a human doing it this time. I tried to listen to see if I could hear anything like talking or laughing. I hear nothing at all, like absolutely nothing so I kind of just ignore it again. Time goes on, and again, two to three minutes later, more bangs. Except this wasn't like a bang that a human could do without tools. It sounded like the equivalent of someone banging a hammer against the side of my house. At this point, I am scared to death, and I'm thinking about calling the cops. But I decide I'm just going to wait, and if it happens one more time, I will. This time, it's at least five minutes before the next knocks. These were just like the last one, where it sounded like a hammer. Except this time, it was all around my house. It sounded like there were a hundred people banging all at once. The speed at which the bangs were happening was just not something a human could do. At that point, I decided to run to the kitchen to grab a knife. I grabbed my dog and ran up to my room, locking the door. I calmed down for a second and, out of nowhere, my neighbor texts me, asking if I hear the banging too. So at this point, I know I'm not crazy. I decided to call 911 as the knocking was still happening. I'd say a minute later, the knocking stops, and soon after, a few cops came and searched the entire house, yard, and a decent bit of the woods. They looked on the windows and siding for any sort of handprint or any sort of proof that somebody was knocking. Absolutely nothing. Now this is the part that really gets me. Earlier that night it was raining, so the ground was quite muddy. They looked for any sort of shoe print or even an animal print. Absolutely nothing. The only prints they found were their own. Years later, about two weeks ago actually, I was walking through the woods grabbing my motion-activated camera to check the footage. It's about 7 p.m., so it's by no means dark, but it's starting to get a little bit. I'm a decent way into the woods at this point, when I hear this god-awful noise. I don't even know what to call it. It was like a wailing, but it was so loud. It was like oohs and ahs and screeches all mixed together. It sounded like screaming, but higher and more intense. It was horrific. No human could make a noise like that. There was absolutely no way. After that, I hopped on my ATV and gunned it home, not looking back. 
No joke. When I got home, I checked my phone, and the same neighbor that had asked about the knocking years earlier asked me if I had heard screaming while I was in the woods. I have absolutely no idea what this could be, but I know it was real because I wasn't the only one that heard it, and I sure as hell don't want to run into it. Back in 2009, me, my mom, and my stepdad moved into a really old, rustic rural cottage in England. My father had passed away not too long before, and this was going to be a new start for us all. The house was an absolute bargain. It had six bedrooms, two very spacious living rooms, and a huge annex at the back that was essentially a second house. We couldn't work out why it was so cheap. We went for the viewing and the family eventually told us that their elderly mother had passed away there peacefully in the annex and they just needed to get away from the feeling of her. That probably should have been a first red flag. We weren't put off though and we bought the house. From the beginning it was unsettling. My parents didn't see it at first, but I was incredibly uncomfortable there. It was extremely unnerving and cold. Not to mention, it was isolated behind rows of trees and a very long driveway, so far away from anyone else. It started on the first night. My room was at the end of the corridor, and if you came out of my room, on the right was a bathroom and a locked door that led to the annex, the place where the elderly mother had died. My parents slept a long way down the corridor, in the last bedrooms, so I was quite isolated and directly opposite my room were the stairs. This first night, it was freakishly cold. I pulled my blankets up to my head, but after my dad passed away, I had suffered from insomnia for years, so the cold and the anxieties of moving to a new house all added together to create zero sleep. So I ended up laying awake for hours, just sort of staring around the room. My bedroom door was one of those old and mismatched wooden country house doors. It didn't quite reach the carpets, and after a few hours, I could hear the creaking of floorboards directly outside my room, and shadows that seemed even darker than the darkness of the hallway walking past my door. I presumed that one of my parents had gotten up to use the bathroom, at first, but this went on, back and forth back and forth for several minutes and it was fast it was a very brisk walk not to mention next to my door was the locked door to the annex anybody walking at that speed would have hit the door but nothing it freaked me out and had me dreading the next night this kept happening every night for a few weeks and i remember vividly one night i actually left my bedroom door open Around the same time, as always, I heard the creaking. I turned around, and unmistakably, there was a figure, blacker than black, walking forward and backwards in front of the door, just visible in the darkness of the hallway. I couldn't take my eyes off it the entire time it was there. It's safe to say I never slept with the door open again after that night. But this is where things start to get properly creepy. I'd been terrified of this shadow for weeks now. There was a really horrible feeling that I had around it, like it was after me. And one night, as I was going downstairs for dinner, I had the same cold feeling. And for just a second, I froze in place in the dark hallway and looked to my right toward the annex door. And there, sure as anything, and without my sleepy eyes to blame it on, I saw the same black shadow walking directly at me at high speed. I ran downstairs as quickly as I could and I told my parents everything. They mostly laughed it off and didn't believe me and tried to reassure me that ghosts aren't real and there was no chance of anything about this old lady still being in the house. Now, a bit of backstory. This old lady was terrified of the previous owner's family dog, so much so that they had installed a pulley system in the house 
so she could pull a cord from her bedroom that would trigger an old bell to ring in the kitchen if she wanted anything. The whole system was still there when we moved in. And this night, the night after I told my parents, I was woken at around 2.30 in the morning by this bell in the kitchen ringing loudly and repetitively, like it was being pulled firmly and constantly over and over. I ran out into the corridor and my parents were there too, equally as confused and concerned as I was. We all looked at each other with ever increasingly worried expressions and ran downstairs into the kitchen to see what was going on. As soon as we entered the kitchen, it stopped. We ventured up into the annex to see what could have caused this, but nothing, no sign of anyone. And my gosh, I hated it there. It was even colder and more lifeless than the main part of the house, and I just felt like I needed to leave as soon as I could. My parents didn't quite believe that this was a ghost yet, but they were clearly less skeptical than before. From here, any activity became much more obvious. All of us, my parents included, started to hear knocking from the annex door next to my bedroom. Noises from downstairs that sounded like someone was down there moving. Sometimes my fish tank light would flick on and off with an audible click and wake me up. And I would often even wake up to my wardrobe doors being wide open with no breeze in sight. One night, I was sat reading alone in my room and one of these wardrobe doors opened by itself, wide and with relative force. I got up cautiously and closed it, and then I ran downstairs to see my parents. When I came up around 15 minutes later, every single covered door, around a dozen of them, were open as wide as they could go. Lots more went on too. Taps turning themselves on became a particularly regular occurrence, and one night, I awoke to the sound of my cupboard door opening again and saw droplets of water running from the bathroom next to the annex door all the way to a few feet from my bed with no droplets out again. I was terrified. It was around six months after all this had started that we eventually moved out. My grandma had begun to grow unwell and couldn't care for herself anymore and she moved in with us. From the beginning, she hated that house. My grandma was so incredibly sweet and calm, and I've never seen her distressed like she was there. On one night in particular, when I was sat downstairs in the kitchen with her, she took my hand, pointed directly toward the annex, and said, Don't you go in there. I don't like it in there. It's safe to say this scared the crap out of me. On the last night we all spent together in the house, I was awoken by my mom screaming. Clear as day, she said she felt two hands firmly grab her ankles over the bed sheets and pull her down the bed just a few inches. And right there and then she asked to leave. We went to stay in our old house for a while, but because of size, my stepdad, the biggest skeptic among us, stayed in Lilac Cottage for a few more months. He's still quiet to this day about that house. He hates talking about it, but even he admits that there was something incredibly wrong there. And without much warning, he put the house up for sale, selling it so desperately that he lost almost a quarter of the price he paid for it, and he's never told us why. I've promised myself that one day I'll reach out to the current owners of that house and see if they have also experienced anything, but I haven't, at least not yet. My parents rented a house in a remote upstate area, and we moved in when I was 16. I lived there until I was 25. I'm now 31. Slowly, my sisters moved out later than I did, and my parents just moved out like six months ago. Here are a few of the encounters we've had. Every night, my sisters and I would hear footsteps coming up the stairs and going into the bathroom. Every time, we assumed it was one of my parents up for a late night bathroom run, since the only bathroom was in the upstairs area, where the rest of the bedrooms were, and my parents' room was downstairs. 
We eventually realized it wasn't them. Then we'd get up to use the bathroom and wait forever before knocking, only to find out that the bathroom was empty. My dog, who slept in my bedroom, would wake up at the same time every night, always around 3 a.m., and stare and growl at the dark area in my bedroom. My little sister and I, who shared the bedroom, could feel a presence, but we were too scared to look at the shadow. So, while looking at the floor, we would slowly pick up our dog, place him under the covers with us, and just pray that it went away. The main encounters happened in my bedroom. It must have been where it lived, or maybe there were multiple entities. But one time, my younger sister and I redecorated our bedroom and placed a new shoe rack right in front of our bed and lined up our shoes. We both sat down on the bed to look at it from different angles and see if we liked the placement. And a shoe came flying off the rack directly at us. We both booked it and didn't come back for hours. It liked to hide stuff from me, specifically me. I would be doing my makeup and then after I used the foundation or lotion, I would go to put the cap back on and it would just be gone from the vanity. It would happen right in front of me. Or I would spread out my outfit on the bed that I would plan to wear, shower, come to get dressed, and a piece of clothing from the outfit would be gone and nowhere to be found. Now I'm sure you'll think maybe a sister, right, since there were four of us. Well, I thought that too, except that it happened consistently for years. I got used to it. I'd leave a note sometimes in the bathroom for family before I went out, with, for example, my foundation uncapped that said, the elf took my cap, if you randomly find it, please put it back on. That's what I always called it, an elf because of how mischievous it was. Later, I learned to give it gifts. I would place out my outfit or my engagement ring in its box, or whatever else was really important that I wouldn't want to go missing. And I would loudly announce in my empty bedroom, I need this, please don't take it, but I've left you this, for example, an earring, for you to play with while I'm out or asleep or whatever it was. It worked. I read that online, by the way, as I tried to find ways of cohabitating, since financially we couldn't move out. One day, my sisters and I asked the landlord what was in the attic, since there was one that didn't have a ladder to go up to it. And he told us that he didn't know. He'd bought the house as is many years ago and had never been in the attic, so he had no idea what was there, if anything. So I got the bright idea of let's check it out. We got chairs, which we stacked on top of each other while my parents were out, and I was going to check while my sisters held the chairs for me to climb on. Well, I opened the attic door, and all I could see was pitch black. I wasn't even at eye level into the attic yet, just barely could see into it, as I'm pretty short. So my sisters got a flashlight. I turned it on, went to put it on the floor inside to climb in, and poof. It went out immediately. I figured, okay, the battery's dead. My other sister handed me a lit candle to put on the floor so that I could climb in while the other one went to get batteries. And as soon as I placed it on the floor, poof, it got blown out. At that moment, I flipped. I closed the attic as fast as I could, and none of us ever planned on checking again. These are just a few descriptions of our paranormal encounters. My parents either never believed us, or they didn't want to. They never heard anything downstairs and never noticed anything. Until, when we all moved out and they moved into my old bedroom, where my mom would swear that stuff disappeared on her all the time, that lights got turned on and off, the doors open and close and so on. Then the landlord lost the house to foreclosure, and my parents moved out into their own home about six months ago. The haunted house is now abandoned, as nobody has purchased it, and more haunted than ever, I'm sure. I wouldn't take any amount of money to go sleep there for one more night on my own.
When I was a teenager, my family moved into a new house in Ohio. Well, it was new to us. As soon as we moved in, my mother started saying that she felt the house was haunted and that she could sense a presence there. She said she heard somebody call her name and felt somebody put a hand on her shoulder. One time she woke up with somebody holding her feet down and she couldn't shake off whatever it was so she started screaming. She also heard muffled voices. We didn't believe her at all until both my sister and I started experiencing strange things. My first experience was when I was reading a book in my bedroom at 3 a.m. I'm a night owl, so this wasn't that unusual. Everyone should have been asleep, but suddenly I hear very heavy footsteps right outside my bedroom door. They were too heavy to be my mom's or my sister's, so I just assumed that my dad was walking around, checking up on us. I sprinted to the door, and when I opened it, I was shocked to discover the hallway was dark, and nobody was up. Our attic had several feet of fluffy insulation, covering the entire area. There was nothing stored there, but at times you could hear steps coming from the attic, running up to the side of the house, they always ran up to the side with the driveway, as though they were trying to see who arrived, and this happened almost every time that somebody would pull up to the house. In the daytime, it was almost cool, but in the nighttime, it was terrifying. There was always something clicking loudly under my bed and in the closet at night, and I always tried to convince myself it was the air vents. However, all the air vents were on the other side of the bedroom, and they never made clicking noises. I sometimes saw an outline of a person standing next to my bed if my head was covered with a sheet, but when I pulled the sheet off, nobody was there. I heard sighs, as though somebody was standing right behind me, and one time I heard a whisper that said, Come play. I prayed a lot, and that usually helped. I would also ask them to quiet down and that helped as well. One time my boyfriend and I were doing homework in the basement and heard the garage door open and voices of my parents in the kitchen. We ran up to say hi, only to discover an empty house. Another time my boyfriend stayed overnight in our house and he slept in the living room. In the morning he asked if we were all playing a joke on him at night as he kept hearing a ball bounce on the stairwell leading up to the bedrooms on the second floor and in the kitchen. But every time he got up to see what was going on, no one was there. I don't think we even owned a ball and we certainly didn't play with one in the house. One time my mom heard a baby crying outside of our house at night. We lived in a safe and perfectly normal suburb. There was no reason that a baby would be in our backyard. Another day, a lid flew off of a cooking pot and got halfway embedded into the kitchen ceiling. It wasn't a pressure cooker, it was just a regular lid and pot. Another time, we left for a family vacation and my boyfriend was asked to take our paper in. He said that he was in the house and decided to make my bed for me. We had left at the ungodly hour of 5 a.m. and I never got to it. He said at first he got a juice and felt like somebody was breathing down his neck in the kitchen. He kept turning around to find nobody there. Then he walked upstairs, and while he was making my bed, he felt something grab his legs from under it. He got freaked out and ran out of there, and he refused to enter the house again. He just diligently hid the papers behind a flower pot outside until we returned. One night, my sister woke up to a black caped figure standing silently in her room. She said there was also a bright orb near her window. Her windows faced the backyard and trees, and being on the second floor, there was no possible source of light from cars and things like that. She covered her head with the blanket, and when she looked out, the figure and the orb were still there. She went back under the blanket and after some time, they were finally gone. 
One day our cat disappeared without a trace, and we never did see it again. Not sure if that was related. My dad was one person who never experienced anything. No voices, no steps, no TV and radios blasting out on their own. He is hard of hearing, so that could be a factor. But one thing he can't explain is waking up at 4 a.m. next to a lit tea light candle that he swears burnt out at midnight. The candle was right in front of his face, and he's extremely sensitive to light, to the point where he covers any electronic lights with napkins because they disturb his sleep. It eventually got so bad that I refused to sleep in my own bedroom, as I could feel someone move around the room at night, and I slept in my sister's room. My dad decided to call a medium, and the guy said that there were five spirits in the house. A boy, an old lady, a couple, and a very angry man. He gave us a giant candle with a cross and said to burn it in the bedroom of the youngest child, which was now also my bedroom, where I slept in a sofa chair. The candle was in a big glass jar and was hefty. All night it kept shaking, and the glass kept making clicking noises against the counter that it stood on. We were also to tell the spirits that this was our house and that they needed to go to the light. Things improved after the visit and shortly after I moved out to attend college, where I slept for years with the lights on, although I never experienced any paranormal activity in my apartment there. After college, I never stayed in the house for longer than a few days, always sleeping with the lights on, as that creepy feeling remained, although nothing notable happened anymore. Eventually, my parents sold the house. A few years back, one of my best friends and business partner was, and still is, a single dad. His ex-wife was in and out of mental institutions for years, and he had sole custody of his two kids, a boy, age 10, and a girl, age 14. My friend had to travel to New York to oversee the multimedia setup for the auto show for the Ford display. I was back at the office with the programmers during the day, and I would stay with the kids each evening. Their house was a new two-story rental in the Woodlands, Texas. The development was built in a heavily wooded area just north of Houston. Weird stuff started happening the first night I was there. I was watching TV with the kids. The den lights would go off. The light switch was on the other side of the room. I went over and the switch was turned off. I thought it was a problem with the breaker or there was another light switch. But if there was another switch, who turned it off? I flipped the switch on, the lights came back on, and I went back to sit down. The lights went off. I walked back and I found the switch flipped back down to off manually. That disturbed me. This went on for a while. I asked the kids if this had happened before, and they told me that every now and then, the lights would go off. So now I'm trying to act unconcerned in front of the kids. Suddenly, there was a loud crash in the attic. I, we, went upstairs and opened the attic door to check. There was nothing in the attic. It was completely empty, and thus we had no explanation as to what had made the loud noise. I'm thinking that there's someone else in the house. Their mother had shown up unexpectedly before at their old house, but she was in jail at the time and supposedly didn't know this address. Things quieted down and it was eventually time to go to bed. I let the family dog in, a lab, checked all of the doors and made sure they were locked. And then I went up to the guest room, which was between the kids' bedrooms. I left my door cracked and I had just turned the bedside lamp off. As I was laying down, I saw the silhouette of a boy crouched down between the cable box and VCR lights on the other side of the room 
and myself. I thought the sun was getting ready to try to scare me, so I turned the bedside lamp on and said, gotcha, but there was no one there. Then there was another loud crash in the attic. This woke the kids up and now they were scared. We then heard a door slam downstairs. I told them that it was a new house and noises happen. I also told them that I would sleep in the day bed out in the hallway. I made my rounds again and we all went back to bed. When I woke up the next morning, the kids and the dog were all asleep on the floor next to my bed. I still had four more nights to go. The next day, I got to the house as it was getting dark. The wind was starting to pick up and all of the tree limbs were swaying. There was thunder in the distance. However, the kids seemed fine. I helped them with their homework and made dinner. No, we're not going to McDonald's again. And we all finally sat down to watch TV. The storm was worsening and there was more thunder and lightning. The den in the house was huge with large floor to ceiling windows and the walls went all the way to the rafters. There was an interior balcony on the second floor that wrapped around three of the walls. There was an exterior balcony facing the backyard. You could see through the upper windows out to the lower part of the outside balcony. So now the rain is coming down in sheets. The wind is blowing and bursts of lightning are happening everywhere. Suddenly, the daughter says she sees something moving out on the balcony. I look up and it looks like a pair of legs in dark pants scurry past one of the windows. I'm thinking, do I get the gun out of the master bedroom? But that opens up a whole new can of worms. So instead, I run up the back stairs from the kitchen to the second floor hallway and out through the balcony door. The wind is blowing cold rain right into me and I get soaked, but I don't see anyone on the balcony. I go back downstairs and tell them there's no one outside. Shortly thereafter, I tell them it's time for bed. The son goes right to bed and goes to sleep. The daughter is afraid of storms. The dog won't go into her bedroom and her cat is nowhere to be found. I tell her that I will sit with her until she goes to sleep. I bring a chair into her bedroom and set it on the left side of her bed. We talk about storms and I tell her about being in a tent in the army during really bad storms and how nice it is to be in a house for this storm. We both fall asleep. There's a loud clap of thunder, a flash of lightning, and I see a dark figure about five feet tall standing in the far corner of her room. I jump to my feet, but now I don't see anything. I don't want to wake her up, and so I carefully walk around her room and check the hallway. I slowly sit back down. I eventually doze off again. Later, I hear a noise and I started to look around. The cat is curled up on the foot of her bed and the dog is starting to lay down at my feet. The storm has passed and looking outside her bedroom window, stars are shining up above the tree line. I go lay down in the day bed out in the hallway and just as I fall asleep, I hear a door downstairs slam shut. It sounds like the kitchen door to the garage. I go downstairs. The kitchen door, door to the garage, and the front door are all shut and locked. I start to walk over to the master bedroom suite, but something tells me not to go there. I head back upstairs and lay back down. What seems like seconds later, the alarm goes off and it's time to start a new day. I have to get breakfast going and it's my turn to drive school carpool. Most of the days in that house went about the same. All I know for sure is that something was wrong with that house.
My mom bought a house when I was in the second grade. It was built in 1856 or 1857, I'm not entirely sure. The guy who built it was a prominent doctor. He had a few kids, but I don't know a whole lot about him. I do know that over the years, a couple of people died there, mostly him and his kids, but we got the house because the woman living there had lost her sister and she wanted to move into a nursing home. The house was not used to treat patients so far as I know. There was a hospital built maybe 80 yards from us where I'm fairly sure he did most of his work. I know that place is very haunted, but nothing malicious as far as I know. Anyway, I feel like that's enough background on the house. We lived there in the early 2000s. I was six or seven and we moved out when I was 13. We didn't live there a very long time. The house just seemed to be bad luck. We had a dog named Snowball. He was an American Eskimo dog. 20 pounds, fluffy, and white as, well, snow. He would just stare in dark corners a lot, as would my cat. I'd hear my mom call for me a lot, but when I went to look for her, she wasn't even home from work yet, or hadn't called me. A few times, we would be in the kitchen or the living room, and we would hear something digging through my shoe boxes full of Polly Pockets. My bedroom was directly above the living room, and the floor was thin. When we would go upstairs to look for the cat or the dog, they were usually right there in the living room with us. The cat liked to stay under the couch, but when we would investigate, all my dolls and accessories would be thrown about my room, and the door was closed. Snowball liked to chew on my dolls, as he had a gum disease and I guess it felt good, but he really didn't like being alone and his favorite spot was on the green couch, where he would look out and watch the street. He was also old, and only went upstairs when it was cold, and we would all sleep in one room, because he liked the heater. Otherwise, he was downstairs. My cat did the same thing. She was often very close to us. She liked the spot on the red couch where she could watch TV. None of the pets liked going upstairs unless we were there. I spent a lot of time outside, but I also liked to sit in the office. I would play Neopets, RuneScape, and watch videos on various sites. I'd feel like somebody was watching me all the time. I'd turn around, but I was alone. Sometimes when I was outside, I know that my mom was still at work, but in her bedroom, through the window, I would see a man looking down at me. I don't remember being afraid of him, just kind of got used to seeing him. My mom would always say, oh, that's just Dr. Green. I would wave to him and he would just vanish. One night I woke up and somebody was sitting on my bed and it was freezing as they were pulling my blanket down. I woke up mad and then panicked because pulling at my blanket was the man in the window. Then I could smell it. Something was burning. I woke my mom up and we found that the microwave was shorting out and had burnt through the cable and was on the verge of catching fire. After that, I made my grandmom take me to his grave and I'd leave flowers for him there all the time. Dr. Green was a nice ghost. He would just appear and he only woke me that one time to warn us. Then there was Luke. Luke was malicious. He terrorized the pets. It's why they wouldn't really go upstairs. He always appeared in dark corners, and I could never bring myself to walk past him. It felt like if I did, something bad would happen. He was more active, too. Cabinets would fly open, things would fall off shelves, and he would throw things at us. In the dead of night, you could hear heavy boots slowly climbing the stairs. Sometimes the TV would randomly flip channels. You'd hear groans, and he actually attacked us. I regularly had nightmares, and I would wake up with strange bruises and cuts and scratches. This was also happening to my mom. We know his name is Luke because my mom used to record QVC and this sewing channel on the VCR. I think it was QVC, and they were doing some craft thing, but they asked the caller what their name was, and very clearly in a masculine voice, someone says, Luke. 
Then the woman who was actually the caller and was live on the show goes on to say her name and go on about the product. We were only guessing that the friendly ghost was Dr. Green, as the man always appeared in similar clothing to the photos that we had of him, very nice suits and a hat. Luke was dressed in ratty looking clothing and he wore huge boots with spurs. I can still hear his boots clanging up those squeaky steps. Lastly, there was the ghost dog. I love animals, but I hated this dog. It was huge, black, and made me feel sick to my stomach whenever it would appear. And it appeared everywhere, outside the carport, downstairs, upstairs, and especially the cellar. I could hear its toenails clack on the hardwood and I would hide under my blankets. The hair on my arms and neck would raise and I could hear it sniffing me. It makes my skin crawl to think about that dog. If you looked at it, it would growl and vanish, but I only saw it twice. I heard it all the time though. I would also have nightmares about this huge black dog following me around. It was a recurring dream that scared me so much as a kid. I'd be in the yard and there was a creek that ran through it. It went under the road and there were those huge steel cylinders that let the water pass. I could crouch and walk through them, but I'd see the dog there and it was guarding what looked like a kid's body. It would immediately wake me up. I never thought to look up and see if a child had died there. I was a kid and it scared me to even think about it, but I still see that dream vividly. I own a big black lab, Great Dane Mix, and sometimes he gives me flashbacks to that dog. I could go on and on about the odd things that happened. More happened to my mom, and she has weird pictures, videos, even called a priest to cleanse the house, but I don't think it ever helped. It may have, but the people who live there now have fixed up the house a lot. I've been tempted to knock on the door and ask them, but I feel like that would be weird. I drive past the house every time I go visit my grandparents. Also, stepping back on the property makes me feel uneasy. When we were moving out, I was packing my things. Something knocked over my cork board and I was frustrated because it broke. I told whatever it was to leave me alone, that I was leaving. I turned back to what I was packing and then I heard a voice behind me very clearly say, if you come back, I'll kill you. I don't want to take my chances with the paranormal. With a threat like that, I don't want to mess with it, especially as this voice was very different from Luke's. It hissed, it made me feel sick, and made the room very cold as well. Whatever this thing was, I don't want to get to know it and I don't want to tempt fate. This is my experience from Jekyll Island Beach Club, a hotel that I now know is quite infamous for being haunted and frequented by ghost hunters. I've lived in Georgia my entire life. We traveled all around the state growing up, going to conferences that my mother attended for her job. I was around nine years old on this particular trip, so it was about 2003. It was just me, my father, and my mother. We still like to share these stories at family gatherings, and I figured that somebody else might appreciate them too. I will preface this by saying that I was an extremely independent and resourceful child, so my parents let me do my thing on these types of trips and make friends with the other kids also in attendance. So don't get your panties in a bunch about me being left alone in the hotel room for a couple of hours or being allowed to run around the resort with my buds. When we arrived at the hotel, our room immediately creeped us out. Upon opening the door, there was a staircase leading up to our suite. It was spacious, with a dining room, king-sized bed, and wall partially separating the bedroom from a living room area with a pull-out couch. We were just chilling, exhausted from our drive, when we heard the sound of a door creaking open. We looked to our right, 
and the door to what we assumed was the closet was ajar. It wasn't a closet. It was a brick wall. My family and I are Diet Coke fanatics. I used to pound them, even if they were room temperature. Disgusting, I know. After the door incident, I figured I needed a little caffeine, so I went to open a Diet Coke from a 12-pack that we'd bought coming in. Completely flat. Well, that's weird. I tried to open another. Completely flat. Curious. The next day, we tried to open one from the 12-pack we'd left in the car, and it was totally fine. Something had been draining the energy, in this case I guess the carbonation, from all of our belongings. My mom had a sweet blackberry at the time. I used to play that little game where you bounce the ball off that little bar that goes back and forth. You know what I'm talking about. Her blackberry had been charging since we got there and was all the way charged. After the door and the unsuccessful attempt at having a Diet Coke, I figured I would just play a little of that game. I unplugged it, plopped down on the couch, and as soon as I opened the damn game, I watched the battery completely drain and die. No electronics that we brought on that trip would hold a charge. Everything would die as soon as we came into the suite. Later on, sunburned and reminiscing on my day boogie boarding, my parents left me in the suite to go hit up the conference's reception. I whipped out my markers and started drawing when I heard the toilet, which was on the other side of the wall separating my pull-out couch from the master, flush. All right, that's weird. I decided to lay in my parents' bed and watch the toilet to see what the hell was going on. About 15 minutes later, I watched, wide-eyed, as the handle on the toilet went down and it happened again. My nine-year-old brain was trying to make logical sense of this. I was freaked out, but not frightened. I do believe to this day that they were friendly ghosts. I decided to migrate back to my pull-out bed. Another 30 minutes go by and I've chalked it up to being nothing. And then it does it again, followed by the laughter of what sounded like children my age. I rolled over and covered my head until my parents got back. The next night I was on my pull-out bed playing possum and pretending to sleep whilst pondering all the strange shit that had gone down. It was about 11.30 p.m. That's when I started hearing footsteps above us. It sounded like several people were running above the room. Problem was, we were on the top floor. My parents, who think I'm asleep, start freaking out and whispering, holy shit, back and forth. Then, there was a knock at our door. My dad yelps and my mom bursts out laughing at his reaction. They go down the staircase together to answer the door like two teenagers. They still think I'm asleep. It was a hotel security dude who says, we've received several complaints about kids playing up here can you please tell your children to keep it down as our guests are trying to sleep? My parents respond with, We only have one kid and she's asleep upstairs. He responds with, Oh. Listen, I'm going to be honest. I can't say this is the first time something like this has happened. The next day, my mom was in some workshops and I wanted to hit up the pool and chill with some of my friends. The same group of kids always showed up to these conferences. Our parents are all judges, senators, legislators, or lobbyists. While I was at the pool, my dad decided to play a round of golf. At one point, I tried to go back to the room real quick to get something. I whipped out my room key, which was a literal key, but I couldn't get the door open. I went to the front desk and an employee walked me back to the room to try to let me in. It turned out the deadbolt, the ones in hotel rooms that can only be locked from the inside, had somehow been placed. Not exaggerating, they ended up having to take the door off the hinges so my family and I could get back in. Up until this point, all of these occurrences were just weird, and none of them were particularly frightening. There were only two days left of the trip. I fell asleep that night with no issue, but I woke up to what felt like somebody was getting onto the pull-out bed. I thought it was just my mom or dad, so I rolled over. But no one was there. All right, now I'm actually feeling trepidation. I slam my eyes shut, but I have a distinct feeling that somebody is watching me. I laid motionless for probably an hour, afraid to move or call out to my parents, who were asleep on the other side of the wall. Then, a loud bang. One of those noises that jolts you and reflexively forces your eyes open. 
There was a tall figure, probably at least eight feet, at the foot of my bed in a black hood. I couldn't see its face. I started screaming and hid under the covers. My parents rushed over, comforting me as I'm crying and terrified. We then all three heard a laugh, this time of an adult, followed by loud footsteps overhead. I was done after this, and so were my parents. We packed up our stuff and left in the middle of the night, and my mom missed the last day of the conference. I still see some of the friends that I made on those trips, and they all have their own stories from that particular conference at Jekyll Island Beach Club. One of them, a judge's son, had lucked out and gotten to stay out in the lighthouse suite. He and his father had taken us to see it, and it was incredible. Spiral staircase leading up to the top where the actual suite was. His stories of our time spent at the resort are the most terrifying. Needless to say, I will never go back. My mom recently had a conference there and refused to stay on the resort grounds, opting to stay at another hotel down the road. I write in a daily journal, and I have now typed out this experience from 2017 to 2019. I hope you enjoy it. So in November of 2017, I was in the end stages of my pregnancy. Our apartment was heated by a gas fireplace, and stupidly, the carbon monoxide detector was in an adjacent room with the door closed. It wasn't until the door opened that my husband and I were aware that I was slowly being poisoned. I was sent to the hospital. While on oxygen, I went into labor and thus began a very horrible ordeal. I could elaborate, but for the sake of the story, I'll skip that. Anyway, three things happened. Number one, my daughter was born. Number two, something latched onto me while I was in the ER for the poisoning. And number three, my husband took a job out of state to support us while getting his career going, a week after I left the hospital. The whole time I'm in the maternity ward, I'm having issues sleeping. Insomnia is common for me, so I didn't think too much about it. However, every time I started to sleep, I would wake up from a panic attack. This went on for the entire week that I was there and for about a week after coming home. Eventually, I was able to start sleeping, but then things started to happen. I lived in the apartment for three years prior with no incidents, but onward from week two of coming home, the following happened, based on my journal entries. November 22nd of 2017. Whispering coming from the audio baby monitor. This is a common occurrence from this point forward. December 8th. The first unusual cold spot found. Living room was always about 20 degrees warmer than the rest of the apartment because the heater was there, but suddenly it was freezing in one spot of the room. It was never cold there again. December 11th. The baby mobile's battery drained rapidly. This also became common. First set of batteries lasted a month. All following batteries died within 72 hours was eventually moved to my mother's house, where the mobile operated as intended. January 3rd, 2018. Never felt comfortable being in the house. Felt cold no matter where I was. Started living in my mother's house to avoid being in my apartment. February 17th. Mother's landlord threatens to up my mother's rent if I don't leave. I return home was greeted with a horrible stench and was forced to clean my whole house top to bottom to get rid of it. Daughter starts to scream in her sleep. This occurs about once a week. I can't wake her, but she's screaming. Doctors find nothing wrong. April 1st, husband returns home. Everything stops happening. I feel like I'm crazy because no one has witnessed this but me. He gets a job at home. Everything seems fine. We live happily. August 6th, while outside on the balcony, the door handle that I had just used with no problem breaks, trapping me outside. While trying to climb down from the second floor, 
I fall, break my back, and end up hospitalized. My aunt moves in to help with my daughter while I recover. Months later, my aunt confesses that from day one of being there, she felt like someone was watching her and was often cold. I was drugged up for two months while recovering, so I don't have much to say. October 27th, we decided to move my daughter into her own bedroom before her birthday. We had the baby monitor, a blanket, and a bag sitting on the coffee table when we all stepped outside, my husband, my aunt, my daughter, and I, to see our friend in the parking lot. When we returned, the baby monitor was sitting on the floor, three feet away, in an upright position. This is when my husband believed me about what I said happened while he was gone, and my aunt confesses her issues. October 29th. A doll that had been sitting on a shelf in my daughter's room is sitting upright in the middle of the living room the next morning. My daughter could not reach it or leave her crib. My aunt was sleeping on the couch and heard no one in the night. November 2018 to July 2019. I'm grouping this together because there's too much stuff in the journal. Basically, the house went haywire. I have several days where multiple entries occur. Thumping, lights flickering, bad odors, cold spots, toys turning on by themselves, objects moving, whispering, and my daughter develops nightmares on an almost nightly basis. March 9th, our friend W comes to visit. In a very disturbing way to greet her, the word hello is written on the bathroom mirror from a marker that originated from a separate room. This isn't her first dealing with hauntings, so she replies with, hello, who are you? Later, it replied with, Rick. June 14th, our friend L asks to use our apartment to host a party for an MLM she was a part of. 30 plus people show up throughout the night. One who has never stepped foot in our apartment prior commented that the bathroom light kept turning on and off the whole night, even when nobody was in there. June 29th, my mother and her boyfriend come to visit. Everyone was drinking and goofing off. Suddenly, the boyfriend demands to go home and leaves without explanation. Later, my mother informs me that he saw a black mass floating around the ceiling, hovering around me, and moving like it was pulling something out of me. He convinces my mom to have a cleansing done. July 1st, evening. My mother, with the aid of her boyfriend and guidance from his friend, performed a cleansing, drawing everything out of the main door. My daughter screamed the whole time this was happening, but immediately fell asleep once it was over. The house felt still, like it was frozen in time until sunrise. July 2nd, morning. A black handprint was found on the roof outside our stairs. Context, I lived in a multifamily home. The stairs to the second floor were outside because the second floor is a separate apartment. From then on, we didn't have anything else happen. We moved out in June of 2020. Two months after my daughter asked me why we no longer lived in old house, I told her why and that we were not moving back there. She replied with, good, Mr. Black was scary. He wanted to eat my face. So when I was about 15 to 16, my neighbor asked my sister, we'll call her Cassie, and I if we could stay at her large sensory house while she was on a business trip for two weeks. Having been close to our neighbor and loved her dog and kitty, we said, of course. Cassie slept in the master bedroom and I stayed in the second bedroom upstairs, which is connected to the attic. Now, Cassie and I always loved creepy stuff always watching ghost adventures every Friday night, and we shared a lot of personal paranormal experiences together. We would always open the small attic door and mess around, saying we should go in there. I'm glad we never did. One night, Cassie stayed next door while I was at the neighbor's. 
I was sitting on the couch with the dog and kitty next to me, watching TV. My neighbor has one of those alarm systems where if you open an entrance door, a little beep goes off. I heard the beep and didn't really react, expecting to see my sister or mom walk in to come hang out. After a minute of waiting to hear something or for someone to come in, nothing happened. I called out for Cassie, but no answer. I messaged my mom and asked if it was her, but she wasn't even home. What scares me is the beep goes off for any door, meaning it could have been the front door that was maybe five feet from me on the other side of the wall. I brushed it off so I didn't get too scared and continued watching TV. Except after about 30 minutes, I started hearing footsteps above me, which would have been the master bedroom. I look to my left and see the dog. I look to my right and see the cat, so it couldn't have been them. I turned the TV down and listened some more, and it sounded like the footsteps just paced back and forth. I had my sister come over and spend the night with me that night. The next day, I went to my neighbor's right after school, and I saw the basement door was open. Odd, but I closed it and went about my day. I started to clean her dining room and moved chairs away from the table to sweep underneath it. I remembered that the broom was upstairs, so I ran up really quickly to grab it, and as I came back down to the dining room, one of the chairs was pushed into the stairway entrance, blocking me in. Again, I just brushed it off and pushed it back. Except once I started sweeping, I felt something almost rush up behind me, so much so that I dropped the broom and ran my butt next door to my parents. The last few days consisted of random stuff moving, doors opening, and lights being on while we were at school. When my neighbor got back home, she paid us, thanked us, but then asked if anything weird had happened. I explained everything to her and she sort of laughed and said, yeah, that happens a lot. I didn't want to tell you girls beforehand in case it would deter you from staying there. She also mentioned I slept in the most haunted room in the house, the second bedroom upstairs with the attic. I brought up the basement door, but that's where her vibe changed. She said that's the one place in her house she won't mess with because it just scares her that much. Needless to say, after those two weeks, I sort of avoided going there. For a few years, at least. Then, after I graduated high school and moved out of my parents, my neighbor offered a room in her house for me to stay, and I said yes. So after I moved in, she let me stay in what she called the piano room, which had a piano in it that came with the house. She took the piano out and moved it into the garage so I actually had room for my stuff. For the first few nights, I definitely felt weird vibes. Maybe it was just because I am biased and had weird stuff happen to me years before, but I always believed I could send supernatural stuff ever since a young age. Basically, the vibes were off. I would wake up in the middle of the night, hearing what sounded like piano keys, but just enough to wake me up, and that was it. A few weeks later, I got myself a cat. I still have her to this day, and she's my sweet baby. Anyway, she would react and stare at things that were invisible to me. And while I know that cats can be weird, I know animals are sensitive to the paranormal. So I got freaked out any time she would meow or paw at something that wasn't there. While my neighbor still lived in and owned the house, she was constantly away on business trips or stayed at her mom's house. At this point, her dog passed away and she had her cat at her mom's house, which is why she had offered me a room, so the house wasn't always empty. I would hear so many strange noises at night coming from the master bedroom and in the kitchen. I remembered a weird one from the kitchen. It's sort of hard to make a good visual, but I'll try. So the basement door was actually next to the fridge, but the door was blocked by my neighbor's dishwasher so that nobody could get in or out unless the dishwasher was moved. I'm standing looking through the pantry, back facing the basement door, and in the reflection of the pantry door, I saw the basement door open up ever so slightly. I swear it felt like a horror movie. I whipped around, locked the basement door, and went to my room. 
My neighbor and I ended up having many conversations about the weird stuff. She didn't go into a lot of detail about her experiences, but my mom said she told her a few and was genuinely scared and that I shouldn't ask her anymore. I also just remembered another one from a few years before I moved in. I was out sitting by our sandbox in the backyard and I saw out of the corner of my eye, my neighbor go down to her driveway and take her garbage cans back up to the house. And you know that sound of a garbage can dragging along a gravel driveway? Distinct for sure, right? Anyway, I heard the sound stop right by her garage. I looked up to wave, but no one was there. I assumed maybe she had gone inside or something. But then when I went inside for the day, my mom said that my neighbor was going to be home late and asked if I could take her trash cans up to the house. I froze dead in my tracks. I swore up and down that I heard and saw someone doing it already. But my mom chalked it up to the heat of the summer getting to me. That's one I'll never forget. Another thing I should mention that always seemed eerie to me is that my neighbor constantly tried to sell the house. A family would buy it, but would move back out so quickly. This happened for years and years. The listing price wasn't expensive either, especially for being a big home in a decent area of town. As I got older, I now think that the aura of the house is just off and it made everyone move out. Eventually she ended up selling it again and the current residents have stayed there the longest. I grew up in the countryside, literally in the middle of nowhere in Ireland. The house was originally a small cottage. My parents bought it before I was born, and they renovated it and added an extension. There were five other houses on our country road, the closest being a large field away. I don't know much about the history of our house, the land that it was built on, or the history of the area, other than an elderly lady lived in the cottage before my parents bought it, and she passed away in a nursing home. The only info that I have about the area is that it was old and it was a civil parish. Civil parishes are units of territory in the island of Ireland that have their origins in the old Gaelic territorial divisions. Some other things worth noting before I get into the experiences. Behind our house across a newly built road was an old graveyard and the ruins of an old church enclosed in a stone wall. When I say old, I mean the gravestones were tipping over, sinking into the ground, and you couldn't read the writing on them anymore. You could see the graveyard from my window and my brother's window. On top of that, when they built that road, they built it when I was a kid as a new main road into town, archaeologists discovered signs of an early medieval monastery, the site dating back between the 6th and 9th century. They also found some old signs of medieval settlements, some artifacts like tools and things like that relating to the time period, as well as undated burial activity, that's how they put it. Some scattered human bones and the remains of bones of a boy that they think was probably around seven years old were also found. In the field right next to our house, there were also the ruins of what looked like a small cluster of old stone houses. and. There was something similar further down the road. Whenever we get together as a family, we always end up talking about the house and what we experienced. We moved out six years ago. I don't know who or what it was, but there was definitely more than one ghost or spirit. It seemed like there were a lot. I don't know if it has anything to do with the graveyard or what they found or the house or the land itself. I really don't feel like it was the woman that lived there before us either. My mom, dad, two brothers, myself, obviously, and friends that stayed over all experienced something or just got a weird vibe. Funny enough, almost everything that happened happened in the new or built on part of the house rather than in the old part. And stuff happened outside too. I would often feel like there was someone in my room and I don't know why, but I felt like it was a man. 
I would never chill in my room alone, and I would dread nighttime coming to go to sleep. I just felt like somebody was there. I heard what sounded like someone walking around. Not footsteps, but just like the movement of someone. I often felt like I was being watched, inside and outside. Fair enough that it could have just been my imagination or me freaking myself out as a kid, but on multiple occasions I heard what sounded like children talking and playing, but then nobody would be there. On one occasion I heard what sounded like a choir singing in the direction of the graveyard and church, and on another occasion I heard what sounded like drums being played, like this weird repetitive rhythm, almost like a chant. It's hard to describe. Another time, I was outside playing near the side of the house. I was kneeling down, and it was as if somebody had thrown a small stone or pebble, not at me, but in my direction from behind. We had stone clippings in our garden, so I figured it was that. I heard the stone land as if somebody had thrown it, and it happened three times within like 20 seconds of each other. I turned around to see who might want my attention, but nobody was there. Another time, I went to bed really early when it was still bright out. I remember this so vividly, I can even remember the duvet cover that I had on. So, I was laying down, wide awake, and it felt as if somebody poked me pretty hard. It was like a strong index finger poking in my lower back. I kind of froze, felt freaked out didn't turn around and just convinced myself that it was the paw of one of my teddy bears. I didn't think about it again until years later. From the living room window, my brother saw a man in a hat smoking a cigarette, standing outside leaning against the wall near the front door. He got up like, who the hell is that? Went outside, but nobody was anywhere near us and he didn't hear anybody run away. You could hear people move even the slightest bit on the stone chippings. Which brings me to my next point. A couple of times, my mom heard someone knock on the back door, but when we went to answer it, nobody was there. She never heard them walk or run away. Another time, she saw the silhouette of someone, again smoking, through the window of the back door, as if they were standing just outside the door. As usual, though, nobody was there. On a couple of occasions, she felt as though somebody was sitting in the back of the car with her when she left our house to go to the shop in the late evenings. The feeling was so strong that she would keep looking in the mirror. A couple of times she even stopped the car and looked under the seats just to make sure nobody was there. My dad, who was a full-on skeptic, saw a black shadow down the end of the hall go from one side to the other. My brother felt like somebody had touched his foot in bed and on a couple of occasions heard what sounded like somebody walking down the hallway and stopping outside his door, as though they were going to come in, but hesitated. He would call out to see who it was, but nobody ever answered, so it wasn't any of us. He would also see the hallway lights being turned on and off, and when he was outside around the back garden, he would get this sudden urge or feeling like he should go inside and he would run in like there was imminent danger. This is weird because I used to feel that way too. Our dog stared and barked at nothing a few times, and a friend of mine that stayed over hated when she had to wake up to use the bathroom in the middle of the night because she said she felt like somebody was watching her from the end of the hallway. I would love to hear any of your thoughts as to what might have been going on in my house. I've been wanting to tell this story for a while. It all happened back in April of 2016. I was 28 years old and I was traveling with my parents and my younger brother to visit relatives in Hong Kong. We always stayed in this area called Sha Tin as it was easy for us to navigate the public transport to all the places that my relatives lived from there. Mum found a really good deal for a 10 day stay at a hotel in the area. It was a hotel that we had stayed at years ago and while it was not as convenient as our usual place, it was a ridiculously good value for a four-star hotel. We arrived in the late afternoon or evening and checked in as normal. 
The first thing I noticed when we walked into the room was it was a little bit shabbier than I had expected for a four-star hotel. When you walk in, on your left is one of those closets where you can hang up your coats and stuff. About two steps ahead, on the right, is the bathroom, and opposite that is a little nook where there's a teapot, tea and coffee, and the mini fridge, things like that. From there, the room opens up to a double bed and two single beds, plus a TV, a typical setup of a slightly larger hotel room. As soon as I walked in, I noticed the closet light kept flickering on and off, even while the closet door was closed. I didn't really think much of it because the room looked pretty old, and I figured it was just badly maintained. So, having gotten off a long flight, I really needed to pee, so I headed straight for the bathroom. When I stepped in, I was shocked to discover that the lighting in the bathroom had this horrible greenish tinge. The bathroom was a bit worse for wear, but not unusable. The corners were all dark and grimy, like they hadn't been cleaned for a while. And there was a slate loose in the ceiling that looked like somebody had kicked it in. With the greenish light, it had a really strong horror movie vibe about it. To top it off, as I did my business and while washing my hands, I had this distinct feeling of being watched. Not just watched from a distance, but it felt as if somebody was standing really close behind me, with their head next to mine. Being tired, I told myself that I was just imagining things. I finished up and I walked out. It felt so creepy, though. I found myself literally shaking it off as I walked out. My brother went in after me, and he came out shortly after. And when he did, he gave me a look that said, What the hell? Realizing he was as creeped out as I was, I nodded and simply said, I know, right? We both decided there was something off about the bathroom. But considering that our parents seemed fine with it, and we were only going to be there for a few days, we just shrugged it off. Yes, it felt a little creepy, but I figured that if we left it, whatever it was, alone, then it would leave us alone. How bad could it be? The next few days were okay. Outside of the bathroom, everything felt normal. My plan was pee as quickly as possible, shower as quickly as possible, and stay the hell away from the bathroom unless absolutely necessary. The worst thing was really that the bathroom had this huge mirror that ran all the way from the entrance to the bathtub and shower. You could see yourself in the mirror at all times. Every time I washed my hands or showered, I just had this overwhelming feeling that something invisible was staring back at me through the mirror. I can't explain it, but I just felt like if I didn't keep my guard up, at some point if I looked away and looked back, I would see something that might scare the life out of me. One day, after we came back from shopping for gifts, I was super excited because we had shopped for baby clothes for my cousin's daughter who was about to be born. We were taking photos of all the clothes and toys we had bought, and then I realized I needed to use the bathroom. As usual, I threw open the door and walked in, but I was practically floored because the green lighting was gone. The bathroom looked and felt super normal. I wasn't scared and I didn't feel creeped out. The mirror, everything felt fine. It was totally normal. I thought, oh my gosh, I really am nuts. Did I imagine everything the whole time? It was great. I finished up and went back outside to fuss over the presents some more. At some point, my brother was peering at the air conditioner control. He said, um, did you change the temperature? Confused, I responded, no. Mom? Dad? He asked. They both shook their heads. He called us over and, startled, we noticed that somehow the temperature had been set to something ridiculously low like 11 or 13 degrees Celsius. My mom brushed it off as faulty and set it back up to 18 again. The key point here though is that I have really bad asthma, which is triggered by cold temperatures and dry air. 
so we never set the air conditioning that low. My brother and I exchanged looks again, but we didn't say anything. On the way out to dinner that night, we were on the train, and my brother and I finally decided to tell our parents. But horrifyingly, the situation was much worse than I expected. Turns out that while I had just been feeling creeped out, my brother had had an entirely different experience. He said that on the first day, yes, he felt the same as me, like he was being watched. But on top of that, while he was showering, he thought he heard me call him by his nickname. Only our family calls him that. He actually answered, what? And when I didn't respond, he felt scared and semi-clarified, what? And used my name. Nothing. When he told us this, I vehemently denied ever calling out to him when he was showering. He said it sounded like I was just on the other side of the door. I told him my entire plan there was to stay away from that bathroom at all times. I didn't even hover at the kettle area, simply because it freaked me out so much to even be close to it. So there was no way I was going to stand outside and call to him. Then the next day, he saw what looked like muddy, dark, bare feet footprints next to the toilet. It freaked him out, but as we had decided to just sort of live with it for the next few days, he didn't say anything. Finally, the night before, he was showering, and when he glanced away and then back at the mirror, he saw a young woman with long, dark hair standing right next to the toilet in the mirror. He reflexively shut his eyes and said something to the effect of, Please stop that. It's really scaring me. He opened his eyes and it was gone. He also explained that he had this strong feeling that the woman had once hidden under the space in the bathroom bench, which gave both of us the creeps. In retrospect, my parents and I started realizing a lot of weird things about the room and the behavior of the staff all around us. Realization number one, everyone knew but us. For example, one day we were pretty tired and we decided to just chill at the hotel until late afternoon. The cleaner came by and we mentioned that we were happy for her to just collect the used towels and leave new ones in the bathroom. This lovely middle-aged lady walked in and was friendly enough, albeit a little shy. We were all within view, but because the bathroom door was closed, Mom said to her, Oh, it's okay. There's no one in there. The cleaner nodded, and weirdly, despite hearing my mom explain this already, she knocked on the door before entering. My parents and brother and I looked at each other, a little confused. Language was definitely not an issue. We speak the same language and had spoken with her previously. She left after giving us our daily bottled water refills and towels, and that was that. The daily bottle refreshes and the housekeeping was also weird. The bed always looked like they were made up really quickly, not with the usual type of care that you would get at these hotels. The refilled bottles were never set on the bedside tables like they are usually, but just dumped near the kettle, closer to the door. At the time, we figured it was because the room was so cheap. Every morning when we left the room, any staff nearby would stare weirdly at us and smile awkwardly. This is pretty weird for Hong Kong hotels, because we don't look different. Usually they just kind of ignored you, and it's not like we were staying in some VIP room or anything. I always thought we were just giving off heavy foreign-born Chinese vibes or something, but thinking back, I think they were looking to see if we were acting funny, because they knew the room was dodgy. Realization number two, it was listening to us. When it called out to my brother, it wasn't by his real name. It was by the nickname we call him. Literally nobody else calls him that. Also, we had mentioned a few times in the conversations we had about how we had to make sure the air conditioning wasn't too low because of my asthma. It was summer in Hong Kong and incredibly humid. So my brother had joked a few times about how setting the air conditioning super low would feel better but might kill me. Realization number three, defying technology. The hotel air conditioning control does not go below 17 degrees Celsius. 
Most air conditioners don't in our experience. So when we saw the setting in the room, it made no sense. My brother said the reason he walked over there was because when I went into the bathroom, he swore he saw out of the corner of his eye a white mist hover near the air conditioning controls. When he walked over and noticed the incredibly low setting, that's when he asked us about it. After listening to us, my mom went white as a sheet. She and dad decided that we would ask for a room switch immediately. It was the calling out to my brother and the air conditioning that freaked her out the most. In Chinese folklore, there are legends about ghosts wanting company, and they would lure people to accidental deaths by scaring them or calling out to them. She was afraid that the ghost was trying to latch on to my brother, considering he was the only one who saw or heard her. Mom also had a theory that given that I'm super protective of my family, it may have decided that I was in the way or that I had pissed it off somehow. We figured that unknowingly, my excitedness and cheerfulness had offset some of the energy in the bathroom that day, knocking it out of its territory, which was why I suddenly felt like everything was normal in the bathroom. I had accidentally knocked her out of it or something. So because I pissed it off, it turned down the air conditioning as an attempt to mess with me. When we went back and told the front desk we wanted to switch rooms, the young man at the desk looked slightly uncomfortable. Mom just explained, we're just very uncomfortable with the room. Look, we'd really like to change rooms now. We're only here for a few more days, so if we can't, we're happy to just check out now. The guy didn't even look surprised. Weirdly, without asking another question, he told us he would change our rooms. He would give us a new key to a different room on a different level. And he explained that once we were cleared out of our old room to just come back and give him the key. To us, that was super weird, especially because he didn't even question it, nor did he offer to come up with us or check or anything, but we didn't care. We went upstairs and packed up all of our stuff. By this stage, I was freaking out inside a little bit because the gravity of what my brother had told us was sinking in. I told my parents to leave anything that didn't belong to us in the room. I'd watched enough movies to know that these things attach themselves to objects, right? So I was like, leave the water bottles, leave the toiletries, we can get new ones. I even left my personal toothbrush in there. I wanted nothing that had stayed in that bathroom for a prolonged period of time with it. We checked into the room upstairs, and we were shocked to realize that everything we suspected seemed to be true. This room was exactly the same structure, but it was so much neater. The bathroom lighting was normal, still old and a little dirty, but not creepy at all. The refill water bottles were neatly placed on the bedside tables, with the hotel cardboard tags attached. The other room had none of these nice finishes. The beds were made properly, tucked in corners and everything. We realized that the other room must have been known as a haunted room, so the cleaners would just rush to tidy up, dump whatever they needed to dump, and leave as quickly as possible. It also explained why the cleaner insisted on knocking on the door to our bathroom first before entering. In Chinese folklore, it's polite to announce yourself before you walk into a ghost's territory by knocking on the door first. The theory is that if they don't want to mess with you, they'll have the opportunity to leave or hide. Horrifyingly, Mum realized that she had accidentally left one of the drinking bottles from the other room in her handbag. Calmly, she wrapped it up in some Buddhist beads she carried with her everywhere and explained, we'll throw it out tomorrow somewhere, don't worry. I was still a little scared, but my brother was just happy we had left our other room. That night, while we slept, for no reason at all, I woke up. I had my back to the entry hallway of the room. I could see my brother in the bed next to mine and I could hear both of my parents breathing and snoring in their sleep in the bed behind me. Despite this, I could feel someone watching me from the hallway. I was wide awake and so scared out of my mind I could barely move. I remember being very aware of my own breathing. I told myself I was just traumatized and that if I just turned around, I would see that there was nothing there and that there would be nothing to be afraid of. So. 
I lifted myself off the bed a bit and turned. There, standing in the darkness, I saw a silhouette of a person, medium height, standing right next to my mom's handbag where the bottle was. I turned quickly around and pulled my covers up over my shoulders and slammed my eyes shut. I don't know how, but somehow I fell asleep. When we woke up in the morning, we went out for breakfast. Mom threw the bottle out in one of the shopping center bins, and after that, nothing weird happened. This was one of the most frightening things I've ever experienced, and the residual effect of this meant that I kept running into all these weird things for the next two years. Luckily, never something as bad as that again, though. For reference, this place was called the Regal Riverside Hotel. I think we were on level 8, and after we were moved to 9. Neither of us remembers the exact room number. I think a big part of me blocked it out. A lesson we learned from this was that the cliché is true. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. There was a very good reason why that room was so cheap. I'd rather pay more money than ever have this happen again, and it's the last time I will ever stay silent about a creepy hotel room. Any sign of weirdness and I will change rooms immediately. What is it about mirrors that make them so creepy? I can't figure it out, but I do have a true personal story involving one from my childhood. I grew up in a small town in the Piedmont region of Virginia. Rolling country hills, one high school, everyone was your neighbor, that sort of thing. It was me, my mother, my father, and my brother. And just for the purposes of the story, my brother is six years older than me. Well, my town was pretty small, as I said. So small that my family, my grandmother and her husband, and my great-grandmother and her husband all lived in three separate houses, about a mile apart from each other. Once my great-grandfather died in 1989, my grandma moved in with her mother to help take care of her, as she was getting old in years herself. This didn't bother my grandma, as she and her husband's house was only 500 feet down the gravel road. I don't remember too much about my great granny. I just remember that she was always very grumpy, and that she would always yell at my brother and I when we would go over to her house to play. My brother and I would do this because our house was very small, and our great granny's house was big, an open Cape Cod style house with plenty of room to run around and spread out our toys. When my great granny passed away in the first week of February 1994, it took a toll on my family, because within that same week, my grandfather passed away as well. This means that my grandma lost her mom and her husband, both within about five days time. I also should mention that my great granny was on hospice care, and she died in the comfort of her home, in her chair surrounded by her family. As I grew on in age, about 8 to 10 years old, I started to retain a better memory about that house, and how honestly creepy it was. The upstairs in particular, as my brother and I were ever really allowed up there. This became especially true since my grandma ended up selling her and her husband's house down the gravel road, and permanently living in this one. And due to the trauma of losing her mother and husband in one week, she developed a pretty bad hoarding habit. Sometimes when my brother and I were visiting, my grandma would be occupied with her Avon downstairs, and we would sneak upstairs to snoop through all the four cluttered rooms. But one room up there always caught my attention. I found myself feeling very lightheaded whenever I would go near it, and sometimes, Feelings of unease or dread would overcome me. It was just your normal room, very small, hardwood floors, and only a twin bed and a small dresser, and a lot of junk. Like old Christmas boxes, Avon products, and my great-granny's worn clothes, 
But over in the corner of the room, right beside the small crawl-in storage area, was a mirror. I always found myself strangely attracted to this mirror for some reason. It gave me an eerie sort of feeling, one that I can still very much recall to this day. I often caught my brother giving it a strange glance every now and then, too. It wasn't until I started seeing this mirror in my dreams that I began to question its history and why my consciousness was showing it to me in my sleeping state of mind. The dreams were very vivid, and as frightening as they were, I never questioned during the dream itself what was happening or why I was there. I sort of felt like I was there for a reason. They all started with me standing on the porch of the house, staring at the door. It was nighttime and quiet all around me with a slight breeze. A very warm and comfortable summer night. The dream progressed with me making my way into the house, except something was a bit off. I was floating, and whenever I would enter a room inside, the door would open for me. All the lights were off inside, but I could still see from the full moon eerily casting its bright light through the open windows, the outside breeze making the curtains dance around inside. Everything seemed to be in slow motion. I make my way upstairs where I'm guided each time to the same room with the mirror. This is the part of the dream where I sense an impending feeling of doom. I make my way in front of the mirror, but oddly enough, I never see my reflection. I'm forced to stare at it, when all of a sudden an apparition of my great granny appears. Her skin looks gray and cold, her eyes dark and hollow. The uneasy feeling grows more and more as I start to realize that I am now aware that I'm dreaming. I'm scared to death and I need to wake myself up, somehow. Then, all of a sudden, the image in the mirror turns truly sinister. Her mouth widens and her eyes glow a deep shade of red, and she lets out the most terrifying scream. This is when I wake up, covered in sweat. I had that exact dream a very many number of times growing up, but I never knew its significance, if there was any at all. I never told anyone, not even my grandma. Fast forward to about four years ago in 2012. My grandma lost her battle to cancer on Mother's Day. My family and I took part in the huge responsibility of cleaning up that house, as we had plans to sell it and move to San Antonio, Texas, where we currently are. The dream had escaped me for some time. I hadn't had it in about 10 years. But when my brother and I, now in our 30s, had the duties of cleaning out that room, the eeriness of it all returned to me. We had a lot of fun times up here, snooping around, didn't we, little brother, he said. I don't remember too much of it, but yeah, fun times, I said. My brother lifts his finger and points. Hey, do you remember that mirror right there? Yeah, I said. It was always really creepy to me, but um, why do you ask? To which he replied, just wondering. I'm not sure if you ever knew, actually, but that mirror was our great granny's favorite mirror from her childhood. And it just so happens that right below that mirror, directly parallel to downstairs, is the chair that our great granny died in. As if that didn't make my skin crawl enough, he pauses for a quick second, smiles, and with a bit of a confused look, he says, you know, for some reason, I used to have the strangest dreams about that mirror. I grew up in a large, dark, and damp cliché of what everyone pictures a haunted house would look like. For more than a hundred years, the house has loomed on top of a hill lined with foreboding oak trees, where murders of crows would frequently stop. I have an older sister, seven years older, who was a problem child and very into the occult, demons, and devil-worshipping. She would terrify my younger brother and I with stories, 
and just the general way that she would look at us blankly. When she turned about 13, she became even more rebellious. She would run away and be missing for weeks or months. She was the one who originally introduced my brother and I to the Ouija board. My mother was an alcoholic, mentally ill woman, and she was in charge of watching us kids while my dad worked the night shifts, and many times double shifts. To say that our home had a bad energy would be an understatement. We would later learn the dark history of our home from the 90-year-old woman across the street. Mrs. Looker told us that our home was built as a home for unwed mothers. Many births and deaths happened there over the years. It served that purpose for about 20 years until it was forced to be shut down, and then it was sold to a family who lived there until 1970, when my father bought it for an unbelievable price. He still lives there today. The first prefacing experience is one that I only very vaguely remember, but my mom has told me in full detail many times, and my dad, who doesn't believe in ghosts, also corroborates. My mom was outside sunbathing, and my sister was inside with a friend of hers. I went into the kitchen and grabbed a butter knife and was holding it in a fist, with the top pointed to the ground, when I slowly walked into the living room where my sister was playing with her friend. I had a blank look on my face and was shaking, and I kept repeating, Mommy needs help. She's fighting the devil across the street in a tunnel. My sister yelled for my mom, and she came into the house and asked me what was wrong. And I just kept repeating, Mommy needs help. She's fighting the devil across the street in a tunnel. My mom kept shaking me and telling me that she was right there and to snap out of it. She said I was in that state for about an hour, where I was just staring off into nowhere, repeating the same thing. I finally snapped back into reality and started acting normally, but I didn't remember anything. My mom was convinced that I was possessed. Later that night, when it was bath time, she noticed I had three bad burn marks on my shoulder that she said looked like they were from claws. It's also important to note that my mother was abandoned as a child and adopted and herself has always been spiritual. She has experienced being saved by a guardian angel when she was young and found herself too far away from her rural house at nightfall and felt impending danger closing in on her. She can't explain what it was, but she knew she was in danger and was very scared. She closed her eyes and opened them, and all of a sudden, she was on her front porch which was hundreds of yards away from where she had started. The next experience was from my younger brother's perspective. He's younger by a year and a half, and we shared a bedroom and bunks until I was 11. I slept on the top bunk, and he was on the bottom bunk. Our room was always extremely messy, with toys scattered all over. One morning at about 4 a.m., my brother woke up and said that he saw my mom crouch down cleaning up the toys. He only saw her back and her hair, which was a mix of gray and dyed blonde. My mother always wore a long, light blue flowy nightgown to bed, which was easily recognizable. He didn't think anything of it and went back to sleep. In the morning when we both woke up, the room was spotlessly clean, and I asked him how it had happened. That was when he explained that he had seen my mom in there cleaning in the middle of the night. At breakfast, we asked her why she had decided to clean our room at such an hour, and needless to say, she told us that she had never been in the room. She went in to look and was amazed at how clean our room was since it was never like that. Around this time, my brother started getting frequent night terrors that would scare the living crap out of me. I'd wake up to him screaming, standing in the corner of the room facing the wall and banging his head on the wall. Sometimes he would be apologizing to God over and over. Sometimes he would be sitting in the middle of the room with his knees to his chest, hands draped around his knees, rocking back and forth and saying things that didn't make any sense while bawling his eyes out. My dad would come down the long, dark hallway to our room and try to snap him out of it. Sometimes he would slap him hard just to see if he could get a reaction, but his demeanor would never change. Eventually, my dad said to just leave him be, because nothing seemed to wake him up out of it. And if you can imagine, this was terribly scary as a kid. 
I'd wake up in a living nightmare, scared out of my mind, having to watch him do this, sometimes for an hour straight, until he would just climb back in bed and fall asleep. I remember one particularly scary episode when I woke up. He was just sitting on the dresser, on the dresser, cross-legged, with his back to the mirror, covering his eyes and crying, and just saying, no, I won't, you can't make me look. I would try talking to him and sometimes he would respond, but with very simple answers. I grabbed him by the hand and told him that we should get some water. He got off the dresser and followed me to the bathroom, but refused to go in. I went in and turned the faucet on so he could drink out of it, but he didn't want to go into the bathroom because of the mirror above the sink. I finally pushed him in, and he looked at himself in the mirror and let out the loudest blood-curdling scream. He was so frightened at whatever he saw that he passed out. This continued for years and would happen probably once every two to three months always in the wee hours of the morning. When I finally moved out of that room, down the long hallway to the big bedroom at around age 11, it was almost scarier walking up and down there alone, hearing my brother's fits down the hall. Waking up in a room by myself, hearing it from far away, had a different feel. A few more important details about this house that you'll need to know is that the electrical and plumbing systems were very old and had never been updated. As a result, many lights would never work, including the most important one for me as a child, the light in the long dark hallway outside my room, which connected to my brother's room, sister's room, and the only bathroom, which was straight down the hallway. When my brother was having his fits, I'd open the door and reach my hand to flick the light. It would rarely work. If I wanted to go check on him, I'd have to run down the hallway in the pitch dark feeling the walls to get to his room. That was the worst. So many times I'd be too scared, and I would just stay in my room with my light on. Now, the old plumbing and piping in the house meant that when you turned on a faucet, not only would it sometimes be a rusty red color for a few seconds, and then turn into clear, normal-looking water, but there was a distinct whistle sound when it came on, which intensified with the stronger stream. Many times I would wake up, and down the hallway, I would hear the whistle and the water on full blast in the bathroom. I'd have to sprint down there in the pitch dark hallway to flick on the bathroom light and shut it off. Imagine that dread for a second. Not only do you have to sprint down the hallway toward the scary noise in the dark, but you think that anything could be in that bathroom when you flick the light on. Then I'd have to sprint down the dark hall again to my room. The worst part is that after I would shut it off and get back to sleep, I'd wake up an hour later to the same thing. This happened intermittently for years. My dad always said that it was just my brother doing it to scare me, but he always denied it, and it would be a pretty elaborate hoax to pull off for so many years. The last thing I want to preface before getting into the terrifying Ouija night although I have a few more stories I could tell, regards one of my girlfriends in my adult years. I was dating a beautiful Venezuelan woman with long black hair. We dated for about a year before I learned of her childhood in Venezuela, where she gained local notoriety as an incredibly powerful medium. Some days, she claimed as many as 30 ghosts would be trying to communicate with her, and through her. It got so bad that her mother had taken her to Zimbabwe to a witch doctor, who was renowned for being able to reverse or suppress the powers that mediums have whenever it got too overwhelming for them. I know, I couldn't believe it either. But when I met her mother, she told me the whole thing, and she cried while telling me the story. My girlfriend also showed me the scars on her ankles, knees, and wrists, tiny little slits that I had never noticed before where the witch doctor cut her to drain some of her blood for the ceremony. How did this topic of her being a medium come up? Well, we were staying at a friend's house for his annual party, where we were playing drinking games, hanging out in his pool, and doing a bonfire. Everyone stayed in the house, but my girlfriend and I brought my new tent and blow-up mattress and stayed in his backyard. It was a pretty rural area, and his backyard adjoined to a big cornfield. 
In the morning, we were pillow talking, and I thought she was just trying to scare me when she said, Did you hear the little girl outside the tent last night? I played along and said, Yeah, that was creepy, right? She said that she circled around the tent a few times and then ran into the cornfield. The whole day I didn't think anything of it, because I thought we were just playfully trying to scare each other that morning. Later that night I told my friend Mark, who owns the house, that my girlfriend said that she heard a little girl hanging around our tent. His face went white, and he said, Wait a minute, how do you know about the little girl? Are you serious? I said, what are you talking about? I thought she was kidding. Apparently there's some urban myth story on his street that a little girl who went missing decades ago in the cornfields sometimes comes out at night. He said he always thought it was bull. This is when I asked my girlfriend if she'd been serious, and she did say that she actually heard the little girl. That's when she came clean with the whole medium backstory. She said after Zimbabwe her powers weren't as strong, but she would still get periodic ghosts that would try to talk to her. After I corroborated her crazy childhood medium story with her mom, I had brought her to my dad's house where I grew up so she could meet my dad and she could only stay in the house for a few minutes before she had to leave. She said that the dread she felt in there was the most overwhelming sense of dread she had ever felt in her life, and that she never wanted to return. So, to the Ouija board night. My brother is now 20 years old, and I'm 22. My mom lives in a house in our small city's downtown area, and my brother spends a lot of his time there because she lets him drink and smoke there. He'd been there with his girlfriend playing with a Ouija board all night when I got there after a night drinking with friends. The door was locked, so I knocked. He came flying down the stairs and swished open the curtain to see me standing there. He had the literal look on his face like he had just seen a ghost. I've never seen him so scared. He just tells me to come inside and that I wouldn't believe what was going on. He says that he and his girlfriend have been playing the Ouija board, and they have this very strong, evil spirit who calls himself AZ that's been talking to him all night. He's AZ because he encompasses everything and is omnipresent, apparently. He said that AZ had been spelling out kill mom and saying evil things about her all night long. She was sleeping in the room next door through it all. AZ was also very vulgar. My brother said that he'd knocked down a crucifix off the wall and opened and closed the bathroom door just a few minutes before I got there. The hair on the back of my neck was standing up because I believed my brother and I felt the dread, but I didn't have proof that I had seen with my own eyes. I watched them playing and the planchette was whipping around the board answering questions very quickly. AZ fixated on me and started by spelling out, brother. My brother asked if he wanted to talk to me, and AZ said no. He asked if he liked me, and AZ said no. I then asked my brother to tell him that I don't believe in him, and that I need a sign. AZ spelled out, die. He then asked if he was going to hurt me. AZ said no, and then spelled out, mom. At that point, I went into my mom's room just to make sure she was okay, and she was. When I was in her room, I stubbed my toe and tripped a little. I came back out into the living room and told Dan that mom was okay. My brother commanded him to leave my mother alone. He said that I wanted to see a sign, and AZ spelled out, trip. I started to feel a little wave of energy come over me, and I was thinking, did he just see me stub my toe? My brother asked him what he meant by trip, and I told him that I had just stubbed my toe and tripped in mom's room. Then I said, ask him if he could hear me, and I started addressing him myself. AZ said that he could. I said if I write down a word on a piece of paper, would he be able to see it and spell it? And he said maybe. I asked if he would do it, and he said no. So I did something I probably shouldn't have done. I started to verbally abuse him a little bit, calling him a coward and some other names, and that if he really wanted us to know who he was and that he was real, he would do it. 
The planchette started to fly around the board without stopping anywhere, but eventually spelled out short. I asked if it wanted me to write short words, and it replied, yes. I went to the far side of the apartment with a piece of paper and a pen, and I wrote down sea, like the ocean. I came back, and my brother asked him if he saw what I wrote and to spell it. The planchette slowly circled around the board and landed on S, and then it slowly went to E. My heart raced and I almost started crying, but then it landed on X. My brother asked me if that was the word, and I said no. My brother started cursing at AZ, calling him a pervert, and telling him to quit playing around. That was when the planchette promptly spelled out C. I said, oh my gosh. That's when the planchette slid off the board with a pretty strong force and my mom's cat came running out of my mom's room to the living room. It jumped on the couch and scrambled across it and then crawled under the table. It was terrified of something. I have goosebumps every time I recount this. When my brother got AZ back on the board, I proceeded to keep playing the spelling game, next with ocean, and then cream, and then three or four more words. Each time I would go to a completely different room and make sure that nobody could see what I wrote except for me. I folded it up and put it in my pocket so nobody could see through the paper. Every time I came back to the living room, AZ had spelled out the words with ease, faster and faster. I left the house and told my brother to be safe, and I went to my friend's house up the road, because there's no way in hell I was going back to my dad's that night. I can't really explain the feeling you get when you just know without a doubt that they are real, things that are other than you. I was overwhelmed with every emotion at the same time. Make no mistake about it, folks. They do exist. I grew up in a household that rarely attended church. Sometimes, when visiting our grandparents, my two brothers and I would be forced to go to worship services, but those moments were few and far between. Even so, it's almost impossible to avoid running across Christian symbols in books, movies, and television shows. Thus, it's likely most Americans have at least a basic understanding of such Christian symbols as the cross and angelic beings. So when my youngest brother Parker, of around three years old, began telling us that he saw angels, my parents saw no immediate cause for concern, nor were they at all surprised. From what I can remember, all of the adults in the family and in our friend circles thought it was cute. I must admit, I was a bit more skeptical than the grown-ups. Quite frankly, I could not shake an unsettling feeling deep in my gut that something about it just wasn't right. Some time later, my brothers and I were spending a summer day at our babysitter's mind-numbingly boring home, when my youngest brother called out for someone to come and look at a picture he had just finished. Now, being all of three years old, abstract shapes and outrageous color schemes constituted the bulk of my brother's artwork up until this point. At least, this is the level of work we were all used to and fully expected to see. As it happens, I was the first to arrive on the scene and lay eyes on the drawing. The first thing I noticed, to my astonishment, was the lack of color. In fact, the entire drawing consisted of various shades of black, which was completely out of character in my brother's case. Before I was even aware of what I had laid my eyes upon, a cold chill was creeping up my spine, causing the hairs on the back of my neck to stand on end. The next thing I could not avoid being struck by was the seemingly miraculous leap forward in this three-year-old boy's artistic ability. I could actually make out the discernible details of a figure, demonstrating ability well beyond his years. Without regard to the figure on the page, I immediately felt something scandalous must be afoot. I marched over to our middle brother, Christian, fully intent upon drawing a confession out of him. 
He must have sketched the figure and conspired to have a little fun at my expense. I was not laughing. I couldn't shake this feeling of being disturbed, much like the one I would get from creepy pictures or statues that seemed to stare directly into my soul. When he pled his innocence, I quickly dragged Christian over to the table and demanded that he end his charade. However, the moment his eyes met the figure, I recognized the look on his face. I imagined it must have been exactly as I had looked upon viewing the figure only moments before. Tears began to stream from his eyes as I released his arm and watched him race over to the secure arms of his favorite teddy bear. He always had that bear with him, but I had not seen him act as he did in that moment in years. He was three all over again. I was beginning to feel sweat beating up on my forehead and the back of my neck. I turned to Parker, who had not moved from his spot at the table throughout the entirety of the commotion, his face displaying a confused look. As the oldest, not wanting to leave the responsibility to our babysitter, I decided that I would inquire about the figure. The figure? Up to this point, I hadn't even considered what exactly my brother had drawn. All I knew was that it was chilling me to the bone and I couldn't understand why, but I would soon have my answer. Before launching into my interrogation, I glanced back at the shadowy figure on the paper. Why had I not spent a moment to figure out what he had drawn? Was it my subconscious attempting to protect me from identifying it? These questions ran through my brain, and still do every time I lie awake in bed at night, some twenty plus years later, wary of what may be waiting for me in the darkest corners of my room, behind the door and under the bed. Some things just stick with you, and tend to rear their ugly head at the worst moments. What I saw on the paper haunts me to this day. The drawing was of a dark, shadowy figure, partly veiled in what appeared to be smoke or possibly mist. The body was nude, and the limbs and torso were contorted in grotesquely unnatural fashions. Tears were welling up in my eyes as I scanned the figure, slowly drifting up toward its face. This face was something indescribably sinister and horrid. It had no business even being a figment of imagination, much less being sketched by a three-year-old. I cannot, after all of these years, find something even remotely like it to compare it with. It didn't exactly have eyes, but you felt like it was staring right through you, like it knew you. I felt like it knew more about me than I knew myself, yet there was something oddly familiar about the figure. What I suppose could possibly pass for a mouth, stretched from the middle of its lopsided, egg-shaped head, all the way to the very bottom of its face. Impossible as it may seem, the figure appeared to be smiling and whispering at the same time. For some reason, I felt like it was asking me to remember. Remember what? Looking up at my three-year-old brother, with his blue eyes and innocent expression, I could not believe such a vision of utter darkness and cruelty could spring forth from his young and inexperienced mind. Was this something he thought about often? Had he dreamt it and felt compelled to put it down on paper? If he was at all frightened by the image, as Christian and I clearly were, he wasn't showing the slightest sign. I could only bring myself to ask him a single question. Why? Just then, Christian accidentally knocked the television remote to the floor, momentarily snapping me out of the dramatic heaviness of the moment. He still looked mortified. I turned to the three-year-old behind me, realizing there might just be some mystery about to be revealed, and heard the words I immediately realized were the cause of my unease with the figure. When I asked him why, he simply smiled and said, I see him every day. He's my angel. Upon hearing this, something seemed to break inside me. It was as if some switch flipped and an impossibly dim light flickered to life in a dark and distant room. A faded memory from as far back as I can remember began to take shape. On the couch behind me, Christian began sobbing loudly. He was definitely his three-year-old self, squeezing his teddy bear and moaning that he wanted our mother. Something from within compelled me to go over to him. It was not a voice, but it was 
Definitely a feeling. I was out of my element. We needed mom and dad. The babysitter was not going to be enough. Something was seriously wrong, and we did not have any answers. The moment I sank into the couch, my brother threw his teddy bear and wrapped his arms around me. This was certainly new. We loved each other, about as much as two young brothers can hope to love one another, but the only times we ever hugged were for family pictures. And yet I could tell that it was the most appropriate thing the two of us could do in that moment. He needed it. I needed it. Without looking up at me, through alternating sobs and snivels, he began to speak. He told me he wished he had never looked at the figure. He asked me why I had made him do it, which drove a hot dagger right through my little heart. I began to cry once again, telling him that I was sorry in my own whimpering voice. After we sat there crying for what seemed like an hour, though it was likely mere minutes, my brother once again spoke. This time he seemed oddly calm, almost as if he had not been crying and shaking with fear for the past several minutes. While he spoke, my attention was fading in and out, as he recounted the various houses we had lived in and the rooms we shared over the years. I had no idea why he was bringing any of this up at this particular moment. He continued in this manner, and I began to just be able to make out the memory that had moments before been triggered at the table and was slowly coming into focus. It was a series of short scenes, mostly in an apartment my parents rented when I was around three or four years old. Some of them were of places I could not quite make out, but I assumed they represented my grandparents' old house and the daycare center I once attended. They were old memories of old places. Before I could make these images more concrete and begin to try to remember their significance, I was ripped from my trance-like state by something my brother said. He was asking me if I remembered his imaginary friend. He said he used to think it was his guardian angel. I, myself, was around nine when he used to talk about this imaginary friend, and I tended to just ignore him when he spoke about it. I did remember, however, a time when I awoke to the sound of my brother whispering. I remember rolling over so that I could smack him and tell him to go to sleep, but immediately being startled by the sound of a deep, raspy voice that seemed to be responding to him. I must have blocked it out, but at that moment I could suddenly recall that night. I ran straight into our parents' room, waking them up and going on and on about a man in our room. Unfortunately, when my parents finally got up and went to investigate, my brother was sound asleep, and nothing was amiss. The window was closed and locked, the bed was clear underneath, and our closet only housed a few sweatshirts and board games. As this was all coming back to me, my own memory began to sharpen and reveal itself. It was as if a movie was being played on fast-forward of select moments from my early childhood. As an only child for the first few years of my life, it was not uncommon for me to have to settle on entertaining myself. Strangely enough, though, in the images streaming through my brain, a figure began to materialize. Frame by frame, as the scenes repeated themselves over and over again, a growing dark mist or smoke was taking shape. Christian had lost his temporary state of calmness and returned to sobbing uncontrollably, but the images continued to hold my attention. What was that thing in each of the scenes with me? Why did I feel some connection to it? The sobs of my brother grew into full-on wailing. Still, I could not be brought out of my current state. I had to know what my memory was trying to show me. At some point, my curiosity began to change to an all-too-familiar feeling of dread. I was coming to the realization that I knew exactly what was in those rooms with me. I had always known. I did not want to see it in its full form, but I could not look away. The images were in my head, not in front of my eyes. I could feel tears streaming once again down my cold, clammy face. I was sweating profusely and shivering uncontrollably, like one continuous chill running up and down my spine. It started with that unmistakable stench. It seemed to roll off of him like the smoke that surrounded his presence. Then I saw that hideously familiar naked body with all of its twists and inhuman angles. I could hear a faint noise rising from somewhere in the background. 
No, it was welling up from inside me. I was screaming. The last thing I remembered before blacking out was that ungodly face, crooked and ghastly, somehow smiling without a mouth and seeing right into my soul with non-existent eyes. And to think, I now can vividly remember that three-year-old me used to be comforted by this hideous creature. He was, after all, my guardian angel. The first two stories I'm going to tell you take place in one of the less fortunate parts of Thailand. I was around 12 or 13 and living with my mother and her family. My dad was away in another country, working. The house that my mother and I were staying in was the house that my dad had built for us. Story one, I was sleeping in my parents' room. My mom doesn't like sleeping in there without my dad, so she'll sleep on the living room floor instead. I liked how nice and big my parents' room was, so I took advantage of it and I slept in there. It was probably around 2 a.m. when I woke up and I really needed to use the restroom. Directly above the toilet is a tiny wall fan. It's supposed to drag any humidity or stench outside. It kind of looks like those industrial fans, but a lot smaller and without the netting. So it's pretty much an open hole in the wall with fan blades. Directly behind the wall is a dense wooded area. There is a house located within this wooded area, but they are much farther down from this side of the house. Anyway, I'm in there minding my own business until I start hearing music? Chanting? I don't really know what it was, but it sounded old, like it was recorded on a vinyl record. You could hear the little bits of static and fuzz. It sounded like three old men singing or chanting in Thai, but I couldn't understand it at all. It was like ancient Thai. They were definitely using words that I had never heard, and this carried on for a minute or two. I just sat there, more confused than scared. Staring up at the fan, I listened to whatever this was. It was directly behind me, behind this wall. I kept debating on whether or not I should get up and get my phone to record what I was hearing, but I was worried that the singing or chanting would stop or be over by the time I ran back in. It stopped, and I never heard anything like it again. Story two happened about a week or so after the first. Instead of sleeping in my parents' room this time, I decided to sleep in the living room with my mom on the couch. She was on the floor. I was honestly a little creeped out from what had happened last time, so I decided to stay close to her. Now this is by far one of the most, if not the most, horrifying experience I have ever had to go through in regards to the paranormal. It was, again, around 2am. We have three windows in the living room that we'd covered up with aluminum foil because we hadn't quite bought curtains yet and there were two large doors on both sides of the room the front and the back. The back door was just a double door with tiny glass windows, and the front door was a giant glass sliding door. There are no lights on outside, so it's pitch black. You can't see anything out there. The only light source we had in the living room was a faint glow of a few indicator lights on some of the electronics we had in there. Now, I woke up feeling anxious. I don't know why, but I was extremely on edge and creeped out, and I wanted nothing more than to just ignore it and go back to sleep. So I'm laying there, trying my hardest, when all of a sudden, I start hearing this indescribable sound coming from the outside of the house, specifically behind the window that's closest to the giant glass sliding door that I can see nothing through. Immediately, my heart is racing and I begin to sweat. My anxiety is through the roof, and I'm the only one hearing this. Even the dogs aren't reacting. They were still asleep. I kept trying to justify whatever that ungodly sound was. It definitely wasn't human, and I don't think it was an animal either. I don't even think animals can make that noise. 
it was like a gurgling, groaning version to a clicking sound that that Juan makes. It was absolutely horrifying and it carried on for what felt like an eternity. Again, I kept debating on getting my phone to record it, but I was honestly more terrified than confused this time. I was too afraid to move. But shockingly, I considered getting up to actually go investigate the sound outside. I'm really glad I didn't though, because I don't think I want to know what made that sound, and I have no idea what I would have confronted out there. The next two stories are a little more recent and actually happened a few years ago. Both involve dreams and sleep paralysis, and both take place in a country called Bahrain, where again my mother and I are living, but this time in a small apartment. My dad is once again working in another country. I don't remember what time it was when I woke up, but I know it was dark out, and I originally just wanted to take a nap on my bed. So the dream consisted of me in what I believe was a nice, quaint apartment. I was apparently roommates with these two people that I'd never seen before in my life. A guy and a girl. Now the guy and I got along fine. We were just having a nice conversation until the girl burst into the room like she'd been out all day and she was fuming. She was angry about something and was raging and yelling saying that it was too bright and to close all the shutters and blinds. This guy and I look at each other with the mutual expressions of, oh dear, this can't be good. He goes after her and follows her around, trying to calm her down as she's making her way through each window, closing all the blinds and shutters while yelling that it's still too bright. As she's doing this, it's getting progressively darker and darker and harder to see. Her yelling is getting louder and more static. At some point, it's so dark, I tried to whip my phone out and turn the flashlight on, but it wouldn't turn on. I kept tapping and tapping all the while her screaming growing louder and fuzzier. And it was just getting to be so dark when suddenly my eyes spring open. I'm now in my bed, in full sleep paralysis. This was my first time ever experiencing it, and I was glad that I had fallen asleep with the lights on. The screaming that I had just heard from my dream followed me into my waking life, but it was just loud static ringing in my ears. I'm trying to move my body, half scared and half angry. I've got limited vision since I'm unable to turn my head or anything, but I look toward my door and that's when I see it, slowly gliding across my floor toward my slightly open door is a black shadow figure. I eventually get out of paralysis and I choose to sleep in the living room. I definitely wasn't staying in my room after that. My last story happened about a month after that first experience. I believe this was the first or second time that I had slept in my room since my first sleep paralysis event happened. I slept with my lights on. In the dream, I was in this big room. It was beautiful, like I must have been in a palace or something. The walls were so beautifully detailed and the bed was massive with all these drapes and things like that. It was breathtaking, just dark. There was a single candle lighting up the entire room, so the room was not at all well lit. But it was okay. I was okay. I wasn't feeling scared or worried or anything. In fact, I was pretty relaxed. I looked around the room to see that these two double doors were wide open. They led to nothing, and by that I mean it was just pitch black beyond these doors. I couldn't see a thing. Too dark. So I'm standing in this room, just chilling, I guess, until I hear, or feel, a notification from my phone. I pull it out and I see that it's a text from one of my friends. It reads, So why don't you believe in God, D? I texted him back with a brief summary as to why I felt the way I did, and then I decided to reach for the light switch. Before I could even touch it, I immediately felt a hard rush of dread wash over me as if something was terribly, terribly wrong. My mind was panicking and screaming at me. Wake up, wake up. My eyes shot open. I was awake and stuck in paralysis. I already knew where to look, except this time it was different. My eyes were extremely heavy. All they wanted to do was shut so I could fall back asleep, but I was so scared. 
I was so terrified that I forced myself to stay awake to gaze at the corner of my room. And that's when I saw it again. The black, shadowy figure slowly gliding its way toward my door. After a head left, my eyes were no longer heavy. I no longer had the desire to sleep. I was wide awake and terrified. I don't remember if I managed to fall back asleep or not, or even leave the room. I work nights in the locked unit of our nursing home. This is where the worse off people in the facility are. Dementia, behavioral problems, mental illness, things that are pretty serious. So pretty much I'm locked alone in a long dark hallway and I check in on everybody throughout the night. It's a very large three story building and this wing is an isolated half of the top floor. Nobody likes working back there, especially at night, because the patients are harder to take care of, and let's be real, it does get spooky back there. Being locked, it has this claustrophobic feel that creeps you out anyway, so when something happens, it's enough to really scare the crap out of you. And things do happen. Once, I heard a man shout, Hey, come over here, from the dead end of a hallway. There were no men on that hall, and all the patients were asleep. There were no TVs on, no radios, no logical explanation. I found out, when I told somebody the story, that there was a patient who had died right before I started that would come to the door and call for help, just like that. They even described the voice the patient had, and it matched what I had heard. Another time, I had a patient die that was always very rude and telling people what to do, kind of bossing other patients around. He would tell people to speak louder or shut up, things like that. My husband, who works in a separate unit of the same building, and I were talking in the hall outside of her old room. Our conversation was suddenly interrupted by a loud shush that sounded exactly like when she would hush up other residents. It sounded like she was right next to us, but she had passed on and nobody was in the hall except for us. All the patients were fast asleep. I also had a patient moved into a shared room. The woman that she moved in with wasn't always friendly to her. She would swing on her if she took food from others' plates by accident, things like that. Not long after moving into the shared room, she passed away in there. Suddenly, her less than friendly roommate was terrified to sleep in that room. She lived in there alone before, hadn't seen the death, and was probably too far gone dementia-wise to even remember that she had had a roommate. But still, she was terrified of that room at night. She would absolutely refuse to go to bed, which used to be hard to get her out of. And if you did get her to lay down, she would scream, don't turn off the lights. Don't you dare turn off the lights. She would spend most of the night trying to get out of the room and stay out. And this was all kind of crazy because she was somebody who liked to be in bed. She liked to be left alone in her room most of the time. One night, she made it all the way out into the hallway, walking without her wheelchair. She was almost falling over, but she was determined to get out of that room struggling the whole way and putting up a fight when I tried to turn her around to go back into the room to sit down. She was out of breath, and there was pure fear in her eyes like I've never seen. I took her to watch television, and she slept in a recliner in the TV room with me, no problems. This lasted for about a month after her roommate died, and it didn't stop until she moved rooms. The general theory is that her departed roommate had returned to get revenge. People do see their family and loved ones when they're about to die all the time. When they start seeing and talking to family and talking to things that aren't there, that's how you know that it's about to happen. Call bells do go off in empty rooms, 
even the kind that you have to physically pull down to sound and push back up to turn off. And it happens even in locked rooms. But this scares me the most. There's something back there that bothers my residents at night. I have a Greek woman who's a patient and doesn't speak English at the far end of my hall. She'll be talking up a storm, but it'll be loud enough to hear all the way down the hall. When I go down to check on her, she stops talking and pretends to be asleep. As soon as I walk away, she'll start back up. This will continue for a while. Then she'll stop talking and go to sleep. A few minutes later, the woman in the next room will start talking to something. When she stops, the woman across the hall will start talking to something. They aren't just mumbling either, it's a full conversation. They talk, then they pause to listen, and then they talk again. It's like listening to somebody who's on the phone. And the thing is, no two are ever doing it at the same time. They're all in separate rooms with various levels of dementia, so it's not like they discussed it or know what's going on in the other rooms. It's literally like someone or something is going down the hall, room to room, waking people up to talk until they fall asleep, and then going to the next. They will all always talk about the man. That man was in my room. That man is standing in the corner behind you. That man told me to. Again, all saying the same thing, without really knowing that the others are seeing the same. This happens on a very regular basis, and it never stops being creepy. And I always wonder what he says to them. This may be a ramble of thoughts, but after recently hearing about missing 411 and the like, I finally felt like I could offer something that my family and I experienced a few years ago that to this day gives me a shiver. Hopefully you enjoy this story. I've been camping, solo backpacking, and hunting my whole life in Oregon and felt comfortable in the woods, and I have a deep respect for nature. A few years ago, my wife, daughter, and two German shepherds went camping north of Mount Jefferson, Oregon. We found our campsite to be the perfect setup for us and our two dogs, who need the privacy, since they're intimidating to other dog owners and can be loud when spooked. It wasn't an established campsite, just a nice horseshoe off of a U.S. Forest Service road that had flat ground, full trees, and a fire pit. The first night, my daughter wanted to sleep by herself in a two-man tent right next to ours. It was maybe two feet away from my wife and I's tent. We made the male German Shepherd sleep with her in her tent. His name is Guts. That whole first night, neither my wife or I could sleep. We both heard footsteps, and they were heavy. Not like typical forest critters scampering around in the night. I was well armed because I was paranoid from having read recently before departing about a dad in California who was shot and killed in a tent next to his two infant daughters. Needless to say, both my wife and I had two pistols and I had my rifle with me. The dogs are great at detection and that's why I felt my daughter could sleep alone because Guts is completely fearless and nothing would lay a hand on her without a battle to the death. All in all, nothing but bad vibes and loud footsteps occurred that night, which I ultimately decided had to be a deer or maybe some elk. Day two, morning. We go for a walk down the road and maybe 300 feet away, we see this circle area. I see this abandoned road where a rusted gate post was covered in vegetation. The gate was missing. Something of a blue color caught my eye, and Guts immediately takes off running down this abandoned road. My heart begins to race, because I think if it's another family camping like us, he's going to get himself shot or scare some innocent people to death. So I chase after him as fast as I can, and the rest of the family follow. 
He stops after 20 feet into the road and me yelling his name, but I've covered just enough distance to see that there's nobody there. But there's something really off about the sight. I yell, hello, is anyone there? Sorry about the dog. I got no response. My curiosity gets the best of me and I have to see what the sight conditions are. As I get closer, I just know something is wrong. It had all the necessities for a campsite, including a cooler, propane burner, tent, blankets, folding table, everything. But every single item had been completely destroyed, smashed, and torn apart from what appeared to be claw marks. We all walked around in circles, puzzled why anybody would leave all of their camping gear behind, including a fairly expensive REI tent. I figured, well, someone left in a hurry and the animals got to the rest. It had to be the only logical explanation, right? Still, a propane tank and a cooler were flattened by something, and it certainly wasn't snowpack with tree coverage in that spot. As the afternoon rolls in, my daughter and I are playing ball at the campsite, and my wife goes walking maybe 70 feet north to do her business. I don't have a direct line of sight on her, but all of a sudden I see Guts make a mad dash straight toward her. Normally he would always be with me unless he's called over and she didn't call for him. His speed and focus caught my attention and I knew something weird was happening. So I ran over there and my wife starts jogging at me and I immediately draw my pistol. Guts has completely continued running into the forest another hundred feet before I call him and he stops. My other dog, Leia, who never misses the opportunity to be the pack leader, is not taking point. I've had her for now seven years and this was the first time in her life that she refused to leave my daughter's side. She was full hair raised and attached to us at the hip. Again, anytime we hike or play, Leah is up front, bossing everything in her path pausing to see where we all are and then continuing on. I asked my wife what had happened and she said, I was trying to pee and all of a sudden I felt all my hair raise. I knew someone was watching me. Then I saw Guts running toward me and I just got up to move toward you. We spent 10 minutes looking for signs of anything and saw no trails, no broken branches, Nothing to point to what and where something might have gone. We decide that we're spending one more night since it's too late to pack up and drive, but we'll all be in the big tent together. Before we go to bed, I put a rope with a makeshift coin alarm around the perimeter of our campsite. I used a mint can and some coins and keys from our truck and zip tied it so that anything hitting the rope gave a little jingle. Very unsophisticated, but it put my wife at ease. As I go to tie my last corner off at a tree near our tent, our third mystery item unveils itself. It looks like someone has done the exact same thing that I have done with a rope that was so old and brown I didn't see it at first. It was broken and only a few pieces remained, but sure enough, it was tied at roughly the same height, about eight to 10 inches off the ground and even had a few rusted washers on it. I immediately felt that someone had stayed here before and had put the same makeshift warning system on the same tree that I am, maybe 10 or 15 years ago based on the condition of the rope. Perhaps my paranoia has now reached a new height, but I had to make sure that the girls felt we were safe. And at the time, the only thing I could think of was when the evening came I made them sit in the truck and I fired a clip of my 45 into the dirt as a signal to whatever was out there that we were armed. I reassured the girls that anybody listening to that knows that we have two wolves and are armed and are too risky of a target so we can sleep safely. That night we heard no footsteps and the dogs never perked up and barked. We left early the next morning Fast forward to today and I watched the Amazon Missing 411 hunted documentary and I noticed the cluster smack dab close to where we camped that weekend and a flood of dread rushes at me 
as I think of that mysterious abandoned campsite with the ripped tent and the smashed cooler and cooktop. We've been camping since and have enjoyed the beauty of the Pacific Northwest, but there was something there at that place that possibly took or harmed someone else less than 300 feet away from where we camped. We all thank our lucky stars that Guts was doing his thing so well that afternoon. As an update, Guts is no longer with us. He has journeyed into the next phase, and there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about him and how he likely saved us that night. He was a warrior, and his new brother, Geronimo, has his spirit. This happened about nine or ten years ago, but it's something that I've never figured out, and maybe something I'll never figure out, but it has stuck with me all this time. Let me preface this by saying that I do get sleep paralysis. I've had more instances of sleep paralysis than I can count, but I'll say an average of four times a year for the past 30 years. Some years it's more often, some years it's less, but by the time this experience occurred, I was well versed enough to be able to identify when it was happening and to be able to pull myself out of it. Generally, when I get sleep paralysis, I can hear everything around me, but I can't move or make a noise. I've never seen the old hag, and only once have I seen the man in the wide-brimmed hat. He had red eyes when I saw him. And yes, he was pushing down my chest. Not cool, not fun. I never want that to happen again, but I also knew that he wasn't real as it was happening. So about 1% of the time I've had a visual hallucination. Usually it's just that I can't move or speak, but I can hear everything around me, and somehow I can see the room even though my eyes are closed. But this? It doesn't fit the mold of sleep paralysis, at least not in any way I've ever experienced it. That's why it bothered me so much then and why it still bothers me now. My son was young at the time, five or six. My then husband, now ex, and I drove to visit my grandmother for Christmas. She lives about a hundred miles away from me. She has two extra bedrooms, but other family members scooped up the extra rooms before we could. So my husband and I rented a hotel room a few miles from her house. It was something like a Best Western or Holiday Inn. If I had to guess, I would say at the time it was less than 10 years old. We checked into our hotel room quickly, dropped off our stuff, and went straight to my grandmother's house. We had Christmas dinner with the family. I don't think I had any alcohol at all. If I did, it might have been one glass of wine. It was a long drive down to her house, two hours at least, and then an eventful evening, so we were beat. We left grandma's house at about 9 p.m., and headed back to the hotel room. We drove around for an extra 20 minutes, trying to get our cranky son to sleep, which made me even more exhausted. The exhaustion is the thing that had me thinking, maybe this was sleep paralysis, because that usually does trigger it for me. But again, what happened next is like nothing I've ever experienced before or since. The layout of the room is this. The hotel room door opened up to a little hallway, and directly to the left was the bathroom with a tiny closet next to it. Moving just past the hallway, the wall on the left turned 90 degrees and the beds were to the left. To the right, you could follow the wall straight to the corner. There was a dresser along that wall, and in the corner was an armchair. From that corner, follow that wall, and there was a window facing the parking lot. In the next corner, there was another armchair, maybe three feet from the head of one of the queen beds. That was where my husband and I slept. My husband slept on the side near the armchair, and I slept on the inside so I could be closer to our son in the other bed. My son fell asleep in the car. I tucked him in and very quickly got changed and got in bed. My husband got in bed only moments later, and I shut the lights off. 
Before I fell asleep, I observed that the light from the parking lot peeked in over the top and around the sides of the window curtain. It was brighter than I would have imagined with the curtain drawn, but I was too exhausted for it to bother me, so I passed out pretty quickly. Sometime in the middle of the night, I hear the click of a door handle turning. It was the lever kind. I was alarmed, but my body was still heavy with sleep. I'm also facing the direction of the door. I watch as the orange light from the hotel hallway slides across the wall opposite of me and then slowly disappears as the door closes again, quietly. I felt like I was passing in and out of sleep, so the sight of this almost had a strobing effect. A young man wearing medium blue baggy jeans and no shirt walked past the ends of our beds. At this point, I'm more alert, but I'm laying in bed trying to figure out if this is real or not. It was so vivid. But I also had this feeling that I was still passing in and out of consciousness. From the moment I heard the click of the door handle, I was scared out of my mind, but still so tired. I wanted to get up. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't tell what was holding me in bed, whether it was fear or exhaustion. At this point, the man is behind me. I can feel him looking at me, but I'm absolutely terrified to turn over. If I turn over, will it spook him? Will he attack my family? Right now, I can tell he's not moving, just looking. I finally feel alert enough, and I realize my eyes are closed. What? But I can feel him in the room. I saw him, even though I had no way to. It was the scariest thing I've ever done because I knew I might be facing an attacker in my hotel room, but I forced my eyes open and turned over. Nothing. There's no one in the room. My heart is racing. I mean, Jesus, that was so real. I look at my husband and he's fast asleep with his back turned to me, snoring gently. My son is asleep. Everything is how it was when I fell asleep. I'm still on my back, looking at the armchair in the corner at the end of the beds, with the soft white light of the parking lot falling onto the chair as I calm down enough to fall back asleep. I can't tell you how much time passed, but it was dark. And then, all of a sudden, I see the armchair in the corner at the foot of the bed again. But this time, the man that had entered the room earlier was sitting in it. With the light shining from the window, I can see him a little bit better. It's a soft light, but I can tell his hair is buzzed short, and it's a dark brown. He looks young, maybe 18 to 25. He's either white with a tan or perhaps Hispanic. I can't see his facial features too well, but he could be a model. I don't know celebrities well enough to be able to compare him to somebody but he had strong cheekbones, sort of a perfect straight nose, and a strong jaw. Like I said, it was too dark to see the details, but this is what I gathered from his silhouette. He was just sitting there, calmly staring at me. He didn't feel threatening or menacing, but I was still scared out of my mind, because there's a guy in my room in the middle of the night staring at me. This time, the line between asleep and awake is even blurrier in my head. Am I asleep? Are my eyes even open? I don't know, but I'm afraid to find out. I can feel my husband asleep next to me, so I decide the best move is to try to discreetly wake him. He's still snoring with his back turned to me, but my hand is on the bed next to his back, so I decided to slowly move my hand closer and poke him. I poked him a few times, but he's passed out and not reacting at all. I was so pissed. I mean, he was dead to the world. Finally, I decided, F this. I'm not dealing with this alone anymore. So I turned toward my husband slightly, and I lift myself onto my elbow. This is where I'm sure I'm awake, but everything before that was blurry. I was about to grab his arm and shake the hell out of him when I noticed the man in the corner, in the chair, is no longer there. Now I feel crazy. 
I mean, what's going on? Where is this guy? Is he real or not? I was so tired, frustrated, confused, and scared. This man felt real. The details were so vivid. But as I'm trying to sift through what was real and what wasn't, I realize I can only see or feel this guy when I'm asleep. I pray to myself that this is the end of it, and I finally convinced myself that it was just my brain creating an elaborate lucid dream and that I was safe. I was convinced it should stop now, because it's just a stupid dream, and now that I know it, I have the power. I rolled toward my husband, facing his back. I closed my eyes and started to drift off to sleep. I swear it was only a few minutes later, and this time I couldn't see anything, but I felt the guy looking at me. This time, though, while sitting in the chair that's three feet away from my husband's head, not the other one. I opened my eyes. No one was there. For the rest of the night, I probably woke up every hour or so. Every time I fell asleep, I could feel this man's presence in the room. He never tried to hurt us, he just watched us. All night. When I finally saw daylight through the curtains, I got up and woke my husband up and I told him we had to leave. I tried not to alarm him or my son. I just got them up and dressed and said we were out. I think we were out of there by 7.30 in the morning. This whole thing had such a surreal quality to it, because with the exception of a few distinct moments, it was hard to tell when my eyes were open and when they were closed, when I was fully conscious, and when I was maybe semi-conscious. There were parts that I could write off as a dream if they weren't so damn vivid. And the whole night, this lingering feeling of being watched, even when I couldn't see him, it was so unnerving. Every time I recount this incident, to myself or someone else, I'm no closer to understanding what happened. But I refuse to go back to that hotel. So, I just want to start out by saying that I'm some ways a skeptic. I generally call myself agnostic when it comes to not just religion, but anything supernatural or paranormal. For me, this means that I've vacillated at different points in my life all over the spectrum of belief, from times where I basically was willing to believe in anything, to being about as hardcore of a skeptic as you can get. These days, I'm in a weird place somewhere in between. I still feel like I live in the mundane material world, but there's something so much bigger and weird peeking right over the horizon. The main thing that keeps me from having a 100% skeptical outlook is that I've had my share of very weird experiences. Not as weird as some people's, but weird enough that they have me questioning what is real. I should note that I'm not the most mentally stable person, so some of it can be chalked up to that. And at times, thinking I'm just crazy is actually the most comfortable option. But also, I've had plenty of experiences that I have shared with others as well, and those are a lot harder to dismiss. I know shared delusions or hallucinations are possible, but they're exceedingly rare from my understanding and mostly limited to just two people who are extremely close, like siblings or spouses. Some of my experiences have been backed up by as many as four witnesses. This is one such experience. A number of years back, I acquired a house through my family. I won't bore you with the details, but it was through some pretty weird and convoluted circumstances. The house itself is very strange looking inside. I'd best describe it as something out of Alice in Wonderland meets Black Lodge from Twin Peaks. Lots of weird angles, oddly sized rooms with no clear purpose, and decorating that looked like it came from someone who had only read about humans in a book. More spiritually oriented folks who visit would variously claim that it had a vaguely sinister or dark feel to it, while others would say it had a light and inviting energy. I'm not sure I put much stock in any of that, but I suppose it's worth noting. 
the really weird stuff started early on. Within the first couple of months, my housemate and I kept finding weird bits of writing all over the place. First, it was seemingly just names, all kinds of random personal names. Although the handwriting was neat, we figured it must have come from the kids of the family who lived there before us. But maybe it's worth noting that most of it probably wasn't them. At least they weren't writing their own names, as the family that had lived there spoke Spanish. Most of these were decidedly not family names of theirs. For instance, there were names like Gertrude and Siobhan, and we know that they don't have any of those in their family. We found about 15 of these names, at least, and only seven people lived in the house before us. So, even by that count, some of them couldn't have been theirs. I suppose it's possible that the kids might have just been scrawling random names that they knew for some reason. But then we started finding other stuff, like whole sentences tucked away under countertops or on baseboards, and eventually, even on our furniture, stuff that wasn't even in the house before we got there. The sentences were never really threatening or anything. They were just strange and mostly nonsensical. Sometimes they looked like song lyrics, but they never came up as anything when I tried to Google them. Also, to be clear, the fact that we kept finding these random scrawlings made zero sense, because sometimes we would swear that they had shown up in places we'd already looked before. Almost like more of them were being made. And yet, they all looked very similar in handwriting. A little wavy and childlike, but overall neat, neutral, and legible. This was starting to feel more and more like the beginning of some stereotypical horror movie, but it still wasn't weird enough to really freak us out. Yet. We also had lots of stuff go missing, usually only to turn up later in really strange places that we were sure neither of us had left it. But again, nothing too out there. There were some minor poltergeist-like activity early on too, objects that seemed to jump off of fixtures on their own. There were pretty consistent electrical issues as well, including a microwave that we had to keep unplugged because it had this habit of turning itself on. But probably just faulty wiring in an old house, right? No. You see, things really began to ramp up about a year after we moved in. I had gone on a road trip for about a week, and I didn't get back until nearly 4 a.m. When I did, I was greeted by a strange little nest of dried grass with three roughly equally sized but differently colored stones sitting in front of my front door. This was weird, but I assumed it was something one of my roommates had put there for some reason or another, and I didn't think too far into it. The friend that I had been traveling with noticed it too when she was helping with bags, and found it odd, but just like me, didn't think much of it. So the next day, I casually asked my housemates what was up with the little bed of grass and the rocks, and they were all confused. Each of them had assumed that I had put it there. At this point, I assumed either my roommates or a friend of mine was playing a prank on me. A really strange prank, but a prank nonetheless. With this assumption, I did the whole Okay, nice one, you got me. Assuming that at least one of them would confess to their not so clever prank. But all of them insisted earnestly that they had no part in it. And they continued to insist this for the rest of the time that I knew them. I'm inclined to believe them as none were really the pranking type. They would definitely have admitted it under duress. After all, it was about as harmless a prank as you could get. Any of my friends that I confronted said the same exact thing and never let up. Really the only friend I could easily imagine coming up with such an odd abstract prank was the one that I had been on a road trip with, so there was no way she had done it. I am absolutely certain that it was not there when I left, and all of my roommates said that it wasn't even there the day before I got back. So really, that just left the possibility of it being the work of some random prankster in the neighborhood. But there are problems with that too. 
such as the fact that these stones got moved and put back exactly the same way on multiple occasions until the whole thing creeped me out enough that I finally took them inside. This did stop them from being put back again and again, but maybe it was a mistake if you believe that they were perhaps tied to something. Who knows, I guess. On top of that, I asked our incredibly nosy next door neighbor about it once, like if she'd seen anybody on our porch. She said no, but she'd keep an eye out. To be clear, she was retired and kept an eye on things at all hours that she was awake. And she was a light sleeper. So this prankster would have to be continually coming back in the middle of the night to set these rocks up with cat burglar-like stealth over and over again, immediately after they were disturbed. Unlikely. But it gets even weirder. The poltergeist-type activity ramped up and eventually it led to stuff like the bathtub turning itself on in the middle of the night when I was the only one home. I have no history of sleepwalking or anything like that. Then, both me and at least one of the other roommates started getting woken up in the night by mice. Except, both of us swear by all things holy that when we occasionally caught glimpses of these critters, they were weird. Like, really weird. They were incredibly pale, hairless, bipedal, and tailless. But granted, we only ever caught brief glimpses of them because they were incredibly fast, faster than typical mice, and seemed to make great effort to stay out of the light or out of the open. We also both suffered strange, vivid nightmares and heard voices. And while for me, this wasn't completely unusual and could even be chalked up to mental illness, my roommate had no history of anything more severe than depression, had never taken any substances beyond weed and alcohol and was hardly into those, and was completely sober during these experiences. Yet she apparently suffered so much from them that she eventually moved out. There was some other stuff, like the house getting a lock mysteriously put on it by a property firm who didn't own it. Like I said, my family owned it. Nobody at the property company had any knowledge of who might have done it, and whoever did it apparently did so in the dead of night. Because, again, my neighbors hadn't seen anybody do it while they were awake. Maybe it was just professional incompetence. Who knows? Other things started showing up on our porch over time, like bundles of twigs and a sprouting sweet potato, rotting fruit, I'm reasonably sure that it was not the work of anyone I knew. And after all of that, my neighbors surely would have seen at least one of these instances. Anyhow, I no longer live at this house, but I've been thinking about all the odd experiences that I had there lately. And while they're maybe not the weirdest or hardest to explain, they always struck me as both oddly personal somehow, as well as oddly senseless. The only reason that I've ever thought they could be the fey folk or fairies isn't because of the conclusion that I personally came to, but because I spoke to a friend of mine who's way more into esoterica and paranormal stuff than I am. She immediately assumed it was old school trickster fairies. This friend did have a bit of a personal connection to the whole fey realm. She actually claimed to have been abducted by them when she was little, but that whole thing is not my story to tell and we don't have time. I will say though, although this girl held some metaphysical beliefs that I'm not quite on board with, she never struck me as an out and out liar. She certainly experienced something strange and traumatic when she was young and never even wanted to talk about it with most people. Still, she was right about the fact that certain aspects of the whole thing really do seem to evoke the weird and fickle nature of mythological fae. Maybe we even glimpsed them, but who knows? Anyway, if you have any idea as to what this could have been, or if you agree that it was the fae, let me know. I'd love to hear some ideas. To this day, it was just the most bizarre experience and I've never come up with a good explanation. Thank <laughs> you.